गुड मॉर्निंग प्रोफेसर आर के गुड मॉर्निंग हाय ये जस्ट फिक्सिंग सम टेक्निकल चैलेंजेस सो वील बी स्टार्टिंग द प्रोग्राम वेरी शॉर्टली
good morning ladies and gentlemen uh, i am delighted to in to welcome you to this webinar on intersectionality of aging and disability uh, as many of us know that uh, india is aging at a very rapid pace and the segment of population that is growing at the fastest pace is the 80 plus population and when we look at the data, we find that the uh, disabilities that that segment of population faces is almost twice that of those in 60 plus category and sometimes three times that of population younger than that. So uh, given the fact that uh, we are aging so rapidly, it is time for us to start the preparation for the same. And uh, because uh, on third, the world uh, will observe the International Disability Day, we thought it is a right time to actually uh, deep do a deep dive and think about the issues that will concern us as a nation when we are aging so rapidly. Uh, so that was the thinking behind it. Uh, I would like to also acknowledge that many experts helped us, you know, uh, ideate and uh, refine our, you know, concepts and thought processes. And uh, we spoke to a lot of people who helped us also connect with other people who were working on disability or on aging. Uh, and many of them were not working on either subject, but were talking on uh, enabling environment. Uh, so we spoke to a lot of people, uh, did a lot of iterations and reiterations, and then we came up with this, uh, with this uh, concept that we should divide the webinar today into two segments. One, the most important concern because when we looked at data, we found that uh, people who had who were older and had disability were saying that uh, they were twice as disadvantaged when it came to access to health care. And they were twice as disadvantaged when it came to general care. And uh, they were also much more disadvantaged than normal than other older people uh, when it came to accessing transport facilities. So uh, given these uh, data sets that we have at, uh, at our disposal, we thought that uh, these are the areas we should, where we should you know, uh, put more attention on. So the segments are health and rehabilitation, exclusive attention, because we all know that health anyway is important for the elderly people and more so for people who have disabilities. Second segment, which is in the afternoon, uh, will be about enabling environment where we will try and cover as much area as possible, uh, starting with uh, laws and policies and going up to the community interpretation, community interventions, and also the role of media in uh, projecting the images of elderly people and those with disability. So I'm very happy to welcome you all here. And with that, I will uh, hand over to uh, Prateep uh, Chakravarti, who is uh, CEO of Helpage India, to uh, give the opening address. Welcome, Prateep. Thank you, Anupama. Uh, good morning, participants. My name is uh, Prateep Chakravarti. I work with uh, Helpage as the Chief Operating Officer. Uh, I'm based out of uh, Delhi. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to our day-long uh, webinar on the intersectionality of longevity and uh, disability. The objective of uh, this day-long webinar is to encourage discussions on the topic, especially on aging uh, and the intersections between the issues of longevity and uh, and disability, so as to say. So we have a, a good panel of experts on both kind of issues to explore the intersectionality and the way it manifests itself among the elderly in India and accessing healthcare, especially public health, dementia, mental health services, digital services, technology, and of course, assistive technologies about which we will talk. In terms of a background, it is estimated that 15% of the population worldwide or some 1 billion individuals live with one or more disabling uh, conditions. WHO also has its own uh, statistics. More than 46% of older persons, those aged 60 years and over, have disabilities. And more than 250 million older people experience moderate to severe disability during old age. So looking ahead, the global trends in aging populations and the higher risk of disability in older people are likely to lead to further increases in the population affected by disability. So if we take uh, India, I think after 30 years, the demographic dividend that India has uh, will turn into a disaster if things like aging, things like longevity and things like issues like disability are not addressed at the core level. In terms of global, between 2023 and 2030, the number of people in the world which is who are aged 60 years or over is projected to grow by 56% from 901 million 
to around 1.4 billion. And by 2050, the global population of older persons is projected to reach around 2.1 billion. Furthermore, the higher disability rates among older persons as a result of accumulation of health risks across a lifespan of disease, injury, and chronic illness contributes to a higher disability rates among old elderly people. We have to remember that promoting and protecting the rights and dignity of older persons and facilitating their full participation in society is an integral part of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, SDGs, which pledges that no one, including elderly people, will be left behind. The Sustainable Development Goals of the 2030 Agenda make explicit references to older persons and persons with disability with regards to ending poverty, accessing good health, well-being, decent work and economic growth, and sustainable cities and communities. A sustainable development will not be achieved without the conscious and intentional inclusion of the increasing number of older persons and persons with disabilities. HelpAge India voices the concerns of elders to help them live a more dignified existence. The organization was established in the year 1978 and its mission is to work for the cause of disadvantaged older persons and to improve their quality of life. We focus on direct interventions in the areas of healthcare, age care, livelihoods, digital literacy for elderly, disaster response and resilience, and advocating for elder, lives, elder rights. The aim is to provide the much needed elder focused services, increase incomes, and help elders to move into the mainstream again. As an organization, we work at societal, state and national levels with the central and state governments. Once again, I welcome you to this day long webinar. And I also thank you for spending your valuable time to listen through, respond, ask questions, and of course, make your programs intentionally elder friendly. Thank you so much. Over to you, Anupama. Uh, thanks, Pradeep. I think uh, you have uh, set the tone right because uh, internationally, we find the mention of these uh, concerns and SDGs and the international instruments uh, at the UN. And many of the uh, national policies also mention, make mention of it. Uh, but the real challenge, like you said, is uh, in the, at the ground level, how to get these things implemented and how to sensitize society at large to deal with these issues. Uh, with that, I think uh, we will show you some of the uh, efforts that HelpAge has been making to deal with the uh, big challenges uh, of physical mobility and um, I, you know vision that we are uh, dealing with uh, at our level. So I'll request my colleague to please play the film on uh, vision restoration first. Even at the age of 76, Ram Kumar still has to work to survive, barely managing to make ends meet. Sadly, a few months ago, he was all set to lose his only source of living. Ram Kumar is not an exception. 62.6% of cases of blindness in India are due to cataract. 2 million cataract cases get reported every year. Persons in the 60 plus population are the greatest victims. Cataract is easily curable. There are free and low cost cataract surgeries in government hospitals. But to access these services, the old and infirm need family support and mobility, which they often don't have. This makes them dependent on others and often leads to a vicious new cycle of neglect, poverty and deprivation. तो फिर आपका गुजारा कैसे चलता है? भाई मालक चला रहो, मालक बेच रहो। 
लड़का की बहू ना दो पैसा के लिए वह खानो नहीं दे दे हेल्प एज इंडिया steps in to mobilize and help the needy elderly affected by cataract it begins by generating awareness in the community on eye care udhar aake dikha lijiye samne aur koi dikhana hai to idhar dikha dijiye aapka naam prevention of eye diseases and infections yahan pe kitni hai teen teen hai dawa dalo aur chashma check karao chashma lagao aap chikh nahi dikh rahi dikh rahi hai Cataract cases are identified for surgeries to restore vision. Over 9 lakh surgeries have been conducted in partnership with 400 credible eye hospitals, trusts and NGOs in 25 states of India. माता जी का कैंप में स्क्रीनिंग किया गया है जिसमें इस आंख में मोतियां थोड़ा सा कम है आंख बंद करें और दूसरी आंख में मोतिया काफी पक गया है तो दाएं आंख का कैटरैक सर्जरी होगा इनका आर गोल इज टू रेस्टोर आर विजन टू द बेस्ट ऑफ आर एबिलिटीज एंड शी शुड फील लाफ्ट रिस्पेक्टेड अंडर दिस प्रोग्राम All surgeries are conducted under top-class medical supervision and high-tech facilities, not in makeshift camps. This ensures aseptic conditions and prevents post-operative infections. A similar help age initiative restored Kumar's eyesight and his ability to work. उनके लिए मैं बहुत धन्यवाद करूँगा और उनको दुआ करूँगा. और कर रहा हूँ उसी दिन से उन्होंने कहा था कि भाई तुम्हारी आंख बहुत बढ़िया बनी है आफ्टर एन ओवरनाइट स्टे फॉर मोस्ट पेशेंट्स इट्स ऑलमोस्ट लाइक सीइंग द वर्ल्ड विद अ फ्रेश पेयर ऑफ आईज नाउ दे डोंट हैव टू डिपेंड ऑन फैमिली सपोर्ट एंड कैन लिव अ लाइफ ऑफ सेल्फ रिस्पेक्ट एंड डिग्निटी थ्रू कैटरैक्ट सर्जरीज हेल्प एज इंडिया वॉन्ट्स टू रिस्टोर द विजन ऑफ वन मिलियन नीडी एल्डरली बाय दर ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी इन अ कैंपेन टू इराडिकेट प्रिवेंटेबल ब्लाइंडनेस हेल्प एज हेज पार्टनर्ड विद दी इंटरनेशनल एन जी ओ हेल्प मी सी हर एक घंटे के बाद एक बुन आठ बुन फिर उसके बाद दूसरे सप्ताह से छह बार थ्रू मेथोडोलॉजी ऑफ सैचुरेटिंग अ ब्लॉक डिस्ट्रिक्ट और स्टेट एवरी कैटरैक्ट केस डिटेक्टेड विल बी ऑफर्ड रेस्टोरेटिव सर्जरी दी अल्टीमेट एम इज टू क्रिएट कैटरैक्ट ब्लाइंडनेस फ्री जोन You too can join this campaign to bring back the gift of sight to thousands of needy elders as an enlightened donor. It's time for you to proclaim let there be light. Uh, this is our little contribution to uh, making sure that the uh, elderly people do not suffer because uh, they cannot afford an operation which is as simple as a cataract operation and uh, i don't know how many of you know this but 8% of the people above the age of 80 have a visual challenge and 6% over the age of 60 have a visual challenge that uh, can impair their life and the next one that we will show you is about uh, distribution of uh, disability aids which again affects has the same percentage of population in the elderly so requesting uh, my colleague to please play the film so gamya
Uh, thank you. And uh, with this, we come to the end of this um, welcome come warm up session. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, all the panelists have also joined in and we are also joined by the chairperson for the session, technical session one, Dr. A.B. Day. He's here with us. Uh, welcome, Dr. Day. And, thank you. Uh, Dr. Day has been associated with the cause for, I think, a very, very long time. It's been decades, I think. And um, and we have worked with him very closely. He's also a member of our uh, PAC. And uh, he is, uh, he was, he was associated with, uh, with AIMS and he was heading the geriatric division. And now he's continuing his journey uh, with Venu Eye Center. And he's also uh, expanding into new areas of healthcare for the elderly. Uh, when I asked him for his CV and I asked him for a short CV, uh, assuming that he'll send me a four-page CV, but he sent me a two-line CV. <laughs> but I know from experience that he's uh, on almost all committees that the government of India constitutes, whether in Ministry of Health or Social Justice or wherever, that has to do with aging. He was very uh, closely associated with National Programme for Healthcare of Elderly. He is on almost all committees which, which are looking at the technical aspects of aging, under the WHO or the UN bodies. So thank you very much, Dr. Dave, for sparing the time and um, for actually agreeing to chair the session. Uh, so it's over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Anupama. And thanks, uh, Helpage India, for organizing this meeting and uh, uh, inviting me to kind of chair and give some comments about the topic. Um, it's all right. Um, I am a physician who works in old age care. So that's all that I am. Um, it so happens that um, some three decades back, uh, I was in Malta attending uh, the first uh, training in geriatrics of my life. And on day two or three, there was an expert from WHO, I suppose. Uh, he was a Jew. I don't remember the name. So he asked a question in the beginning of his lecture that uh, does it mean that if you live long, you will be disabled. So longevity is equal to disability. So it's kind of a statement that uh, stays in my mind all the time as I practice geriatric medicine and myself have aged now. So does it mean that if you live long enough, you will be finally, at the end of the day, will be disabled? So then he provided points against and for and things like that. We can uh, debate on this point on for ages. I mean, there is no end to this debate whether longevity is equal to disability. Uh, however, um, what I understand that uh, whether you are functional or disabled nobody wants to die and uh, going on living is also a great experience and uh, as my one of my old friends used to say uh, dr honda in apollo hospital that you never know in next birth if you are a living hindu you may be a cockroach or a cat so it's better to live a human life and go on living as long as possible so about three decades back when he started uh, the business of geriatric medicine, geriatric clinic, uh, we had very little idea as to what we are dealing. But over a period of time with my association with WHO and other organizations, uh, what I have understood is that um, we are lucky to be alive now because our generation of older people did not have childhood vaccination. And I remember I took, I got all my vaccines, uh, actually at that point of time, um, the only vaccine which was given to children were the, at my age, at the age of uh, 10 years was uh, BCG vaccine. Uh, but then over a period of time, all other vaccines came in, immunization vaccine. In universal immunization became the rule and that probably added uh, maximum lifespan to uh, human beings. And then many other things, treatment of, with antibiotics, anti-cancer drugs. And in fact, when I completed my MD, there was no treatment for heart attack or stroke at that point of time. And all these things have evolved in last uh, four or five decades. So I must say I'm very lucky to be 
practicing in these five decades where there was nothing to at this point of time virtually except the brain you can replace everything uh, so that's that's kind of development that has taken place in the field of healthcare parallel with uh, curative health preventive health also taken a great stride uh, teaching us how to live a better life and the value of healthy aging to as a goal of life as a goal of development uh, that everybody should be aspiring every society should be aspiring Uh, let's understand at this point of time uh, most people who ever lived to 60 years are alive now so that means at least 50% of 60 plus from the beginning of mankind to today are alive now and uh, we started as a rural phenomena some 30 years back we used to talk about older people living in villages because they go back to home after their working life in cities now it is known that uh, urbanization of old age is extremely common and uh, going at a very rapid pace in about 6 8 years time about 30, 60% of all older people will be living in cities the 80 plus segment is the fastest growing segment in the society and uh, uh, when we were talking about disability related to disability is the term dependence so actually old age is not actually synonymous with dependence um, and uh, the economist in uh, various organization will talk about uh, old age means uh, economic uh, crisis for the society uh, it may be but not that much that healthcare costs uh, will not uh, tremendously increase um, with a large aging population if we continue to look at uh, healthy aging as a goal of life um in 2019 about 3 4 years back before the covid uh, there were 1 billion 1 billion older people in the world and uh, it will be 2.1 billion by next uh, 30 years so we do not know how much of uh, clearance covid did but if you continue to take at that statistics probably there will be doubling of old, older people in next 30 years from 1 to 2 billion in, uh, in about 31 years uh, in india if you look at uh, the number of older people uh, we understand now that uh, in 2050 the number of older people will be more than that of children below uh, 14 years of age so in the aims campus the national center of aging and the maternal and maternal and child health centers are adjacent so i always tell my residents that over a period of time probably will uh, take over a part of this maternal child health center with um, numbers our numbers uh, crossing that of theirs so uh, probably in some of the states in southern india the the phenomena has been uh, obvious that um, older old age care has become is taking primacy over um, infant uh, infant care or very newborn care uh, that should not be we must go on taking care of our mother and newborn so that we go on uh, living to old age um, it's now known that um, after 80 years of age most of the about 60% of older people will be women and uh, we know that older women have got about 3 years of additional life extensi- expectancy over men Uh, after the age of 60 years so um, it's good that there are more kind hearted uh, human beings in form of women in the society than men and uh, that's how it will be uh, the we have been talked about the pace of um, aging in our society uh, the pace of aging in europe and has been very slow which has Uh, which has been parallel with their economic growth but in uh, countries in uh, developing world lower middle and low income countries and low income countries uh, the aging has is much faster and uh, as i when we started doing geriatric medicine the life expectancy was 54 or 55 years in 1991 to 96 um, uh, five years and at this point of time it is now uh, close to 70 for uh, men and above 70 for women so in uh, 30 years nearly 
15 years of life expectancy has been gained. And I'm told that um, in one of the WHO functions, a uh, help page functions, that in the, uh, in the country of Nepal, it's uh, one by one, that is every one year of life uh, growth, life expectancy is now increasing by one year. So for uh, developing society, the pace of uh, aging is very fast. Um, as a geriatrician, I'm not a social scientist, I'm a healthcare provider. We look at older people in their, um, their state of health, um, not very great, especially from my own experience of uh, aging process, uh, something or the other goes on happening. But what bothers us most, uh, what bothers older people most is the ability to uh, do their activities of daily living and in instrumental activities of daily living which somehow or the other gets affected with uh, uh, various factors that happened. As I will talk from my side, um, COVID and lockdown led to uh, being uh, homebound for about uh, nearly a an year and that led to loss of gait speed on my own part and I discovered that I have lost about 15 to 20 percent of my gait speed before and after COVID. Of course, I tried to make it up and uh, did a lot of walking to gain that. But somehow some deficits remain. And along with that, uh, events happen, go on happening around us, um, bereavement and uh, disruptions, etc. Uh, so they all take a take some kind of an impact on our uh, um, mental health, and that in turn makes uh, one uh, unhappy, and then um, and so is. Uh, the disabilities are accompanied with that. But what we understand is that uh, um, most of the non-communicable diseases that we de deal with in, non, uh, old, deal with in older persons, somewhere or the other will lead some kind of uh, disability. Uh, for example, a stroke uh, uh, can lead to loss of locomotor function and um, osteoporosis which is a part of aging process can lead to a fracture and that can be horrible and even a heart attack or heart failure can make a person homebound bed bound and from that the muscle uh, the physical capacity will uh, decline uh, fast uh, dementia being one of the biggest problem in our uh, patient population this also is a major factor in making people disabled or uh, or dependent um, I do not want to picture a, I paint a picture of very gloomy life, but let's understand uh, in last uh, decade or so, our understanding of several issues have become clearer. For example, uh, one of my co-panelists will be dealing with frailty um, and dependence. And two decades back, frailty was an English word. And at this point of time, frailty is a big subject of research and uh, in my own department, a lot of patients are working on that and a substantial part of my post-retirement publication is on frailty and related to that. Uh, similarly, we understood that muscle wasting or sarcopenia is, uh, uh, which we thought is a kind of a subject of uh, high-tech research, actually is a part of life, but the muscles are uh, replaced by fat and then that leads to weakness. So, we see that while the very aggressive tennis players, players retire by 30, 35 years of age because the muscles are weak, the lazy cricketers can go on playing uh, cricket for 40s and beyond that. So muscle weakness, sarcopenia is one of the issues that have been, uh, that have made us interested in understanding it. And my last PhD did some modeling on uh, uh, sarcopenia in animals and then we start to do uh, some intervention. So, and we are also, we also know that uh, dementia is our cognitive impairment of old age, cognitive decline of old age uh, is a part of life, but uh, trying to understand the determinants or predictors are also equally important. Uh, two disabilities, that is uh, loss of vision or impaired vision and impaired hearing uh, can be terrible in uh, making people um, lose their cognitive function. So, uh, at least some of the modifiable risk factors which have come up now are important to be understood and intervened to 
prevent uh, cognitive impairment in late life um so what i uh, what i want to impress on the audience is that in this session that we have we'll be looking at uh, various aspects of uh, longevity and disability and this is a very important or uh, very enlightened uh, panel of uh, specialists and experts um, some of whom i have known earlier and some of them i'll be meeting today at least i have known uh, my one of my best friends of life professor arvin mathur for about uh, three decades now and we have met uh, dr uh, chapal khasnavi in some of the uh, webinars of uh, covid in which he would uh, he had in uh, kind of added to the disability and uh, assistive device uh, uh, interventions or innovations in icmr in some of the functions and of course it was a great pleasure to meet uh, dr arti bhatnagar and um, and uh, just a minute um, and dr uh, tasneem raja and dr siu garden for the first time um, i'm specifically impressed with dr tasneem raja that see he that uh, the uh, the organization associated uh, with uh, with dr raja is named after uh, indira gandhi so indira foundation in a in a time of uh, this thing uh, i'm not it's not a political statement quite interesting um, and of course we'll hear something from dr siu siu garden about things that are happening in in a different part of the world which is a developed part of the world with this i am complete my initial comments we are looking at longevity and disability as two sides of the same coin some of you will agree with me some of you will not and then we'll have our own point of views and then we'll understand how things go in old days when it comes to functionality and independence thank you anupama and i thank helpage for asking me to be here sir uh, before you proceed further we'd like to put a poll question to the audience if you allow yeah please go ahead thank you is it visible on the screen or i have to read it so it will be visible in a minute sir okay it is visible but we cannot poll we cannot but maybe for the members not for the panelists it's not for the panelists sir it's only for the attendees okay got it <laughs> you know it all <clears throat> Anupama, should I now invite Dr. Mathur? Just give us a second, sir. I'll just, I'll just. Uh... Okay. So you'll just see the uh, yeah. This is the result of the poll, sir. Can you see it, sir? Doctor Desa, can you see the result of the poll? It and I agree with uh, the um, majority. I says I agree with the majority that this is how it happens. Okay, okay, okay. Now you can proceed, sir. Okay. Uh, we have uh, Professor Arvind Mathur. Uh, can you show his uh, CV, please? Um, a great clinician and a physician. And as you can, you can read over this. Um, at least i uh, always consider that his contribution to uh, running journal of indian academy of geriatrics for nearly two decades without any resource from the society is one of the greatest uh, achievement of life and contribution to geriatric in india uh, dr mathur please start thank you thank you very much professor day uh, professor day initiated many physicians in geriatrics and i am one of them and it is my privilege today that uh, i am part of this uh, panel 
uh, Professor Day has already set the scene for discussion and Dr. Anupama and Pra Mr. Prateep, they also showed the in importance of this particular aspect. So I'd like to uh, share my screen if it is possible. Yes. So I'm going to talk about the gaps and responses which are there in accessing healthcare services by the disabled older people. So this particular point, we have already realized that there is a difficulty in access, accessing the healthcare. So uh, what I'm going to do is that uh, we'll just briefly talk about the issues with the aging, the challenges which the healthcare system faces, the barriers, then try and look at the various responses and gaps and then see what would be the way forward. Now, as has been mentioned, that aging is lost, is associated with the progressive loss of skeletal muscle mass, which Professor Day mentioned that sarcopenia is the very important component of aging. And it leads to loss of the functional capacities. Now, in addition to this, the addition of multimorbidity, the sensory impairment like visual or hearing, the other issues with the mobility and cognitive decline, they add to the disability. And this disability would lead to functional decline. The functionality is being the key point for the healthy aging. So now the healthcare system, which has to maintain the health and well-being of the this particular group, has multiple challenges. They have limited resources. The infrastructure and qualified healthcare workers are rare or are, are fewer. So the older persons, when they access the healthcare services, they have they find so many gaps in the system. And this particular issue of access to healthcare is a, of a global concern. Everywhere people are concerned that how to make our healthcare system accessible for the older people. And we, when we take access, this means that this has been defined as the timely use of personal health services to achieve the best health outcome. So it is important that there is to be timely use, which is there. Now, this would depend upon so many factors, the individual himself, their family, the social and physical environment, and the healthcare system. So these issues, the, the issue of healthcare access would also be impacted by all these uh, factors, which would be, which would, may have a physical barriers, may have social barriers, or say may have institutional barriers. Now, why should we be worried about the healthcare access? Because this difficulty in accessing healthcare services, it results in unmet healthcare needs, delayed care, and poor management of chronic illnesses, which is going to lead to a poor health of the older people, and also is going to have a financial implications for them. So we'd like to look at the healthcare access, which has been looked by under so many frameworks. And I think we, we'll just look at the, the Thomas's framework, which considers that for a healthcare system to be fit between the client's need and the healthcare system. And this access has five domains, the availability, accessibility, accommodation, affordability, and acceptability. Now, when the enablers and barriers were studied for the older people, it was found that the accessibility and acceptability were the two main, main important barrier, barriers or enablers for this particular problem. In addition to this, the other issues which were found were of finances, transport, etc., which have been mentioned recently in the video which we saw. So barriers of the healthcare system, we can see, group them in three categories. 
the social barriers, physical barriers, and health affordability constraints. So in social barriers, of course, gender is important. Women tend to have a lesser access to the healthcare system. The social inequities because of the socioeconomic status, religion, caste, stigmas, that also adds to this problem. The physical barriers because of the reduced mobility, the declining social engagement, and the limited reach are the important issues. And the um, another important thing is of uh, affordability, which is due to limited income, employment, assets, limitation of financial protection. We do not have insurance for this particular age group and health expenditure, which has to be borne out of the pocket and the cost of the treatment. So all these factors are important, which would have impact on the access of the healthcare system. So we'll just try and look at certain barriers and try and see what are the common gaps which we observe in them and what are what have been the responses or what could be done for that. So when you list out the important things, we just try to do that, that we have physical accessibility, communication challenge, transportation barriers, information. So we'll try to look at each one of them one by one. Now, physical accessibility is one important thing. When we mention it, that physical barrier is an important barrier. And what is happening that many healthcare facilities are not accessible for wheelchair bound patients. And there are uh, challenges for the mobility impaired individuals to access those healthcare facilities. The responses have been there in our country where we have tried under the Disability Act to make every place accessible for the disabled by providing ramps, elevators, or other facilities. But still, there much more needs to be done for this particular aspect. Then transportation, which was mentioned in our video also, when we saw uh, visually impaired people being transported to for the, uh, their uh, treatment. So accessible transportation is an important problem with disabled older people. And there has to be some intervention done at the community level with the providing the transportation by uh, collaborating with the transportation services, or so. Then the another important thing is that the information may not be available to for the disabled people in the healthcare system. So we will need to have a accessible formats which are displayed over there and use technology to disseminate the information about the healthcare facilities which are available. Then the one important thing which we face is ageism. The attitude of the healthcare persons or even the misconceptions among the healthcare providers is also there. They tend to distinguish people based on the age and there is a need to make them aware and address the issue of ageism in the healthcare system. Financial barrier, we have already mentioned that financial resources are not there and there is a need to have some explore programs for providing financial assistance, providing subsidies or insurance options for this particular age group. And we need to advocate for policies that address the financial burden on this, in this for this group. Care coordination is another important problem which is there in this particular age group, where we see that uh, the different healthcare systems, they are not connected with each other and there is no coordination in their facility working. So there is a need to have a care coordination. Uh, in whatever we have realized in community level services, a presence of a care coordinator helps a lot the disabled people to access the hospital healthcare facilities. So you, there is a need to have a coordination of the uh, care. Even technology can come and help on that particular thing. Cultural competence of the healthcare system and healthcare provider is important. In our practice, I've realized that 
you have to know the cultural aspect of your population which you are dealing with. So this particular thing is important where we need to make healthcare professionals learn about the culture for where they are practicing. And we have to have a culturally sensitive environment in the healthcare facilities also. Of course, nothing moves without uh, a bureaucratic and administrative uh, system. So awareness, creating awareness in them also is important, both at the administrative level of the healthcare system and at the level of the policymakers also. So to make these facilities uh, accessible for the old people. And awareness about the uh, healthcare system itself and the facilities amongst the older people has to be created. One important thing which is there is a communication challenge. Whenever there is an older person in our clinic or in our institution, we find that communicating with them could be challenging because of various visual or uh, auditory disturbances or cognitive uh, decline. So, in that particular case, we have to train our healthcare professionals to deal with these individuals and also try and provide the, them the, uh, the devices or uh, the uh, assistance for their sensory impairment. So we saw that there are so many gaps which are there for which certain responses are feasible. But for doing that particular thing, we need to associate the all the stakeholders. It is not only the government itself which would be uh, responsible for this. We need to have the social uh, participation, the public-private partnership has to be there. The civil societies have to play their role. So this is one important area where we all can work together. And this particular part we have seen with the work, with the interventions which Helpers has been doing it over all these years, and so we need to have a community-based services because there is a need to decentralize and uh, deinstitutionalize the services, and they have to go to the community, and the community-based rehabilitation models or community-based healthcare services are very important which will bring the services to their home. And this particular thing will depend upon the community-based organizations, volunteers, or other partners at the community level. So community-based health service is one important thing which will help us to address the problem of healthcare access for the older people. The other thing to bring healthcare services to the uh, this particular segment is vulnerable segment is by mobile medical units which have been very important component of and rather important contribution of help is to this wherein this particular uh, way we reach out to the older people in inaccessible areas by providing them with free medication diagnostic test at their doorstep and even home visits are also being done under this particular program. So this particular intervention is very important to address the healthcare access for the older people. COVID also brought this particular technology to the limelight. We have got digital technology and telehealth available with us and which can be used for providing the healthcare for in those who are not able to access the healthcare system itself. So these two technologies are going to help us a lot for creating healthcare access for this particular age group. So dear colleagues, uh, we need to address the, the important area of uh, uh, the healthcare access, which will need a collaborative effort by the healthcare providers, by policy makers, and by the other civil societies or organization and the community itself. And in India, we have got certain interventions which have been, uh, been there on the part of the government, 
by like Ayushman Bharati Yojana or Nirmal, but there are still certain significant gaps in that particular case. So we need to work together and bring out this, uh, the services for the older people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mathur. Uh, the audience can uh, appreciate why Dr. Mathur is considered as one of the best medical teachers in our times. Um, I always learn something or the other, some other, some new point or the other, you always focus and try to emphasize on. Um, we'll have the question answers toward the end because there's half an hour uh, dedicated to question answer session. So this uh, um, Dr. Mathur session ends here. You will also continue to be in the audience, uh, in the panel. Uh, we'll have the next uh, speaker, um, Professor Arti Nagarkar. Um, she will be talking about risk factors and pathways to functional decline in public uh, public health, health interventions. Uh, Dr. Nagarkar uh, is a public health specialist. You can see her, see her uh, CV. And uh, my one of my colleagues, uh, two of us started geriatric medicine in Ames, Dr. Kalpana Nagarkar. So this is quite a come very familiar uh, surname to me and I always um, remember her uh, intervention, uh, her contributions to developing geriatric medicine in Ames. Uh, Professor Nagarkar, please. Uh, good morning, and thank you, Dr. Day, for your kind, uh, uh, I, I would say, a nice welcome over here by giving citing someone who you know as Nagarkar. Um, and uh, I thank Helpage for inviting me and allowing me to share my thoughts on risk factors and pathways to functional decline and some of the public health intervention uh, that are possible to improve uh, the uh, functional decline in elderly. Uh, very often we come across cases where people say that I had a minor fall and uh, that has now uh, you know, laid me to pain. I'm unable to several things. Uh, there are restrictions in participation and limitation. So whether it's a minor fall or a major hospitalization fracture, those incidences have significant impact on functionality and independence of older adults. Now, one such incidence is enough to transform their life from active, functional, independent individual to a sequelae of fall leading to person with pain and agony. Actually, each one of them are willing to or wish to have sufficiently active and maxim active life and maximizing healthy lifespan as a proportion of total life. And it's a desirable goal for many. And I would say the WHO figures and the UNDESA figures says that more than 1 billion people who are above 60 years of age desire to have active and independent life. But that's going to be a challenge especially for healthcare professionals, because as you see from the graph, the growth rate of people who are above 60 years of age is much higher as compared to the general population. Uh, now, what is functionality? Functional decline is a gradual loss of physical and cognitive functioning causing difficulty in performing activities of daily living. Many physical abilities decline with normal age, including your strength, swiftness, stamina, muscle mass, and the speed of decline is heterogeneous and is largely determined by a combination of diverse factors. Uh, I'm unable to change my slide. Okay, so how is functionality measured? This is, as we all know, that it is activities of daily living 
and instrumental activities of daily living. We have this longitudinal aging study in India, which is pan-India study. And if you look, look at the graph that is displayed on the screen, you will find that more than 50% of the people who participated in this particular study, they have limitations or difficulty with lower limb associated functions like stooping, climbing, walking, which indicates loss of muscle strength, and that may lead to future disability. When IADL's graph is seen, we also see that they have limitations in performing several simple, for us apparently very simple tasks, but such as finding a strange address or managing finances, managing medication. All this indicates that people are losing functions when they hit 60 or above. Now, there is a considerable overlap between functional decline, disability, and frailty in elderly. As indicated in this map by pink color, nearly 16 Indian states have more than 30% prevalence of frailty, meaning they, are, they have already experienced ADL and IADL decline in most part of India. Here, the reason I'm trying to show this is because there is, it, the graph on the right indicates there is slowness in more than 50% of the people. As Dr. Day mentioned in his opening remarks, that gait speed has affected, uh, even though you are fully aware, there is tremendous loss of gait speed as you hit 60. Functional decline or disability is not an event. It is a continuous process. Therefore, understanding trajectories or pathways is very important. Literature has suggested that there are in all eight different trajectories of functional decline during various stages of aging process. And tracking trajectories through longitudinal studies provide us information on distinct subgroups in the population which require more attention or more care. I would like to explain trajectories using data from my own study that was undertaken by our research team, especially my PhD students in Pune University, uh, in a cohort of nearly 2,500 people above 60 years of age. We have followed this cohort and collected information on 103 variables pertaining to functionality in different domains, and we have come across three trajectories. The first trajectory, as we know, and many longitudinal studies have already shown this, that with the physiological changes or decline in functionality is very, very apparent. And uh, uh, it, it usually begins with change in gait speed. We have measured gait speed using uh, the electronic device, the sensors to measure it, uh, to have accuracy of data. We have also found that impaired balance, and this may lead to fall in at least one third of the population. One fall or a subsequent fall reduce their mobility and further leads to declining in their ADL and IADL. So this aggravates their functional decline process. This process is further aggravated when there is presence of chronic conditions or comorbidities more than two. And in most of the cases, we have found that more than 40% of our population had at least two comorbidities. Now, these two comorbidities and functional decline further leads to decline in their physical activities, including their walking speed. They also have a lot of complaints such as aches and pains. They may develop fear of fall. They have a subsequent fall and a hospitalization either because of fall or for any other reason. If the duration of hospitalization is more, then the declining functionality is greater. With this baggage, they may develop weakness, fatigue, and frailty. Frailty is also seen in more than 30% of the population and a pre-frail population in our cohort was nearly 60%. Pre-frail meaning having at least three or more uh, issues. This may lead to disability in elderly. Now, of late, what we have seen in our 
last round of follow-up, which is still going on, uh, this data is not published yet, but what we have found out is that with the greater functional decline and frailty, there are changes in attention and memory and cognitive decline is also, it also starts or begins with decline in their functionality. With this comes the other aspects of life, which are not part of a medical domain, but there are changes in their social network. They may develop depressive symptoms, isolation or loneliness, and this aggravates their functional decline. So there is a combination of functional decline, which is measured using ADL and IADL. So higher score on these two scales, leading to frailty and then going for cognitive decline in mo most of the cases, because as they age, if the age increases, the chances of having cognitively decline uh, uh, people are more. And what we realize is that it's an interplay of multiple risk factors. And these risk factors interact with each other in a different way, leading to different health outcomes. So studying a broad range of risk factors for predicting change in functional performance is essential for Indian setup. Very few studies have longitudinal data in community-based cohorts to discuss factors or predictors of functional decline. Therefore, in Pune study, we followed up our cohort to identify these trajectories of functional decline with potential predictors. On the red box, you will see a list of factors which are usually noted or identified because they are related to their health directly, such as gait speed, slowness, as it is complained, impaired balance, fall, fracture, presence of chronic illnesses, chronic pain, fatigue, muscle loss, low endurance, which required individualized and some public health intervention. Of course, role of medical care and healthcare is very essential over here. I would suggest or rather emphasize on the rehabilitation care and use of assistive devices because that has helped a lot in reducing incidence of fall in most of our uh, people or participant in our study. And continuous monitoring or finding an opportunity to screen them wherever possible is very important to maintain or to improve their functionality. But this doesn't stop over here. The functionality decline also has some other factors, such as personal factors, lifestyle, your habits, alcoholism, smoking, BMI, uh, underweight and overweight, both have this uh, chances of having higher level of functional decline. Uh, Dr. Day mentioned about sarcopenia. We also, we have seen sarcopenic obesity in our cohort. So uh, whether you are physically active, doing exercise, diet, nutrition, management of existing condition, and your living arrangements, living alone or with the family, that also makes a lot of difference in functional abilities. Along with that, psychosocial and environmental factors, availability of family support. How do you look at your own life situations? What are your coping mechanisms? Social network, do you have person to run errands for you? Do you have somebody with whom you can confide and talk your uh, stress or distresses? All those factors also make a lot of difference. And of course, the built environment, home modifications are also very necessary to maintain a level of functional uh, abilities or performance in elderly. Now on this particular background, we uh, decided or we took our study further to generate evidence for improving functionality. So we undertook this study on primary focus on improvement in gait speed, prevention of fall, and improvement in functionality. This is a registered uh, trial. We also thought to test if this strategy can work as a public health strategy. Hence, this was a community-based study in randomly selected 190 individuals. So a 16-week exercise intervention consisting of stretching, strengthening, balance, and dual task training, along with diet and nutrition advice, home modification, and awareness about being active was delivered. We checked their improvement two times. 
four months after intervention and 12 months after interventions. There was 26% improvement in functionality and 45% reduction in their fall risk. So interventions for functional decline in older adults are almost always multifactorial and they would rather work if they are multifactorial. Uh, this data has been published in scientific journal as well as in many uh, newspapers also. And uh, we, we have learned a lot of lessons following this particular study. So uh, the lesson that we have learned is restoration of functionality is possible. You require pharmacological and non-pharmacological intervention. As I mentioned, opportunistic screen screening for functional decline using a simple validated tool at primary care level will help a lot if we put that as a public health intervention. If positive for moderate or severe functional decline, they can be referred to a higher uh, referral uh, center or to a geriatrician. So identifying changes in functionality as early as possible, uh, that is usually in a midlife after in their 40s, if we can identify and promote physical activity or exercise program or obesity management, because some of the studies published elsewhere report that the uh, 40 plus population have higher level of overweight and obese individual. So targeting before you hit 60, would be another public health strategy that will help in reducing functional limitations. The third and very important factor is physical exercise and active lifestyle, improving health quality and functions, reducing major mobility disability and delay frailty will be very, very important in this particular study. Uh, in, uh, we found this in our study and will be very important as a public health intervention. So along with that, nutrition, diet, social support, all this is very important and they play significant role in reducing functional limitations. So Nagar, uh, can you wrap up? Yes, this is my last slide. So the last or the take home message over here is functional decline is a process and not an event. So is a disability and therefore we have to look at it not only from a curative perspective, but a public health prevention and health promotion perspective is very, very important. Recognizing implications of functional decline from public health perspective, recognizing the complexity of factors which actually affect functionality is very important. And fragmented work or research that is going on currently in India has to be put in place and has to put together to have a better picture. And of course, life course lens to look at functionality and health in older ages and promoting integration of health and social care of elderly will be very, very uh, essential as a public health strategy for reducing functionality. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Nagarkar. Um, is this building in the university building? It's very beautiful. Yes. Yes, this is our main building. We okay, are very lucky to work here. Uh, <laughs> the next speaker will be Dr. Tasneem Raja. The topic uh, is... Dr. Day, uh, if you allow us a poll yeah, question. Yeah, you have a poll question now. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So you can see the result of the poll here. A very uh, emphatic no, we can see on the... Yeah, I mean, I agree with that. I was just thinking whether... I'm in the... I'm with the masses. <laughs> you know the reality of this world. Yeah, uh, but we'll close here and uh, you can continue, sir. Okay. Uh, Dr. Tasneem Raja, can I have her uh, CV, please? 
<coughs> she is uh, working on a variety of areas on social importance. You can see her CV. Extremely interesting and empathic. Um, and you can start your presentation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Day. So I don't have a presentation and I'm only going to be talking uh, uh, on, on the topic that I was asked to cover, which is mental health. That's very uh, fine. Yeah. yeah. So first and foremost, uh, Help Age India, uh, a big shout out to you for holding this uh, web seminar on a very important and a very pertinent topic in today's uh, reality and in today's world. Uh, and and the and the kind of coverage you have given to various topics, I think, uh, a very thoughtfully put together uh, uh, talk with different experts coming in, and uh, that really speaks to the importance of integrated care. We want integrated care across the continuum, but its relevance is far more important in uh, geriatric uh, health or in the health of older people, uh, and especially so in the context of uh, mental health. And thank you, Chairperson, for the introduction as well as uh, for the opportunity for speaking. So let me start on a personal note. Uh, I am a 51-plus-year-old person living with an 82-year-old mother. So uh, this is... A topic very close to heart, like for most of us. A lot of uh, the other speakers or the, the two prior speakers and Dr. Day have covered several aspects uh, of, of aging uh, already, including the numbers, right? We are already a billion plus globally. We will be between 1.4 to 2 billion by 2030. And uh, for every such projected number, we have happily cross those boundaries, whether it has been depression or whatever, and you'll probably cross the population boundary uh, that has been projected as well. So we definitely are an aging world, and we actually have no alternative but to pay attention to the concerns uh, and and the quality of life of, of aging and uh, people, older people. Uh, so, really, I mean, uh, like, okay, uh, sorry, I don't know where that came from. Okay, so, um, uh, like, like Dr. Nagarkar pointed out, uh, you know, that uh, depression social isolation were the two important words and the speaker prior used the concept of ageism. Uh, these are all very significant concepts which I will also uh, touch on. Very recently, actually, just this month, the WHO announced loneliness to be at epidemic proportions. So almost one quarter of older people face chronic loneliness. And that's one in four people. One in four older people are lonely. Uh, and we know there is enough evidence to tell us that social isolation and loneliness are the two most important factors connected with mental health issues, uh, degenerative uh, MNS conditions uh, in older life, and outcomes thereof. Uh, so, you know, and really uh, it isn't just a point in time kind of a so there will definitely be some sessions that we're planning to do on what is this request all the audience to please just switch off their mics please Thank you. Sorry, extremely sorry for this. Uh... No worries. 
So, um, sorry, there was a, I've lost my train of thought. Okay. So what we were saying is that, uh, you know, almost a one in four people living over the age of 60 face chronic loneliness. And we know that loneliness is associated with uh, degenerative mental health conditions and also outcomes uh, thereof, as also disorders such as uh, depression. The rates of suicide uh, also increase with age. So there are several uh, things that are very important here uh, from the perspective of mental health. Now, the other thing is that uh, mental health conditions are not just point in time uh, uh, conditions that, that happen with aging. Lots of people have spoken uh, prior to me about the fact that, uh, you know, th there is a natural and expected change in capacities. Uh, there are associated uh, health conditions that happen, uh, etc. And uh, that change is one very important thing. The environment, uh, the social and the economic environment is the second very important uh, variable in terms of association to mental health conditions. The third very important thing to consider is the cumulative life impact. So it isn't just that, okay, all older people go through mental health or distress or uh, uh, social isolation or loneliness and or associated uh, disorders. There is some. There is a whole life that has been lived. Uh, you know, the whole world is talking about trauma-informed care in mental health uh, for the other age groups. That is also very, very important and relevant uh, with older adults. Uh, this is like Dr. Nagarka pointed out. This is also a time uh, uh, when bereavement and loss is at its highest. Uh, Again, while expected, these are still traumatic life events that um, that 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 add to the already increasing burden of distress, uh, loss of spouse, loss of friends, uh, lo uh, retirement is also uh, a very important uh, milestone in life's journey. It it indicates a change in one's activity levels uh, and. Despite the fact that most people know that they are going to be retiring at a certain age, uh, and despite a lot of good intentions, the social framework doesn't really support um, activities with older people. And you know, the poll just prior to the talk actually showed that you know how many people have access to hobbies and all things that they want to do and i can give you an example you know my mom was well over 60 but then she had time and uh, she wanted to get back to uh, embroidery uh, you know machine embroidery which she had not had the opportunity to learn while she was uh, you know prior to age 60 so she went to the class and she came back and she gave up on the first class and she said, nahi, wo nahi pa hai. Mujhe utna nahi dikhta hai jitna ko dikhta hai. So that person isn't able to teach me. Na. Mujhe bahut dikkat ho rahi thi, usko bhi bahut dikkat ho rahi thi. And uh, this was well over 20 years ago. And even at that time, I had wondered, you know, that, hey, look, she wants to do something and... There's clearly several barriers that are coming in her way of trying to do something when she has that little time in life where she can actually focus on something that she likes to do. So, and that's the case with uh, everyone. Let's, even before I step into talking about, uh, you know, what are the things to do, there are two more things that I wanted to talk about. And one is ageism. You know, we talk about ageism. Ageism is, is the is so imbibed it's similar to patriarchy you know it's it's right uh, it's very very internalized uh, across generations and age is used as as a factor of inequity it is used as a factor of lack of social justice it is used as a factor of discrimination as well as stigma uh, a simple thing you know how many people over 60 will find jobs easily even if they are fully functional, capable, with a lot of experience. And people actually, hirers actually tell you that, uh, you know, we're looking for a younger person. Uh, yes, I understand there are economics to this uh, and all, but 
it's still a very clearly stated fact that you're too old to work or you know you're too old for us to be uh, hiring you um and there's a lot of controversy around the age of retirement uh, as well apart from this as you grow older you know the the power center changes you move from being the center of decision making to accepting decisions and a lot of this uh, how this plays out also depends on relationships that have been formed and cultivated when you were at the power at the at the center of power and decision making but let us remember that older people are exposed to very high levels of emotional verbal and physical abuse uh, and often by their caregivers and their uh, their family and kid and kin so uh, this is something that i thought is very important and central to the discussion on mental health uh the who uh, uh, you know recommends integrated care and that's integrated mental health care is recommended for all age groups not just for older adults mental health care is a vertical or a stand alone we know does not work especially in in conditions that are so highly stigmatized globally and i often say this that um uh, you know the zero point of global mental health is actually the fact that we have not been able to make any significant dent in stigma and discrimination faced by people living with mental health conditions so in terms of a data point 14% of all people over 60 will experience a diagnosable mental health condition that's a very very high number uh, you know and uh, the previous speakers also pointed out to the neurogenerative disorders uh, that that will be experienced now one of the first and most important things we talk about in integrated mental health care is the role of communities uh the the important thing to note is that uh, we don't want to pathologize distress the stress is a part of life we all go through distress and all distress is not disorder so we need to make that difference and uh, that's where the continuum of preventive promotive and curative care uh, comes in preventive care preventive and promotive care is largely focused on the social determinants you can't really do distress management in isolation and um uh, the the important thing is to address all the social determinants so if you look at recommended care uh, in for mental health care for older adults it covers a lot of the stuff with organizations like help age and other people working with geriatric care do uh, economic independence uh, uh, addressing um, uh, abuse a lot of those variables uh, you know making health care available all of those are uh, housing uh, especially housing that is age friendly and disability uh, friendly in terms of the pr- promotive aspects of care the most important thing that we need to bring about is social connectedness uh, and i will talk about some of the work that uh, we are doing uh, in in just a bit but social connectedness and addressing loneliness are by far the two most important things we need to do apart from early detection and management especially for neurodegenerative conditions we all know that we are still not there in terms of curative uh, provisions we what we can do is management and there are both psychosocial aspects of management as well as uh, pharmacological aspects of management and they both play a very important role uh, in neurodegenerative conditions and um, uh, however early detection is key you know and overcoming myths and misconceptions that that society has uh, and going through that process of screening is is clearly important you know we all think that forgetting is a normal part of life well it may not be so and and we need to discriminate between uh, an information load causing a uh, lack of attention versus actual forgetfulness uh, as as we move forward uh i wanted to step out of this a lot of what i have spoken about 
everybody knows. So I wanted to step back a little and talk about in the Ra Foundation and our work in mental health and aging. Uh, sorry, Dr. Dave, but Indira Foundation isn't uh, about Indira Gandhi. It is about, uh, so it is the name of the founder's mother, who he lost when he was very young. Um, and uh, so uh, Indira Foundation was, is, is, is part of the family foundations of a Vidharb Gandhian family. Um, and one of the most well-known names of that family is Dr. Abhay Bang. So this is the same uh, larger family umbrella. Dr. Uh, we Raja, have... we need to, I mean, you need to kind of close. Okay, so already... give me two minutes. Uh, yeah. So I'll just call out a few examples of what we are doing in uh, mental health. We do day programs for addressing loneliness and social isolation. And we also do for-profit programs. Uh, we don't do it directly. We work with collaborators in providing intergenerational uh, companionship. And what I'd like to use this platform for is to invite all people working with older adults to work with us in layering mental health care. And we bring in both the resources as well as technical expertise. And I'm going to wind up with that and uh, hand it back to Dr. Day uh, as the chair. Thank you for the time and opportunity to speak. Uh, thank you, Dr. Raja. Um, do we have a poll question now? No. Yes, sir. We have one more poll question because now we'll talk about technology for, for yeah. the next two uh, sessions. So you can see the results. We have a very, um, I'm actually concerned about the yes here because it's just such a small number. So that's the reality. But that's Okay, so we'll, we'll discuss it further in the session. Yeah. Thank you. We'll close so it. We have the, yeah. We have the, can we have the next uh, bar CV, please? Yes, sir. Next, we have Dr. Sue Gordon. She is the research director and workforce capability lead at Age Care Research and Industry Innovation in Australia. Dr. Sue works with age care providers and the community to optimize aging, age care, and the effective use of technology through research translation. She brings over 20 years of physiotherapy experience and more than 15 years of academic experience to this role. Her research has involved collaboration with local government age care and health service providers and colleagues from other universities. Yeah, Dr. Gordon, please start your presentation. Lovely. Um, thank you um, very much, Dr. Day, and for that introduction. And thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all today and to share um, the challenges that we have. Um, I do have a PowerPoint, and I'm hoping that somebody is going to thank you, bring that up. Um, so um, I um, lead, have a, a, a large role in the aged care research and industry innovation um, group um, here in Australia. We've been funded by our federal government for three years with $34 million to increase the capability of the aged care workforce to um, actually translate research evidence into practice and also to increase the uptake of technology. Um, in the aged care sector. I hope that what I'll share will be useful for you. Um, in Australia, we always acknowledge um, the lands that we meet on are the traditional owners of our lands. And where I come from, that's the Ghana people. So I'm in Adelaide in South Australia and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. If we can have the next slide, please. So 
What we are looking for in aged care in Australia is what we call a quadruple win. There are four things that we really want to have in when we're providing aged care services. So quality services and safe care for older Australians, that hasn't always happened. And we want capable and supported workforce who have got really good career pathways that enable them to, to see a role for themselves into the future in aged care. We also want more efficiency and more equitable delivery of aged care services. Um, as you might know, we have lots of rural and remote areas, just as India does. I've been lucky enough to visit northern India and to do some trekking in the Him Himalayas. Um, and so we have some common challenges there, I think, about how we actually get the services to people. We also need growth in the sector. We need businesses that are vibrant, dynamic and able to respond to the changing needs of older people. Thank you. Next slide. Um, it's been an interesting conversation and I think um, it was Dr Raja that talked about um, ageism and this is actually a comic that was in one of our newspapers the comment is from a previous federal treasurer of australia peter costello saying how terrifying it is that all of these aging baby boomers might need a hip replacement how on earth are we ever going to manage all of this but what I would say to you is that we are on the cusp of a really different group of ageing people who are going to want different things. And what we're starting to see emerging, thank you, next slide, is that they are far more digitally literate because in Australia, at least, these were the group of people who started the gamification, who were around for the beginning of digital technologies like Space Invaders. And I'm not sure if they were very popular in India or not. But we have got digital natives coming through, whereas our 18 and 90 year olds at the moment um, are not. The other thing about them is that they're very independent thinkers, that they were the group who... Um, you know, protested about the Vietnam War here in Australia, that are, they're really after, and we'll go on to the next slide, they're really after a user experience. As well as care, they're after a user experience. And they do have better health-seeking behaviours than the group's more health literacy. It's not great, but it's better than the older people who are currently receiving care. So we've got a different demographic coming through. One of our massive challenges here in Australia, and, and from what I can see globally, we've just come back from a month in North America and in Europe talking to um, aged care specialists in those countries, is the capability of the workforce and the very, very thin workforce in aged care. So if we can just have the, the next slide. And what we're finding is that the complexity, because people are living for longer, they of course have got more comorbidities, a severer functional decline. Uh, we're seeing more polypharmacy and frailty um, and greater diversity. So many of the things that you've talked about in terms of cultural safety and how do we have that because we have a massive multicultural society in Australia. So we're seeing that these needs in both community-based care and there is a drive for people to age in the community at home is, is actually really increasing. So we're needing to look at the capability of the workforce in this more complex delivery of care, both in the community and in residential aged care facilities. Next slide, please. So our great challenge is to get the right services to the right people and by the right people at the right time in the right place. And we recognise that with this very, very thin workforce that we have, that we're going to have to leverage technology to be able to deliver care efficiently and effectively and safely. And so um, in, in Australia, we are, we're working towards that. And I'd like to share with you just a few of the things that are starting to emerge. Next slide, please. So I guess when I look at technology, I'm aware that we have so much technology already developed. And one of our problems is actually how to really embed it in everyday care. And certainly, you know, AI is just on the cusp of, of changing things and stepping it up even more. But we have many really good technologies that we haven't actually embedded well to date. I'll put a drone up because we were in Malaysia recently and they were doing 
a uh, and there may be things happening in India with drones uh, where they were actually delivering, would you believe, Hungry Jacks or McDonald's um, via a drone. So there are all sorts of things, uh, you know, pharmacy distribution via drones and all sorts of things are on the cards at the moment. If we look at the next slide, this is really just an interpretation of what a future digital health ecosystem might look like. We've got so much opportunity in so many different areas of how care is delivered um, that we actually need to build in. Um, it was really interesting in our recent travels, we heard about Estonia and we heard about the fact that when the Soviet Union left Estonia, they had no digital health systems at all. But what they had was the marvellous opportunity to build it from the ground up using all the technology that was available. And apparently it's worth taking a look at. That's for our next trip, I think. Next slide. And of course, there are issues. And in terms of technology, the issues that we see, there are just three slides about this. One is the fact that we see a lot of um, products looking for a problem or solutions looking for a problem rather than the other way around of co-designing and co-producing what's really needed to solve the right problems. And one of the things that we do at ARIA is actually put technology together with aged care providers to really ideate but also then to test and see whether, in fact, the solutions are appropriate. The next problem uh, that we have on the slides is, um, is data and design standards, interoperability. And look, I think I hear this in most areas of the world, in most sort of systems, and it is that ability for um, software programs to talk to each other. And the next slide has just got a representation of how complex this can be. But, you know, our health systems are not doing it so well. When you think about banking internationally, I can take my banking card and I can use it anywhere in the world and I can get money. When you think about airline systems who have come together despite the competitiveness, they they share things that allow them to have these seamless interfaces with users. But I But we struggle with that in terms of health, aged care, disability services, veterans services here in Australia, because they're quite siloed areas. Um, uh, going through to solution three are the regulatory standards. And I guess in India, you're probably having the types of problems we are around cybersecurity and hacking of systems. And we have had aged care providers who have been hacked and of course, this is um, this is a real problem. And I, I guess getting those regulatory standards, um, even at one jurisdiction or nationally, but recognising that this is actually an international issue, um, because uh, many of our clouds um, are not actually um, local to us or, in fact, nationally um, supported. So on the next slide, what I've talked a little bit about is how we would like to see virtual technology enabled services in aged care. And of course, there's massive overlap with disability and aged care. And often the technology is kind of thought of as an add-on, a tack tacked on at the end rather than being considered right at the very beginning when you're thinking about how your services will be delivered. And we're changing that sort of thinking. We also need boundary spanning because not any one profession, not any one service has got the answers. And I think particularly when I look at aged care, where we are moving to community-based ageing at home, the social care, the elements that wrap around what an aged care provider might give or supply, we actually really need here in Australia lots of local government input as well. So that boundary spanning across professions, across services, across jurisdictions is, is going to be essential for us to, to really provide services adequately and appropriately. I think the value propositions are really important to think and consider around technology what will actually make an older person use technology? What will actually make a workforce adopt it, providers, organisations to adopt it? And it really does come down often 
to how essential they truly believe it is. And, you know, I look back to 10, 15 years ago when nobody did their banking online to now everybody does and the value proposition was there that it's convenient. We still have people who worry about the safety of it and there is risk, but it was convenient and so we've changed the whole way that we do business. So the other thing is that technology push. So this is around, again, that solution looking for a problem versus the demand pool and getting that right around technology is really important. So it's embedded appropriately and it's a sustainable um, and effective uh, a thing to have. Only a couple more slides. I hope I'm doing okay for time. The next one I want to talk about is reablement because um, in Australia we've ha we haven't we have got reablement services, but I think they can be better. And if we can get the digitally connected care of knowing and using those sensors that we've already got, um, and I, there's some amazing technology. We, when we were in a way recently in Las Vegas, there was um, some technology where you you look you look at, at, at something and it, it's a sensor and it reads your eye. And from that, it gives you your blood pressure, your temperature, your um, oxygen levels and your stress levels and your mood. So there's, you know, there's new technologies that around the telehealth approach, uh, because certainly in, in Australia's geography, we're never, ever going to have all the services that we need on people's doorsteps. And we have to be thinking about how we can maximise our use of telehealth approaches and, and really pulling the whole system together. Um, we've got some uh, robotics happening in Australia, which I, I probably won't talk to very much right now, but you, you might want to, to perhaps ask about if it's something that interests you. But we are starting to see robotics actually coming into, into the delivery of care not actually care, but the ancillary things of taking the laundry, the dirty laundry um, out of the room, delivering meals and so forth. So we have some of that happening quite close to where I live. So we need to start looking at um, pulling all of it together, all of this technology together in a more meaningful way. Next slide, please. And that's what I guess I'm reinforcing here, that how do we move what we've started to implement where we might have started to implement one technology and how do we actually build that into a holistic interconnection of technologies and we've got we have got some trials going on in australia that look really really promising and good but we do need to move to more sophisticated adoption of the technologies to support new models of service delivery not just for rehabilitation but for day-to-day -day delivery of care um, so, so this is an important part of it. And I look at the um, I look at the motor industry and, and if we go to the next slide, today when you take your car to be serviced, it basically gets plugged into a computer. And that system, that computer system is, and this is where some of the really AI has come into things, sufficient data from multiple cars all over the world, the one type of car have allowed them to identify common patterns of um, malfunction in cars. And so this AI has allowed customization around, around the different models of cars. And I wonder whether those opportunities for understanding different cohorts or phenotypes of patients, different combinations of comorbidities, and what does actually give us the best outcomes in terms of how we deliver service, but what service we actually deliver. I think dosage around any intervention, um, particularly in allied health, has always been a really difficult thing um, to determine for best outcomes. Almost my last slide. This is about gamification. So gamification is really interesting because it's all about um, causing addiction. If you play any type of app or game, it might even be solitaire, at the end you get the bouncing cards and the flash and the tinsel, and it's all about addiction. And so gamification is starting to emerge too in health. 
So there are, you know, apps coming out about exercise and, and giving people those, those rewards, the pings on the phone um, and so forth. And I think we're going to see more gamification and there's certainly some of it, uh, some of it starting to develop. So getting people addicted to good things uh, might be a, a really useful thing, particularly around pre-frailty. Because we do know that that pre kicks in in the 40s and 50s. You don't have to wait to be 60 to be pre -frail. And we, we, we massively need to move upstream in our delivery of care. So in summary, what we're looking for in Australia is what everybody's really looking for. It's, it's utopia. Um, so that is that we are trying to move towards a thriving, data-informed, technology-enabled aged care sector that does provide evidence-based, person-centred quality care and services. It is a long and winding road, and we all have much to discover and much to contribute uh, in getting there. And lastly, I'd just like to say um, thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you today. If you'd like to know more about the things that we do, and we have funded 62 projects around translation of research into practice and use of technology in aged care. They're all on our website, so please um, have a look. If you've got any questions, feel free to email me. Thanks again. Thank you, Dr. Gordon, uh, for that very interesting speech. The last slide was quite threatening. Somebody <laughs> will make, a, uh, make an express uh, way on that road, so hide it. So that's the... You know, people do not like such nice, uh, beautiful, natural uh, reserves. Uh, <laughs> next next uh, talk will be... You have a question now? Yes, sir. Uh, we have one last question for the session. Okay. So we'll have the poll. That's why I, what I was wondering. Uh, hmm. We just thought we'll, we'll trick the we'll trick the audience. Um, <laughs> but uh, but see, uh, no nobody says smart home and automation systems just by themselves. Like yeah, They're just on a lighter vein. Uh, we, in our uh, school days, you were the first batch to go through MCQ. So the trick was when you do not know the answer, <laughs> answer C. And if there are five uh, responses, then answer E, which will be all of the above or none of the above. So I was just wondering, it must be all of the above. And the audience also thought the same way. In fact, all of them are important. Uh, there's nothing to choose between one of the over. So all of them are important in uh, making life better. So we have the last speaker uh, in this uh, session, uh, Dr. Chapal Khasnavis. Um, spent um, how many years? He spent 20 years uh, in uh, WHO. And my guru, Dr. Kalyan Bhakti, used to say, if you send, spend 13 years, it's one donkey years. So you have one and a half, half donkey years in WHO. Um, we have I have heard him earlier in another uh, meeting in another forum. So uh, I request him, uh, just look at his CV. It's quite an uh, important one for the contest uh, in which we are having this uh, seminar or webinar. And uh, Dr. Kastnavis, the stage is yours. Thank you, Dr. Day. And thank you, Helpage, for inviting me. And could I have my slides, please? Yeah, next one. So here is my address if anybody wants to connect. So I thought I to present this in this structure. First, we have to understand why you are discussing this today. It's demographic change. 
then intersectionality, assistive care. What do we mean by assistive care? What is assistive technology? Accessibility and summary. Like doctor, they said that all we have to take it together. It's not one or others. Next, please. Next. Yeah. Demographic change is a big issue. And many times, many conferences or series I attend or ask, I ask the people, what you are doing differently, what you have not done last century? And quite often, I don't get answer. Is the same people, same practice, same system, they are following what they were following in last century? Not all, but majority. So that if you look at the demography change, this century will be dictated by emergence of non-communicable diseases and aging. Aging will define the health sector response of 21st century. But are we really addressing that issue? Next. Next, please. So, 20th century versus 21st century. Before, people used to die earlier. And so they were not so much affected by the functional capacity reduction or functional, gradual functional decline or disability. But this century is, is different. People, irrespective of their health condition, they are living longer. And once you live longer, this gradual functional decline is inevitable. Whatever we do, we can play with the pace or the degree, but as we age, the gradual functional decline is inevitable. And we have to accept this. And the most interesting part is that when it declines happen, it doesn't happen in the single functional domain, where most disability is mostly single domain issue. But as we grow older, it happens, it affects different functional domains. Common as you've seen in some of this, starts with the vision, go with the mobility, then memory. So it's like that. So this 60 plus issue is quite different than the intervention what we have done in last century. Next. So even besides this functional decline, we have seen this, there's a demographic change in terms of the family size. The slides on my left is my family 60 years ago. And the right is my sister and brother-in-law, these two people, nearly 70 staying alone in their own house. No support system, no social security. So the whole family from joint family to nuclear family, when we are growing up, we are very much carried away, small family, happy family. But now we are paying the price because many of us have become too small and there is no care system or support system. Next. So then again, as Dr. Day said, another speaker said, there's a digital de a demographic divide now, rural versus urban, working people more in cities and older people in rural areas. I know in some countries, even though some rural areas, people are not staying there. They're all going to the cities and city do not have the capacity. And health facilities more in cities than in rural areas. So these older people living in rural areas have very little choice. Next. So intersectionality, next. How disability, aging, longevity all are connected. So aging, disability and NCDs are strongly interlinked. As per the Lassie study of India done by Minister of Health, that 38 point, nearly 40% older people at least one disability as they're defined. 15.44% has two disabilities, 5.88 have three disabilities. 
and 43% of older people above 60 years of age use at least one assistive product. The ladies are in this one as a hemiplegia and one was had polio, became old, further frailing. So the conditions in terms of their support care system, these two ladies staying together, who will help whom? This is what the question I we need to ask. Next. So aging and disability are very interlinked and every house will be having some older person or some person with disability in very near future, if not now. Next. Now aging and disability is also, I mean, especially in India, can you go to the previous slide here? In the, there are a lot of programs, but all these programs work in isolation. And there's a big gap between the healthcare providers and the social care providers. So they often give this kind of products through camps and all, but is that really useful? Is that the best way of doing this? Are we not taking older people granted? So these are the issues I think we need to ask and why we cannot give the similar products throughout the year through a PHC or health wellness centers. Next. So I talk quite often about assistive care. Next, please. Why assistive care is more needed now? Because life expectancy since birth in India in 1970 was nearly 50. And 1978 Alma Ata clearly defined healthcare should be preventive, promotive, curative, and rehabilitative. It stands good in that time. In 21st century, some people have added palliative, but people are not realizing nobody will go straight from the curative to palliative or rehabilitative to palliative straight away. There will be 20, 30 years, the people with functional decline or reduced functional capacity whom we need to support to process the transition and see that they are less disabled or less excluded as possible. So this is where I come, the 21st century healthcare should be preventive, promotive, curative, rehabilitative, assistive, and palliative. Without assistive part, the others will not be that useful. Next. So how we define assistive care? Assistive care, we define as a human, and technology. It should not be either or, both has to work together. The care which assists in a person to maintain or improve functional capacity, prevents falls and injuries or secondary health conditions, preserve independence and dignity, and assist to do what she or he wants, wishes to do. This is how we define. And if you look at these slides, you will see everywhere there's a human being, human support, and technology support. And this has to go hand in hand. Next. So assistive care, again, not a medical model, not a geriatric care, not a long-term care either, but a total solution where the medical, social, technological has to work together in partnership with the older people and their families. No isolation, no loneliness, and enjoying the life until it is possible at the last breath. So family, especially in the global south, we have a unique structure of the family and the neighbors. And we know very well, there will never be enough professionals who would be able to carry, take care of the older people, especially in our countries. So we have to really see families and the neighbors and others as a resource, as a semi-professional to take care of the older people. And if they can't do anything, at least they can assist in overcoming loneliness. I know in many countries, including India, people are dying, older people are dying because of loneliness. There's no problem of the technology, no problem of healthcare, no problem of money but they have nobody to talk. 
So this is the what development, what we are embracing blindly without realizing, can we support? This is what we want. So that's the time, I think, time has come to think about. Next. Assistive technology, why assistive technology is so important? Next, please. So when you talk about assistive technology, you talk about everybody. It's a matter of today or tomorrow. I know many of us, many of my friends, they start with glasses and gradually goes one after other. I said 21st century's new medicine is assistive products because every 10 years, like after 50, you take one extra pill, you have to take one extra device. And 80% people, in Nordic countries, I know they have more than two devices and 90% have more than three devices when they become 90 plus. Next. So more age, more assistive products. As we age more gradually, there will need more products. This is my friend's dad who uses nine assistive products, but that keeps him productive, active, independent, and he enjoys life. So where are we next? Now WHO recent global report, you have, if you have seen, they have 2.5 billion people with, with required assistive products, including glasses now, and 3.5 billion in by 2015. We also have seen two out of every three people, age 60 years and older need at least one assistive product but still in most countries, they don't have it. Next. AT demography, if you, for example, where we have a very good data, Norway, the nearly 75% AT users are 60 plus. They're not classified whether they're visible or non-visible. They are need of assistive products and anybody above 60, 75% population of the whole service provision are the older people. Next. But there's a huge gap between global north and global south. With global north, they have to depend on technology and that gives them freedom and really works well. But in global south, still we are lacking and maybe hardly 10% people have access to such products. Even if you have these products, you don't have the environment, you don't have the education, you don't have the support mechanism. So all this creates more problem for the global south than the global north. Next. Next. Can we go next? It, show, it shows the data that in WHO you have published the assistive products list and it shows age-wise what products and how much is needed I hope in India there will be better studies in future with the older people because we in the globally we have data and that can be then compared and analyzed. Next. So this is our dream and this is what I'm also trying to work with the government of India and all. How we can make AT inclusive universal health coverage, how we can ensure the basic simple assistive products can be provided through health and wellness centers, through the primary healthcare centers and all this. I remember 20 years ago, I designed a age-friendly primary healthcare center with Alex Kalashe in WHO, but I am yet to see one age-friendly primary healthcare. So we have still a lot to go. This whole healthcare system is still model of 20th century's need and realities not very 21st century. So we have to, this is the model in Norway they extensively use, that simple products can be provided by the simpler level of professionals, but the complex and higher level products should be provided by the high level professionals. Next, please. Next. So WHO has developed this training package to train the local health workers, nurses, whoever in the community to provide these simple assistive products. Because unless and until we expand our workforce, we'll never be able to give the service to the majority. So if anybody is interested, please look at the tab in WHO website. Next. 
next next and accessibility i am happy that i am happy that uh, there's an enabling environment you are talking next so without enabling environment without accessibility this assistive products is going to fail in the slides you know when i go to any shop in the west general stores i see the aging section is expanding gradually and this slide the slide in the photo in the between this is a very personal story my dad died because of that stool and the toilet he banged his head against the tap and he at later he died but the bathrooms of india especially this part of the world the shiny my tiles or marbles no they are actually death trap we don't make our environment age friendly i am yet to see any publics or any place a toilet with a simple grab bar so the fall and the hip fracture is very common in the older people because the our environment is not ready our buildings are not ready i know many people live in isolation because they don't have the lift or the escalators to go down from where they live next so think about environment especially environmental self care is a time for age friendly inclusive environment an environment where everyone can live safely independently easily we know in the east london they are modifying the whole east london area to make it age friendly and that's making the even the prices of the property up instead of down because more older people and more family with older people are buying those property so the whole change has been seen across the east london whoever is is visiting or recently visited in that part next last my summary next sorry two minutes more next please so aging disability in summary aging disability ncds mental health all are interlinked emerging de demography will redefine that definition of disability in very near future longevity and disability all are two sides of the same coin dr day said before so i have not heard him i completely believe that the two sides of the same coin urgent need of assistive care we need 21st century health and social care delivery model more age more assistive products and i again say i was very impressed with the speakers from australia go local provision of essential basic assistive products should be through health and wellness centers closer to the community we cannot ignore the need of age friendly environment anymore silver economy i know in jenny in zurich that changing the whole hotels infrastructure to make it age friendly so they have a better more customers next any product or facilities are good for older or disabled people are good for everybody so it's about all of us and whatever we do in this field everybody will benefit thank you very much uh, thank you dr chapul kasnavis um uh, we have come to the closure of the formal presentations uh, i request the audience to pose their question by raising the uh, raising the hand or write the question in the chat box below so that you can read it out uh, that's how that's how dr anupama wants it to proceed so before we get the questions um, we'll start some interesting talks about what people thought about it um you know this uh, last topic of uh, assistive device the simplest assistive device um, for maybe 100 years hundreds of years is the spectacle which is even very difficult to get getting a spectacle prescribed in remote areas is a problem so there was um, there is a initiative by a non profit organization to train um graduate 12th class pass 
um, rural workforce in doing orthotic orthoptics training so that they can examine and prescribe uh, spectacles to older people and this has become very popular and government of india accepted its value and this goes in a uh, non profit mode the work still continues as now i work in a um, in association with the eye hospital i found that it's quite interesting to learn that uh, when getting a spectacle is sometimes very difficult uh, dr mathur talked about various issues that we looked about we encounter in old age care um, from availability to accessibility and how people uh, with various disability and non communicable diseases uh, access the health system where there is a kind of a compartmentalization that the physician would like to look at the hypertension diabetes part of it and the disability part is somebody else's problem this is our basic uh, internal medicine or medical uh, training model where managing pain or disability is not my problem this is somebody else's problem but it so happens that uh, in a healthcare setup there may be only one or two physician um, or one or two medical uh, healthcare worker who have to manage both pain disability blood pressure diabetes maternal child health etc so uh, it's important that uh, disability is uh, put in our curriculum of all medical and paramedical health professionals in a in the right perspective so that people take it as an area or a challenge that must be intervened um we haven't had any questions yet not yet um, can i ask one question yeah please so i thought i'll ask uh, the panels to start with and then probably other uh, um, participants will get interested yeah go ahead so my question is to uh, dr kasnabis uh, you very rightly pointed out that accessibility and affordability issues uh, prevent people from using uh, assistive devices. But uh, do you think there is a stigma associated with use of assistive devices uh, and whether that prevents people from using assistive devices? They may have uh, money to buy or they have access, but uh, what, what do you say about it? You are very right. Stigma is there. Okay, many people we know very well, they would benefit a lot tremendously using assistive products, but they don't use it because they don't want to see themselves as disabled. So that is one, your part, you are right. But there is also another issue I have seen because of the cost factor. Even my mother, I know, I knew that she cannot hear well. I was trying to give her a hearing aid. She said, no, at my, at my age, I don't, you do not expect my hearing capacity is like yours. Besides, she was thinking that I'll spend extra lot of money for her hearing care. So there are bit complex issues. And that is why I said, no, we have to look more beyond medical model or medical geriatric care. So that social part, family part, all we need to cons consider before we come with a, any clear-cut prescription. Uh, I have a comment to make on this issue, Dr. Bhatnagar. We found that um, older people who have been provided with walking sticks by the family, they don't use it. I don't know why. And I know I'm not that old to use the walking stick. Or the hearing aid uh, that Dr. Chappal uh, alluded to, you know, the hearing aids are considered as something exposing your disability. While a spectacles is quite a intellectual thing, uh, a hearing aid or a walking stick is not. But many years back, we did some research trying to ask people what, which disability made their life more miserable. We provided four options, uh, vision, hearing, locomotion, and uh, chewing. The response was vision is the highest priority, then comes walking, then comes chewing, and last is hearing. So that's why probably uh, people do not understand the importance of uh, rehabilitation of hearing deficit 
but with new uh, reports coming in from Lancet Commission that deafness age or hearing deficit is a major risk factor for dementia in old age. So we need to probably change our concept. There are three questions. I'll read them. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah. Sir, we can allow Satyavan Mishra to ask his question if he wants to. Now we have uh, Yatendra Kumar. Yes, sir. We'll take Amit Yatendra. Sir, Yatendra, we'll take Yatendra after this. Yeah. Yatendra, you want to ask the question or I'll read it? Yatendra can read his question now, sir. Satyavan. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Satyavan Mishra. Yes, sir. I am a yes, Satyavan, go ahead, please. Yes, sir. Thank you for giving me a, an opportunity to raise my point of discussion. Uh, Chapel sir is, is my teacher at NIS Calcutta. And uh, a lot of new things we, we have learned during his uh, during my studentship. And still we are learning a, a lot of good good and new dimensions. As yes, sir, you have uh, changed, you have presented in every slide that the coming scenario of the coming century the whatever we have learned, whatever we have discussed in earlier century, that Speed is down. not going to exist. In that, in that change scenario, what is the role of rehabilitation professions in every aspect? Whether they are disabled, whether they are not disabled, because uh, I was listening to the chair, pain is managed by four professionals in a private medical college or a general setup where all the medicine professions are there. Anesthesia specialist says pain is my specialization. Neurosurgeon says pain is my specialization. Rehabilitation professional like PMR says pain is my specialization. In that scene, orthopedic surgeon also feels neglected that it is our part and parcel. Then what will a rehabilitation professional will do whether they have to coordinate with all of these professionals whose egos are very high or end game and is the community. We have to provide our services to the community for the betterment of the community. But nobody thinks on that line. Everybody, everybody is enclosing that. This is my area. This is your area. Don't include, don't input, don't enclose, don't enclose our area. In that Thank scenario, you, that, Dr. Chappal, please respond to this very, very long continued uh, dilemma in medical science as to whose area is which one. Yeah, but uh, Dr. Day and all, you all know very well. I think we have deviated from public health to medical health. And in sometimes even I used to say WHO should rename is a WMO, so the World Medical Organization. So we have medicalized the health and over medicalized in some extent. And whatever you are talking is because of that. So if we again demystify it and make it simple, make it more for make it from more from people's perspective, not the professional's perspective, then we can find the answer. But if we come from the professional side, we'll never find the answer. What you have said, we know this, this is a common th thing, but this is where again, in our, any country medical field is more developed than any other field. So we request the medical fraternity to take the lead to demystify some of this and really make sure that we focusing on public health, people's health, not the professional self. Dr. Mathur, your decades of experience in community, will you like to make a comment on this aspect? Oh, Whose I territory think, is this? I think the onus lies on the healthcare professionals to include and to be inclusive of um, uh, and try to involve all the persons involved in the management of the patient. So we need not create a, a scene where we just say that only we can do it or so. Here we have to have an, a, 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 a teamwork with all the specialties or so. And that has to be highlighted to the public also, to the our client also. We have to tell them that it is not only the medical thing which is to be done. There are other things which could be done. So responsibility the major responsibility is with the healthcare professionals to, as has been mentioned by Dr. Chappell, to demystify the, our area, basically. Where we suddenly create a scene that, okay, in the hospital setting, we are going to do something miraculous, and which cannot be done anywhere else or so. And so 
involving the community, involving the persons. And that's what has been uh, highlighted now when we talk of person-centered care or so, where we say that uh, we have to have involvement there of the person and their family in decision making and by giving them total information about the thing and then and then we have to um, manage these patients so i think a lot has to be done at the level of the healthcare professionals first uh, thank you dr mathur uh, just for the uninitiated person centered care is a new concept uh, of who it's not actually a new concept but it's a focused concept at this point of time looking at uh, every older person as a special entity who has got or who has got different kind of requirement and this health system has to provide uh, the required support at every stage. Yatandra Kumar had a question or rather a comment. Uh, government uh, engagement, encouragement of like subsidized credit to startup company in initiating work in geriatric waste ops, etc. Uh, let me give you the information that Ministry of Social Justice has a program on this uh, where the funds come from uh, Senior Citizen Welfare Fund, which is a huge fund. So every year there is a call for proposal and then you can uh, submit your uh, proposal for financial assistance uh, up to 1 crore rupees or uh, 10 million rupees is provided by Government of India with assistance from uh, in, with assistance in marketing, etc. And there are a few more Government of India organizations, for example, Department of Science and Technology, Department of Biotechnology. They also help, uh, especially Department of Biotechnology, help uh, developing startup companies in the areas of disability. You have to look at BIRAC website, B-I-R-A-C BIRAC website for um, getting more information on this. Then we have a long question of the comment from an anonymous attendee. Uh, I'll try to read it quickly. Uh, as civil society organization, the scope of work in isolation for such large population is limited. We agree. What possible areas do you see that needs robust engaging of civil, civil society organization with the government and with current national... Just a minute. With current uh, national program for healthcare of the elderly... Uh, specifically for emerging technology that help functionality because what we see in india is uh, is even adding prosthetics are highly expensive and available mostly in urban areas your statements are uh, perfect what you have talked about availability and cost everybody knows that uh, because uh, the production is limited the market is limited so whatever the companies produce because there are not many takers in terms of uh, proper marketing, the cost remains high. And your question on NPSCE and civil society. Uh, NPSC is a, uh, unfortunately, a very medical program, but it provides funding uh, for assistive devices at all levels, starting from primary health care center to the tertiary care, that is medical colleges, regional geriatric center, every level, there are provision for providing uh, assistive devices to older people who need them after proper assessment and, um, and prescription. Uh, I think I have answered your questions. We have a question from Ajay. Ajay, you want to ask this question or I'll read it? Ajay, will you ask this question or I'll read it? Okay, let me read it. Uh, can we also focus on forming a guideline for regular exercise programs for elderly to improve uh, their issue of healthcare, bone, muscle joint, cardiovascular to prevent disability and improving their functional ability? Uh, Government of India National Program for Healthcare for Elderly had published a uh, good uh, volume. I think Anupama should uh, make it. Uh, visible in their website so that people can get it. You, I think you have seen this brochure. It's a good booklet uh, in which all aspects of healthy aging has been uh, demonstrated, including um, programs for exercise and uh, healthcare, etc., healthy aging. Then uh, we have, uh, then somebody has thanked me. Okay, welcome. 
Uh, Rajesh Kumar says, uh, Rajesh Kumar, you want to ask the question or I will read it? You have got enough time if you want to ask it. No problem. So we'll, we'll unmute Rajesh and he can ask his question. Hello. Rajesh, please ask the question. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, uh, everyone, for, you know, for having you know wonderful presentation today so i am uh, dr rajesh working with help page and uh, looking after a machal and ladakh i am calling from shimla actually so uh, i have been uh, this organization for last i think 18 19 years and working in ask sector for many years actually a country like india you know where we have elderly populations around more than 14 crore and uh, the problem of elderly because you know, more than 80% elderly still they are living in the rural areas, country like India. So we have different problems, both urban and rural elders. So what I feel is, you know, uh, outreach to our, you know, elders in the rural area, it is very difficult still, country like India. So what I feel is we need to focus more on, you know, long-term care programs in country, in our country where it should be, you know, emphasized and focus more on policy level. We have to work with the government to frame the policy as far as long-term care, care programs is concerned for the elderly care program in India, actually. So I think, you know, we need to focus more on LTCs in our country. Actually. Yeah. Uh, for those who do not know the work done by Rajesh Kumar and his group in Simla, uh, they have done exemplary work in Simla by pro providing some very good model of long-term care and uh, have been very... Um, interestedly followed their work and uh, good model and that needs to be uh, that model needs to be replicated in other places by help page and other civil society organizations who look at uh, long-term care uh, as an important component of old age care uh, frida wants to should we uh, yes, so yes so frida is unmuted she can uh, speak frida, you can ask your question Frida? Hello, sir. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Frida. Please go ahead. Uh, th thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, actually, I'm doing my research in environmental research in, among the Himalayan regions in Sikkim. And um, as I have been doing my research for the past um, a few years, uh, I've observed that elderly in this population has difficulty in accessing even in the basic health care. Forget about other uh, assistive aids, about other, uh, you know, programs, but the basic healthcare, like, for example, even to go for uh, doing a regular checkup of just checking the blood pressure or sugar becomes a problem because uh, the, the terrain here is quite I mean, completely different from other parts of India. So uh, we, uh, during my survey, I found out, as I had done a survey under Indian Council, of medical research where we have evaluated uh, elderly uh, on functional impairments and we found out that elderly uh, some of the uh, in some of the villages the elderly even pay money to carry them all the way up the, to the healthcare center so that you know they can do their basic health checkup so this is a one of the most important and alarming group that i found here in Sikkim in most of the elderly especially in rural areas because 70% of the elderly here live in rural areas. And uh, as the younger generations, like we all know, migrate to town for their, uh, you know, daily life uh, jobs. So that's the reason why cost factor is such an issue, especially in rural areas of this Himalayan region, even for basic health checkup. So I was wondering if any uh, strict guidelines or basic, uh, you know, guidelines to uh, improvise this healthcare system so that we could reach these elderly could be uh, done by the government of India. Thank you. Uh, actually, this is a very important issue of um, accessibility. Uh, we sitting in Delhi, I sitting in Delhi cannot really understand what's the meaning of accessibility or trying to reach a healthcare system for even smaller, I mean, major illnesses as well as smaller illnesses. I'll give an example. One of my residents in geriatric medicine, she is a senior resident now, Monika Sarma from Himachal. She told me that I have to, when she, after passing out, she came to see me. She told I have to walk six hours, climb mountain to reach my home. 
if i want to go to my original home and in my village so this is i told do people really climb he told yes this is a very common thing for us that people who live in higher um, ranges they have to climb that much of distance to reach there and uh, this is true for the whole of northeast the, all the himalayan states and the central india where accessibility to health care is uh, very limited because of the distance and the terrain that the people have to cover um the current uh, government policy of having large number of health and wellness centers for every 100 every 100000 population throughout the country is on and uh, this is one of the um, aggressive programs of health ministry to start all of them about 150000 of them but you know it takes time to develop a proper kind of a system uh, you know four years now a uh, three years now these things are going on and we hope sooner or later people in uh, inaccessible areas will also have access to healthcare that is required for them um can i add to dr that? bharti nagarkar before you make your comment i have a comment to make on your presentation okay. um you are doing a great work but probably you have to look at uh, the person centered care icop uh, model uh, which dr mathur uh, re- referred to and he has been working uh, he is um, he is working on that in community level not in a primary health care but it is in, it's a community level of work maybe in your research you have to include uh, icop and person centered care uh, that will be of great value yes. now tell me what you want to say So, Dr. Chapal Khasnabi has left. Uh, we thank him for uh, attending the program. Thanks. No, Dr. just Nagar, comment please. on uh, Dr. Uh, please go ahead. Professor Nagar sir. Anupam, I think you have lost her. I think I'll I'll just speak to her on the phone, sir. Uh, okay. Um, and sir, so, uh, Gordon, any comment on the questions that you have addressed, Dr. Sue Gordon, please. Um, thank you, um, Dr. Day, for the opportunity to comment. I think what's really interesting for me are the the common things um that we are all tackling um you know the fragmentation the accessibility to services i think the ageism is such a massive problem here too um and um and so and of course there'll be cultural differences in the way that we address them but i think there's there's the opportunity to really think about what we can learn from each other um as as we do tackle these problems um each of our governments you know the policies that are in place the f- funding models um have such um powerful outcomes but can have unintended consequences as well and i and i see that and and hear that too for all of you so th- thank you very much for for allowing me to participate and hear you know what is happening in india thank you uh dr also, Gordon, dr. one uh, one comment from my side about the uh, inaccessibility in australia uh, the distance between perth and adelaide is 3000 miles or kilometers whatever it is and the people who live in between to go to a tertiary care center it's always a problem so we are working with one of those uh, groups in um i think uh, sydney who are kind of providing um, telemedicine care to older people uh, because visiting such distances to reach one patient for the healthcare system is very difficult some comment on that it's a technology issue yeah for sure we've got lots of telehealth happening um and and everything from the delivery of cancer care and chemotherapy to backup for registered nurses who are employed in aged care facilities so um at, and we are trying to expand it I, th- i think too there are particular apps that have been developed around um wound care for ulcers and um you know all sorts of of things that are being developed but you know we are battling with not just not having enough people 
and enough registered nurses. We've got a GP shortage. We've got, you know, personal care worker shortages. And so um, I think it's great that telehealth um, is, is being used. And if COVID did anything good in Australia, it was to actually accelerate that uptake of telehealth and telemedicine, which has actually been, um, been great because we'd been kind of floundering with it, if I'm honest, uh, for quite some time. Uh, so yeah, so that is all happening. Um, we have got, um, I think we haven't funded an awful lot of telehealth projects with our grant funding, but we have funded some assistive technology ones for sure. And certainly some other ones, um, around, uh, even a virtual reality for degreasing um, uh, challenging behaviours in people with dementia. Um, there's uh, uh, there's just a whole there's just a whole lot there. Uh, sound scouts um, that's one that we're looking at around hearing. Um, an oral health one, which is actually um, a group that have developed an app that can actually do an oral health assessment from a distance using um, a telehealth approach. So we're trialling that one. So so it's it's quite diverse in terms of the application of the telehealth um, and the expansion of it, um, you know, that we're seeing. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Raj, you want to make some comment on the topics that you have discussed till now? Dr. Raj? Anupama, is she there? No, sir, she has left. Uh, and Aarti is having some yeah. technical trouble, so she is trying to reconnect. But in the meantime, we have a poll question that we can uh, use for the time. And uh, requesting all participants not to choose the last option, please, just for the uh, just for us to know the real uh, issue. Please don't check all of, all the above. Thank you. I'll just put it on the screen. Your guideline did not work, Anupama. <laughs> <laughs> That's it's because a, all of them are so important, it is not going to work. But I, as, um, as a physician, thought access to affordable healthcare is, um, is probably the will be yeah. my choice. But all but, of them uh, but, sir, uh, but sir, look at the uh, one that got no option at all. Opportunities for employment. It's like uh, somebody didn't think that to be the... Most now, important priority. Disability should be employed is from the list of importance to this audience. Yes. Uh, but, uh, but thank you so much for any, responding. Any, I'm just closing the poll. Sir. We have about 10, 10 minutes of time left, so we can have some more interesting comments and questions. Uh, there is one comment has come. I'll respond to that, and then Dr. Mathur will give some comments. How can uh, Ajay wants to know how can you how can help elderly in India having low digital literacy? You know, this is a very um, social question. Uh, people even educated, earning, using computers, etc., are very scared to use um, digital payment because they are scared that somebody can enter into their bank account and rub them off. So this this is not, not only part of digital literacy, literacy, low digital literacy, only part of the problem, but faith in the system is another part. Now I see Professor Nagarkar is back. Please, before do you lose, before we lose you again, please go ahead and make your comments. And no, my comment was I think Professor uh, Sue Gordon has already talked about it. Telehealth. Frida was talking about inaccessibility because of geographical terrain. So our health and wellness centers can have a facility of telehealth, and of course, use of AI-based technology 
if we can take it over there that will probably uh, resolve some of the issues uh, that are faced by people in sikkim and uh, the uh, mountaineering uh, mountainous region that was my comment uh, satyavan you have asked how to achieve our desired goal to empower every citizen by using technological advances in the rural setup in our country probably help is not a um, kind of organization who can answer this question we have one question from jnk javed uh, will you ask this question or i'll read it javed so let me read it sir he'll be he's he's on sir yeah, javed sir. javed uh, thank you for giving me the time i i had listened to a lot of input uh, and i am very satisfied that at least voice is somewhere for the elderly who are mostly facing the different types of disabilities i am also a person with disability running a school for children with disabilities but i have seen lot of uh, persons who are in elderly ages and need psych psychosocial support need psychiatry support but they don't have the families the either families have dropped them somewhere but we don't have the support system available where to approach how they can be uh, given some kind of sigh of relief uh, at a time when they need the family support yeah we agree with you it's a major requirement in which uh, fortunately help as india is doing a lot of work on this area by providing support during the covid time help as ran a major program in providing food and assistance to people um, older people who are locked out locked down and then had no access to services dr mathur some of your uh, i think um, the uh, participation of civil societies is very important for all these activities help as is taking lead in that and the all community organizations they should get together and have a networking so that uh, some way of connecting with the older people in community could be achieved properly that is one important thing because developing facilities in institution is important the other thing is about the take up of assistive devices by our older people properly we underestimate their digital literacy because what i found that many of the older people are very keen to learn and adapt the digital tools and try and use them also so i think uh, probably uh, this particular part of uh, using technology for older people is possible in our setup and with a very good uh, network uh, of uh, internet available all throughout the country that is a big asset for our country that if a cheap and easily available network internet network is there which makes things easy for executing these programs thank you i agree with dr mathur on this issue uh, on a lighter vein we had um, i had a patient last week who was 84 year old and the doctor had a complaint that the father doesn't sleep because throughout night he is watching youtube and sending whatsapp messages so you know this uh, this uh, generalization is probably not correct that older people are not uh, digitally uh, literate or interested uh, this is one area where they are the kind of unseen majority so who are never seen uh, dr gordon you have raised your hand just just wanted to make a quick comment that what we found with um telehealth persona it, it it came through in somebody's presentation today about the medicalization of aging and we're talking now about the nurseification of aging as well and the um aging is a normal process and sure we build up you know morbidities and so forth but what we've found is that having the telehealth in the library or in the community center rather than in a medical rooms is actually increasing access making people feel more comfortable to actually go and use it you know with somebody to support them of course the other thing we've found around digital literacy is that quite a lot of the staff that are providing care are not that digitally literate it's not all about the older person um it's it's actually that some of the staff um and then the fact that they just don't have the systems and support in the organizations they work for 
to actually enable that digital literacy. So there's some of the the things that we're you know having to deal with as well. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question for a very long distance. Glenville, you want to ask the question or I should I read it? Glenville from West Indies. Saint Kitts and Nevis. Glenville, please go ahead. Okay, good morning. So, so he's on us. Uh, Glenville, yeah. you can speak. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah we can yeah, hear, we can you. hear you. Yeah, so Thanks my question is from such a distance. Yes, you're welcome. My pleasure. <laughs> and thanks for hosting this. In the lockdown late, I've been following the chat. Yeah. Um, a lot of persons, especially those with disabilities, they have lost faith in the healthcare system and they try remedies to their own detriment. So how do we, as healthcare practitioners, help them to restore trust in us that they will come to us early instead of coming too late when things are beyond repair, beyond remedies. That's a problem I, I, I find as a medical practitioner here on a small Kevin island that people will try all kinds of herbs and bushes and unresearched remedies as the first line of approach to a problem. And then when, they, when it doesn't work, then they come back to us you know, in, in a crisis situation. So we want to avoid those you know, end stage scenarios and help people more early with evidence-based practices. So that's my question for you. Yeah, uh, thank you. I think uh, the problem that you face, all of us face the same problem. Um, sometimes older people or people with disability may not think that something can be done about it or may think it too late. Uh, probably say societal response has to come and then encouraging people to seek help with disability very early in the disease or very early with the impairment probably help. And uh, this is a global problem because uh, somehow the response of the disabled person for help is not really, not always universal. People respond very differently. Uh, we have a, I think Pratip Chakravarti, CEO Help Page India should make some comment. He has been patiently listening to all our um, talk. Pratip, we are meeting for the first time. Just yeah, yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks for giving us your perspectives, uh, Dr. Dave. You want to uh, say you, you had a question? No, I want you to ask a question or make some comment. No, no, I'm just absorbing. I just joined as the CEO and I'm just absorbing the kind of diverse uh, Indian as well as global perspectives on the world. I've been exposed to the area of uh, disability, of course, for the last seven, eight years. But of course, I'm trying to find out the intersectionality between aging, longevity and uh, and disability and the kind of services that how it manifests itself in maybe, for example, in a community based system versus an institutional um, system. And that is something that has uh, intrigued me, especially with uh, like a, a fraction of organizations who go with the institutional system versus a fraction of NGOs who talk about a community-based approach to the whole community-based approach to the whole pro uh, pro problem. So if you would uh, try to, and especially since you're a doctor, um, you have seen the immunization program and the all other uh, community as well as hospital-based programs, you could throw some light on it, doctor, with respect to um, how as an organization, as HelpAge India, we can bring a balance in, in the kind of HelpAge India programming that we do with respect to cat tract or with respect to age care or with respect to elderly focused livelihoods. How can or what kind of perspectives can we have with respect to having uh, a balance between the institutional as well as the community system of providing services? Um, Mr. Chakravarti, I'll respond to that soon. But before that, uh, there's the last one or two minutes left. I'll go around uh, with everybody. Uh, Dr. Arvind Mathur, any last comment? Yeah, I think uh, the point which uh, Pratib raised, uh, linking the healthcare institution with the community needs some initiative probably at the level of civil society also, because the healthcare institutions are not reaching out or probably they're not geared with that mindset. So there is some way has to be created by which we link community with the institution 
and that part can be initiated on the part of civil societies and probably when we will extend our hand the institutions would also come forward that's what i feel dr gordon any last comment i just like to support what dr natha just said because that's what we are saying is this great need to have a better connection between the communities the social care and the the more formal health and age care systems that we've got we've kind of siloed them and i think you, you you can't really do it properly if you don't have everybody on board and working together so and, and it is a i think it's a challenge um particularly when you've got different models of funding and service delivery so yeah absolutely agree thank you dr nagarkar any last comment uh, I, i do agree with dr Ma Arthur and uh, Dr. Gordon, that we have to have a connect between society and care, and I would also emphasize on connecting health and social care together because individual is a whole. It's not only health or it's not only social. So uh, that is something which is lacking, and I think we can learn from Scandinavian uh, countries. Uh, i've been to some of them and i've seen how the welfare system works in a true welfare manner for elderly. Uh, Thank That's you. Um, Anupama, you want to say something or you will come last? <laughs> no, sir. I have to say nothing. Um, I think I have a comment, comment to make. So before the, before that, your you final come. comment, sir. Okay. Uh, you don't have to say anything. No, I just I will just say very big thank you to all of you. Okay, that you can do later. Uh, Pratib, actually, my guru, Dr. Kalyan Bakshi, used to tell me that every older person he was he died at the age of ninety four. That. three issues are important health financial security and social uh, emotional security they don't exist differently they have to be all together if you are you have got a lot of money but very bad health or you have got a lot of money very good health but you are living alone in a distant island probably life will not be as good so do dr chapal khasnabi talks about medical model of aging etc that is equally important that um, one has to be in good health or at least manageable health to enjoy the rest of the things and as my previous uh, panelists have noted that these um, uh, verticals don't exist after the age after a certain age especially in my age there are no verticals um, they are all mixed up together health social sec- economic uh, security financial security emotional support friendship network everything is now together unless i am in good health i can't talk to anybody and unless there somebody talks to me i don't feel good so the help is uh, all these years last nearly are going to get into 50 years probably soon you have been doing this um, in a very cohesive manner uh, that looking at every aspect of an older person from social support to livelihood healthcare many years back about two decades back we evaluated the functioning of um, mobile medical units mobile vans uh, and compared them with the primary healthcare centers through a who project and we found that people loved the mobile bed vans because they were available at their doorstep but they still longed for a well functioning primary healthcare which will be there all the time so probably the society and the government has to look at the value of non profit sector or so civil society and to what extent it can augment or supplement the work of the government but at the end of the day health and education are major responsibility of the state and they cannot just we sit away leaving it to uh, non profit organization or civil society organization but all of us have got some role to play under this guy so with this we come to end of this program i see there is probably a question i'll respond to that no not really um and uh, glenville has to make a comment with which you have all agreed that healthcare institution must also proactively reach out to community st- stakeholders to educate and empower them all of us agree with that uh, there are no verticals there are no silos we are all a part of the society where everybody has to help out um each other in a in a whichever way possible in this decade of healthy aging uh, of who and united nations 
probably that should be our focus the four points that who has even has raised nobody is left behind and we have to get rid of ageism person centered care and long term care four issues in which you have to work in which disability comes probably everywhere whether ageism or um, age friendly environment or person centered care everywhere disability comes in i thank helpage india prateep anupama and um, your boss rohit i don't see him today um, and also all the uh, stakeholders in helpage india and workers and amal who has been writing a lot of mails to us all the time and this two good sign language specialist who have been endlessly going on doing the work um i thank everybody and thank the participants for joining us thank you yes sir uh, and finally i'll request my colleague uh, pratip Ch chakravarti to thank the chair for the uh, excellent work that he has done thank you um, um thank you dr day for uh, for moderating the discussions um maybe moderating and putting sense to all the kind of diverse perspectives that have come from the other panel members and the speakers and also answering all the kind of questions that the participants have put in i suppose all the participants are extremely uh, experienced with regard to aging uh, with regard to longevity and disability and of course they have experience in uh, implementing programs with respect to sustainable development goals so dr day uh, dr arvind mathur <coughs> dr professor arti uh dr tasneem dr uh, she is not there i know dr sue and dr chapal uh, i think he is not here but i would like to thank you from the bottom of our heart at helpage <laughs> with respect to the glorious contributions you have done to this sector as well as to the diverse perspectives that you have brought in in participants minds thank you over to you anupam uh thanks pratip uh, i think we'll close the session now and we'll reassemble at 2 o'clock Uh, thank you panelists and thank you all the attendees for such uh, good questions and uh, active participation thank you for answering the polls very very sincerely is it okay dr mathur if i write to you uh, uh, anupama yes yes uh, is it possible to get emails of uh, yeah yeah sure i'll share that i'll share that yeah thank you so much okay bye bye yeah. bye bye
With tiny grains of hope and a lifetime of hard work, they built their homes. Only to lose it all in a moment of nature's furious rage. This was when the 2004 tsunami struck and swept away countless lives and hopes. Amrita Valli from Kadalore was one among them. For her, it was not just about the struggle of building life and livelihood all over again, but also about a sense of pain and overwhelming loss. Nature took away everything from Amrita Valli. For Chinnaponnu, her own children took away her sense of security, her family and home. 2,000 kilometers from Katlore in Tamil Nadu, Kishan Mehta lives in village Supol in Bihar. A bonded laborer all his life, Kishan Mehta lost his only hope, his son, in an accident. All he was left with was a small piece of farmland that wasn't enough to sustain him. India has a hundred million senior citizens today. Fifteen million live alone. Seventy-one million have to work to survive. Sidelined, often abused through neglect and isolation, these elders live lonely, impoverished and almost invisible lives. It is towards this vulnerable population that HelpAge India directs its resources. In order to provide them with income and a self-sufficient life, HelpAge organizes them into viable and sustainable Elder Self-Help Groups or ESHGs. The elders in the group pool their resources to support each other. Kishan Mehta is now a member of Kushwaha Elders Self-Help Group. Kishan Mehta is a very bad man. We will do all the work of the Masik Bachat. We will do it. But we will not do it. We will not do it. With the group, Kishan is not just living again, but redefining the meaning of living with dignity. We have to do all the work of the Masik Bachat. We have to do all the work of the Masik Bachat. We have to do all the work of the Masik Bachat. बहुत बीमारी डॉक्टरों खोल दर के समूह के द्वारा फ्री लाइच है। In Kadalor, the Tamarai Elders Self Help Group has enabled Amrita Valli to build a profitable dry fish vending business. तो कोई कस्टमर जी इप्पर हेल्प है जिंदिया उम्बो दर्श माँ आंधो उल्लू पुंड आउंगे इंगले हेड तो तत्तर तम्टे हेड तो लोन कुड़ते इप्पर नल्ला बालर चालन जर का the Elders for Elders Foundation and ESHG helped Chinnapunnu start a small fruits and nuts vending business. Evidently, groups of elders need special support to match the productivity of younger groups. Besides providing an extra push with funding and special training, HelpAge India facilitates their federation at the local and district levels. These ESHG members were trained in vermin composting by a local agriculture university and qualified to secure their initial funds from Grameen Bank. In addition, HelpAge India strives to spread awareness of various government entitlements and of the mechanisms of receiving these by the village elderly.
खुशियाली यहाँ पर समूह के माध्यम से खुशियाली बहुत तरह से है व्यवसाय कर रहा है जैसे कपड़ा सिलाई कर रहा है दो ठो पंप सेट समूह के माध्यम से दिए हैं पांच ठो सिलाई मशीन दिए हैं Members of this ESHG in Janjarpur, Bihar, went all the way to the collector of their area to lease a pond. With it, they have now developed an integrated and sustainable fish farming system. So, today, I have taken a lot of money for ten thousand rupees income. The elders here are singing a whole new song in a chorus of hope. Help Age India is currently working closely with more than 5,394 rural elder self-help groups in different states, and these numbers are constantly on the rise. They now know that together. They will not just survive, but would emerge as winners. Enlightened donors such as you can support more such groups and put this song of hope on the lips of countless needy elders. Everyone appreciates Krishna's melodious prayers, but not many know about the pain she hides behind them. She lost both her children early. In their old age, Krishna and her husband lost all support. The case of Kasturi is equally moving, being illiterate. Physically challenged and with several old age related ailments, 70 year old Kasturi became a sad story of neglect. Krishna, Kasturi and many others like them found the warmth of a home again at the Tamrai Kulam Elders Village or TEV, the first home for the aged constructed by HelpAge India. Viewers of NDTV donated generously for this home to become a reality. Situated at Kadalore, about 20 kilometers from Puducherry, the Tamarai Kulam Elders Village or TEV gives them a chance to live a life of dignity. The village is recognized as a model old age residential project by the government of Tamil Nadu. This is a free stay facility for the rural poor. And can accommodate a hundred residents. TV provides an end-to-end -end solution with multiple age-friendly facilities. The home is self-sufficient in terms of energy and food, and has adequate medical facilities. The most unique aspect of the home. It encourages active aging to keep residents physically active and mentally alert, as well as financially secure through livelihood building schemes such as farming and making handicrafts. Some residents, such as Ram Das, even go out of the home to sell leafy vegetables. He also doubles up as a security guard at TV. Kira kira. Don't say one, don't say one. For the resident elders, this is home again. Naturally, they contribute to its upkeep. Krishna looks after the TEV storeroom. 
and maintains accounts for the home. Lakshmi, a victim of the 2004 tsunami, cooks in the TV kitchen. 77-year-old Vadivelu has partially lost his vision from tending to cows, watering the grass, caring for others. He is a busy man to say the least. But yes, not everyone can participate actively in the running of the home. As in the case of Kasturi, the TEV center is her only home and hope. The TEV presents an ideal home where the elderly don't just feel comfortable, they also feel useful. But the demand for such homes is far greater than their availability. India only has 1,200 plus old age homes for its millions of disadvantaged elders. We count on enlightened donors like you for your support to build many more TEVs across India so that no needy elder is without a shelter.
With tiny grains of hope and a lifetime of hard work, they built their homes. Only to lose it all in a moment of nature's furious rage. This was when the 2004 tsunami struck and swept away countless lives and hopes. Amrita Valli from Kadalor was one among them. For her, it was not just about the struggle of building life and livelihood all over again, but also about a sense of pain and overwhelming loss. Nature took away everything from Amrita Valli. For Chinnapunnu, her own children took away her sense of security, her family and home. 2,000 kilometers from Katlor in Tamil Nadu, Kishan Mehta lives in village Supol in Bihar. A bonded laborer all his life, Kishan Mehta lost his only hope, his son, in an accident. All he was left with was a small piece of farmland that wasn't enough to sustain him. India has a hundred million senior citizens today. Fifteen million live alone. Seventy-one million have to work to survive. Sidelined, often abused through neglect and isolation, these elders live lonely, impoverished and almost invisible lives. It is towards this vulnerable population that HelpAge India directs its resources. In order to provide them with income and a self-sufficient life, HelpAge organizes them into viable and sustainable Elder Self-Help Groups or ESHGs. The elders in the group pool their resources to support each other. Kishan Mehta is now a member of Kushwaha Elders Self-Help Group. Kishan Mehta is a very poor man. We are doing the work of the people who are doing it. But we will not do it as well. With the group, Kishan is not just living again, but redefining the meaning of living with dignity. For the people who are doing the work of the people, we are doing the work of the people. For the people who are doing the work of the people, we are doing the work of the people. The doctors have opened the work of the people, and we are doing the work of the people. In Kadalore, the Tamarai Elders Self-Help Group has enabled Amrita Valli to build a profitable dry fish vending business.
the Elders for Elders Foundation and ESAG helped Chinnapunnu start a small fruits and nuts vending business. Evidently, groups of elders need special support to match the productivity of younger groups. Besides providing an extra push with funding and special training, HelpAge India facilitates their federation at the local and district levels. These ESHG members were trained in vermin composting by a local agriculture university and qualified to secure their initial funds from Grameen Bank. In addition, HelpAge India strives to spread awareness of various government entitlements and of the mechanisms of receiving these by the village elderly. खुशियाली यहाँ पर समूह के माध्यम से खुशियाली बहुत तरह से है। व्यवसाय कर रहा है जैसे कपड़ा सिलाई कर रहा है, दो ठो पंप सेट समूह के माध्यम से दिए हैं, पांच ठो सिलाई मशीन दिए हैं। Members of this ESHG in Chhanjarpur, Bihar, went all the way to the collector of their area to lease a pond. With it. They have now developed an integrated and sustainable fish farming system. So, they have a poker, they have a lot of money for 10,000 income. They have a lot of money. The elders here are singing a whole new song in a chorus of hope. HelpAge India is currently working closely with more than 5,394 rural elder self-help groups in different states and these numbers are constantly on the rise. They now know that together they will not just survive but would emerge as winners. Enlightened donors such as you can support more such groups and put this song of hope on the lips of countless needy elders. Everyone appreciates Krishna's melodious prayers, but not many know about the pain she hides behind them. She lost both her children early. In their old age, Krishna and her husband lost all support. The case of Kasturi is equally moving. Being illiterate, physically challenged and with several old age related ailments, 70 year old Kasturi became a sad story of neglect. Krishna, Kasturi and many others like them found the warmth of a home again at the Tamrai Kulam Elders Village or TEV, the first home for the aged constructed by HelpAge India. Viewers of NDTV donated generously for this home to become a reality. Situated at Kadalore, about 20 kilometers from Puducherry, the Tamaraikulam Elders Village or TEV gives them a chance to live a life of dignity. Ah! 
The village is recognized as a model old age residential project by the government of Tamil Nadu. This is a free stay facility for the rural poor and can accommodate a hundred residents. TV provides an end-to-end -end solution with multiple age-friendly facilities. The home is self-sufficient in terms of energy and food and has adequate medical facilities. The most unique aspect of the home, it encourages active aging to keep residents physically active and mentally alert as well as financially secure through livelihood building schemes such as farming and making handicrafts. Some residents such as Ram Das even go out of the home to sell leafy vegetables. He also doubles up as a security guard at TEV. <laughs> For the resident elders, this is home again. ठीक है Good afternoon everyone. Can we do a tech check right now? Am I audible to everyone? Yes.
हेलो एम ए ऑडिबल इस योर ऑडिबल थैंक यू मैम थैंक यू professor uh, mathur am i audible to you uh, yes yes i can hear you okay thank you ma'am yeah uh mr napafat am i audible to you hi i'm on okay very nice can you hear me well yeah yeah i can hear you well thank yes you. Oh, thank, thank you, you. Good afternoon, Doctor Gangadharan. Am I audible to you? Yes, my dear friend, I'm Gangadharan. Are you able to hear me too? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Nice. Hello, everyone. Good to see you, Doctor Gangadhar. Nice seeing you. How are you all? Nice to see some of the people that I spoke in the last few days' time, except Meera. <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Hello, Deepa. Good. Hello, sir.
afternoon ladies and gentlemen we will be starting in another 5 minutes time we are waiting for some more people to join in Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm happy to uh, be back in this session. We had a very uh, fruitful first session of discussions on health and rehabilitation, and now we are back. And now we will talk about something that is uh, is if is if not more equally uh, relevant and equally important, which is enabling environment, and which actually. Uh, covers a gamut of issues that we have uh, not looked at very seriously uh, up till now because you know we thought that uh, human willpower will take us thus far we don't need to 
you know like make changes uh, to suit the uh, different needs of different segments of population but i think it's important for us to uh, look at creating an enabling environment not just in physical sense of the term but also the legal policy uh, perspectives and so many other aspects and uh, in this session we will be focusing on some of those and how to also ensure that uh, we have such an environment where whether you are elderly whether you are disabled whether you are from any um, other kind of um, challenge in life you can be uh, an equally contributing and independent member of society so uh, with this i'll welcome the chairperson uh, dr gangadharan who is a uh, for me he has been a mentor and a friend and a like i don't know what else to call him but he's like he's been there forever to help me and guide me throughout my journey as a professional in this um, aged care world uh, he actually founded the heritage foundation in 94 focusing on healthcare services he's a fellow of indian society for training and development and was its national president in 2012 and 13 he served the board of international federation on aging during 2004 to 2014 and was the global president for 2 years he also served the board of washington based global aging network uh, he was involved in the formation of npop 1999 so you can imagine his association with the cause this and also he was with the committee to review the uh, maintenance and welfare of parents and senior citizens act 2007 he was mem he is member of the core group on welfare of senior citizens for the decade till 2022 constituted by the nhrc he is currently the honorary professor center for aging madras school of social work a uh, very warm welcome to you dr gangadharan and over to you dr gangadharan so we can't hear you i think uh you tried one minute one yeah no sir yeah now i am i am now done open up yes, thank you your vision you are you are now you are now we can see you thank you so much and uh, that's wonderful uh, uh, anupama making a very brief introduction it's so important that people don't get bored with the introduction of person thanks for being uh, so nice and also nice to see you preparing this introduction in a small slide so people know exactly what the person is doing and also thank you for uh, you know choosing a wonderful subject that uh, we indulge this afternoon for about 3 hours of time and also sending a very nice background notes you're not only starting with also and more than that now we have got 10 people sitting in front of us to speak i think uh, i have uh, fortunately been able to talk to every one of them and uh, except of course meera Because it's a, some of uh, Mr. talking to her, but otherwise I've spoken to all the ten. So it also gave me an introduction to a lot of uh, know a lot of people. And uh, I do not want to get onto the subject per se because it's going to be important for uh, people who are prepared themselves to talk on the subject. And I understand some changes would be there in the order based on the request that we have received from people. And therefore, uh, kindly bear with me. So I promised all of you that it will be primarily going by what uh, original list was given. but there seems to be some request come to lpg india requesting us to change a bit i think uh, we would start with this and once again welcome and uh, not only the speakers a uh, resource person going to be here also people who are listening to this wonderful discussion and i'm not introducing this theme because it's been very well written by the lpg when they invited us to speak and let me see whether you know good in the concluding second i could make some comments on that with that i will come all of you to come and we will invite the first speaker originally was supposed to be uh, professor pinky mathu she may have to bear with us to give us space to professor sanjoy roy um, head of the department of social work delhi university who will be speaking on lifelong learning reskilling for continuing employment in organized sector now i'm not really talking about it because it is in front of you nice to know that he has been involved in advocating advocating for indigenous social work in india 
yeah, I had a very, very brief conversation with him, probably less than one minute. But you know, what I could understand from what she's presented is what a huge experience. And I'm very sure he's going to make next 12 to 13 minutes for us very interesting. With that, I invite Professor Sanjay Roy to take on. Just want to remind the speakers, it's going to be 12 minute speech. And the question and answers will be after all the speakers have completed the, the presentations. Do not want to take questions in between uh, to you know, dislocate the timing. And I'm sure everybody was come, some of two or three people wanted to go a little early. So therefore I would invite speakers to talk first, then go for question and answers. Just I invite Professor Sanjay Rai to take off. Okay, uh, I should, I am audible. Am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you uh, for calling, inviting me here. Actually, sorry, I have to leave early because I have a meeting, GB meeting in the college. So I have to leave uh, 2.45 around at leave. So thank you to uh, Helpage India giving me this opportunity to just speak on uh, something on uh, IEEE uh, learning and how this employability in, uh, uh, may be. So uh, respected, is not a dais but respected uh, renowned panelist, Professor Pinky Mathur, uh, what I can see, uh, Professor uh, Gangadharan, uh, Ms. Mira, Madam, uh, Ms. Deepa, Rajkamal, Anupama, Madam, and others who is here. See, uh, it was told that, sir, speak on lifelong learning, reskilling, and continuing employment in our, our organized sector in India. Uh, this is uh, actually very interesting area where uh, uh, many of we don't speak at all. When you talk about the elderly or continuing education, learning, reskill, uh, all these things. So in my this 10-12 uh, uh, minutes, I'm going to talk about three aspects. One is lifelong learning, reskilling continuing employment first and then what are the steps skills you require how uh, what kind of uh, uh, issues uh, steps we require when you talk about the elderly in this area uh, so you know that lifelong learning basically it, it is involved pursuing education opportunities beyond formal schooling right uh, such as uh, we, we do attending workshop, taking online courses, participating in professional development program. But it is beyond that. Uh, throughout our lifelong learning, we can earn a skill from there. On the other hand, uh, reskilling, if we talk about, it is basically the process of acquiring new skill, new skill enhancing existing one to adopt to you know, changing job requirements in the market. So basically the reskilling, it enables individual, the person to remain employable and relevant in the job market. So this can involve learning new technologies, uh, you can improve new communication, leadership skills, or acquiring specific job requirement skills, what the market actually want. So that is very briefly talk about is reskilling. On the other hand, continuing employment, what does it mean? Basically, it means that ability to secure and maintaining employment in formal workplace. Uh, say, for example, company, uh, government organization or established industries. So this is very important because organized sector often provide better job opportunity, uh, benefits and opportunity for career growth. So by embracing lifelong learning, actively the person can have reskilling themselves and pursue their opportunities in organized sector. And also the individual in India can enhance their employability, keep up with industry demand and secure stable and rewarding career, whatever they want. So that is the important or uh, 
brief about the continuing employment. So friends, lifelong learning and reskilling, these are the essential for seeking continuous employment. This is interlinked in the organized sector. As industries we know, and technologies rapidly evolve and continuously is happening uh, day by day. Uh, so it, it becomes crucial for any individual who, who continuously update their skill and knowledge to remain competitive in the market. So therefore certain uh, key points uh, we must consider. Number one, embracing lifelong learning. What does it mean? It means in a rapid pace of technological advancement and changing this job requirement now we require. It's very much important uh, for a, a, a commitment, uh, what I can say, uh, ongoing learning. And adopting a mindset of continuous learning and personal development is very, very crucial to stay relevant uh, in, in, in this industry, whatever trends are there. Number two, identifying the skill gaps. Because this is important, you have to identify the skill and then you have to identify the gaps. Regularly, what you have to do? Regularly, you have to assess your skill. You have to identify the any gaps is the first step towards reskilling. So be proactive in organ recognizing areas where uh, the person can uh, need to acquire new competencies or update existing ones that already we have. Uh, match them in the demand uh, of, of the industry in the society what they want number thing uh, number three uh, should consider that researching industry and job trends what does it mean it means stay up to date with the advancement in your field of work because this will help the person to understand the skills that will be in the high demand in in maybe in the future so keeping an eye on the job market trends that will ensure you focus on acquiring the right skill to secure ongoing employment what is happening in the market number four identify your area of interest that is important because sometimes we don't know what is our interest interest may be huge but you have to specify because that determine which skills and fields you are passionate about and align them with the demand of the organized sector. So therefore, you need to have the interest and you have to identify those area of interest of yours. Number five, set a clear goal. Define your career aspirations and set an achievable goal because that will provide a direction that will give a motivation throughout the learning process. The whole process that will give a direction. Number six, seek formal education or training. So here you have to enroll in courses or certification that can equip you with the necessary knowledge and skill you need for the industrial uh, involvement. Look for recognized institution or online platform that, that can offer the uh, programs relevant to your desired field. So you have to, you know, very visible, you have to take those, those, those formal education and training. Number seven, utilize online resources. Now we say that elderly now, they are not technical, te technical uh, techno savvy, but now, you know, everybody is eager to learn. Even I know many people in, uh, elderly who are more equipped with uh, technology. So if you utilize online resources, take those advantage online learning platform resources so that you can expand your skill more, better. Uh, there are a lot of uh, websites we know that course era, uh, um, Udemy, or LinkedIn in learning offer wide range of courses. So that that part a yeah, person can uh, surely can expand themselves. Number eight, networking and mentorship. That is very important. Why? Because that connect with professionals working in the uh, you know industry where you are interested. So through networking events, online communities, or professional social media platform like LinkedIn and others. That can give a guidance, that can give an advice from a mentor who can provide valuable insight and support uh, your learning journey. 
so therefore it is very important for uh, mentorship or networking number nine uh, develop a soft skill uh, because this is now very important uh, NEP national education policy has given and under that we know that a lot of value addition courses, skill education enhancement courses are there. So therefore you have to develop soft skills also uh, like a technical skill because employers in the organized sector, they want this kind of soft value based skill like communication, teamwork, uh, problem solving skill. So that is important for uh, strengthening, you know, this, this, this uh, self reflection or self feedback you can have uh, through the soft spill, a skill. Number 10 could be utilizing learning opportunities. There are a lot of uh, opportunities are there in the market, in the online also. Take those advantage of various learning opportunities whatever available uh, uh, to you because this could include online course, workshop, webinar, industry conference or even mentorship program because this will uh, you know uh, seek out initiatives that align with, with the goal and provide opportunities to enhance the skill uh, throughout. Number 11 could be uh, building a professional network. This is very important industry also in social sector. Without network, uh, you know, person cannot go very, very high. So networking can be a, a, a instrumental in gaining insight into new opportunities for growth and learning. So connect with professionals in your industry, attend networking uh, events, what is happening, join relevant com uh, communities, association to expand horizon, your horizon your network area because that will give you uh, other experiences also. Number 12 could be seeking career guidance. Sometimes uh, though elderly they are very very uh, knowledgeable but somehow still they need career guidance when we talk about 21st century. So reach out those uh, uh, and to career counselor, to mentor who can provide better guidance, better reskilling strategies. So that, that could be another area. Uh, finally, what I feel that stay abreast of industry development. Whatever happening now in industry, whatever law is coming, new law in industry is coming. So stay updated, up to date uh, with the latest trend, latest advancement in your interest field, whatever you are interested in you could be uh, subscribe industry newsletter follow relevant blogs you know participate webinar conference so ultimately what i have to say is stay informed stay updated that will give you more skilling reskilling so friend lifelong learning and reskilling is very very essential for individual like elderly and others also to stay competitive in the ever evolving job market now so organized sector in India, you know, there are a lot of processes uh, for lifelong learning and reskilling. Uh, there could be steps, many steps you can follow, like uh, awareness. Individual must have uh, aware about the importance of lifelong learning and reskilling. Uh, number two could be skill assessment. Uh, it, Thorough assessment of individual existing skills and knowledge, I think is very, very crucial. Why? Because, because it helps to identify areas where this skilling is required. You ensure your learning process uh, more of aligned with your specific career goal. Third, maybe training and education. Once uh, the skill gaps are identified, as I discussed, so the person can enroll in training programs or pursue edu educational courses, acquire new skills, upgrade the existing one, uh, that could be a specialized way or, or whatever in generic way that could be. Number four, also again, workshop and seminar you participate or on, uh, on the job training continuously, uh, improve your skill, reskilling. So when you talk about the elderly person in India seeking to continue employment in, in, in uh, organized sector, through lifelong learning and uh, reskilling, what I feel there are several mechanisms available, uh, and, and that mechanism can help the person 
uh, and we have to explore that the elderly they can explore uh, that could be number one skill development programs the person can uh, identify the skill development program uh, like uh, look for government backed skill program government has a lot of skill development program nowadays right skill india we're talking about so these programs often uh, vocational training offer vocational training various sectors somehow industry also connected with those uh, skill based sector or program so ministry of skill development entrepreneurship in india uh, they are also offering various initiatives in this area. So that can be one area where uh, they can align with. Number two, uh, adult education center. Uh, they have to find out that adult education centers uh, in India now is coming out uh, more in an enthusiastic manner uh, where they can provide training and education for mature learning like elderly. Online platform already I have talked about. You can find out a uh, community education center and the best area for them. Where elderly can find out that 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 community education center uh, in in the local area uh, because this center might offer classes or workshop on various topics, including vocational skill. So this is the area where uh, I think elderly can explore. Uh, so organized sector in India. Uh, you have to, as an as elderly, you have to identify their interest in skill, their research opportunity, whether it is there and how much research opportunities are there in terms of employability when talk about, uh, upgrading skill, uh, what kind of skill you need, you have to upgrade, networking already I have talked about, then job search. And the area uh, elderly can always utilize both online and offline platform to search uh, suitable job opportunities. Uh, another part is age-friendly employers. That is very difficult sometimes uh, getting job as elderly, but they can find out the job is friendly, you know, uh, employer. Look, those organizations that actively, actively promote diversity and inclusivity. So there can be, you know, uh, better job uh, or age-friendly employer. So friends, uh, when you talk about uh, job employee or elderly in uh, organized sector and lifelong learning and e skilling, knowledge and skill is very important. If you talk about technology related skill, say for example, individual who learn coding language like Python or Java can secure employment in software development companies or IT firms. Digital marketing, if I talk about for elderly, say for example, that uh, by acquiring uh, knowledge on social media or uh, uh, content creation, they can find employment opportunity in various uh, sectors. Data analysis, uh, if the person has well enough uh, uh, skills or data analysis, they can have you know better employability in, in, in finance or healthcare or market research. Uh, lastly, what I have seen and I still saw that soft skill is very, very important for everybody, especially for elderly, because while technical skills are important, employers also you know place significant values on soft skill. Because uh, this soft skill like communication, teamwork, uh, problem solving capacity, leadership quality or leadership skills that can improve employability in various sector. Say, for example, uh, a person with a strong communication skill can excel in customer service role or sales or marketing position. So it's important to note that the success of lifelong learning and uh, reskilling it completely depends not only on acquiring new skills, but also on regularly updating them to match the evolving job market and the market needs. So by adopting what I think to change and embracing this continuous learning, any individual, whether it is elderly or youth or adult in India can enhance their prospects for consistent and meaningful employment in the organized sector. I think that is something I just wanted to share with you. 
uh, uh, thank you so much. I think I'm done with this 10 minutes. Uh, so you are on mute, uh, Dr. Gangadharan, you are on mute. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sanjay, for uh, your uh, 15, 10 minute, 10 point uh, presentation on uh, lifelong learning and the allied subjects. And uh, thank you very much. I think you are not likely to be there for question and answers. And I'm, I'd like to move on to the second speaker, Professor Pinky Mathur, very interesting person. Um, I had a nice chat with her, very nice to have her. Uh, CV, CV here, an associate professor of director of Center for Human Rights. Center of Experience is a director at the Technical Law College Lawyers Collective. Her primary academic interest is lie in understanding the evolution of international law and a co author of Conflict in the Shared Household. I had a nice, very, very brief discussion with her. I really invite her to now talk. I would request the speakers to kindly confine yourself 12 minutes. I can understand one extra minute going, but three, four minutes could cause us a little bit of stress towards the end. Thank you very much. Invite uh, Professor Pinky Mathur. Sure. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for that wonderful introduction. Yes, indeed, it was, it was a pleasure to speak to you the other day. And I would also like to thank Helpage India for having me uh, for this. And especially, especially from Helpage India, Anupama, thank you so much for inviting me for this uh, very, very important topic on uh, aging and disability. So um, the topic that I have been assigned is the international law related, uh, uh, you know, uh, the convention on the rights of persons with disability. So this is a convention uh, that was uh, that was drafted in 2006. It was adopted in 2006 and it was uh, out for ratification and uh, states signed it in 2007 starting from 2007 so what is uh, so i want to i want to focus it's a long convention uh, it gives a lot of things there are several rights that it provides uh, i want to uh, i want to confine myself primarily to uh, the very very crucial and uh, you know special characteristics of this particular international convention so uh, this is a convention that uh, for the first time spoke about human rights from a perspective of enabling, from a perspective of participation and not from a protectionist point of view. Uh, you know, so it's, it, although there are protections that are provided, what the convention is telling us and essentially is that every human being has inherent dignity. Everybody yeah. is equal. So everybody needs to be treated equally. And there is a specific way in which disability has been defined under the convention. And that becomes very critical. So that's something I want to focus some time on. So how does the convention define disability? Uh, so historically, uh, you know, when there was a disability, whether it is mental disability or there's a physical disability, some kind of uh, impairment, what we call, uh, we, we actually call this impairment under the convention. So if there was an impairment, uh, it would be treated medically. So historically, the attitude was that you are dealing with the individual. You're not looking at any other underlying issues around disability. So you are treating the individual by medication, by rehabilitation, or any other measure that you need to have. Uh, so that was what was known as the medical model of of disability. That's how disability was traditionally uh, conceptualized. Uh, what changed with the International Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability is that the, the, the model of medical model of disability was transformed. Uh, what we now have, which essentially guides this convention as well, and this is one of the first conventions that's brought this in, uh, is that it's it's being draw it's being drafted. Um, as the social model of disability. You know, the social model of disability, which is something that the, the disability rights groups have been, um, you know, fighting for and um, have been speaking about for several years, has been adopted in this convention. Now, what is the social model of disability? So the social model of disability segregates the idea of disability from the idea of impairment. What 
what the convention says is that persons have impairments. Persons are not disabled. There is nothing like a disabled person. Persons have impairments. The disability that results from the impairment is created by the social conceptualization of disability. So it is a disabling environment and the inability of society to accommodate the person's impairment that gives rise to the question of disability. So it segregates these two ideas. So it's a very, very novel way of looking at disability. And when it comes to elderly rights, it becomes even more critical because we, we are now talking about enabling ageism. We, we, we want to take away the stigma from ageism and we want to ensure that the elderly are able to live a life with respect of independence, not one of dependence. Uh, so that's, that's where the dialogue is going and the Disability Rights Convention really helps with that. So it is talking about ensuring. So the onus has now been moved from the individual impairment to the societal enabling process. So the convention is creating rights and is talking about the obligation of states that have signed the convention, that are signatory to the convention, to ensure that, that, the, that society and the state, the nation, ensures that their law, their policy, their mechanisms, their programs, and their points of action must be such that the society accommodates the impairment. So that's really a very, very critical thing to understand about the Disability Rights Convention. The onus is now on the state. The onus is not on the individual. The onus is not on the medical professional to treat the impairment. That's a very different dynamics. So what, what are they essentially saying? That we need to, in order to have enabling environments, uh, the way it has been con conceptualized by the convention, you need to ensure that the environment changes. And in order for the environment and the ability to be facilitated, the first thing that needs to be done is to ensure that the stigma related to the idea of impairment, this idea that we have of an, a standard of what is normal, and then we are assessing everybody else who does not match that standard of normal, uh, as a disabled person. Now, disability can be long-term. Disability can be, uh, can be short-term. Disability is not something that is meant to be dis disabling unless society doesn't, society disables you. So it's a society that disables you, not your physical, mental, or any kind of uh, aptitudinal impairment. That is creating a disablement. So this, a simple way to understand would be, uh, you know, when, when you have societies that ensure that there, uh, there is wheelchair access in all spaces, then the disability, the, what we refer to as disability, does not remain disability anymore. It's simply an impairment that that society has taken care of. That's essentially what the convention is saying. The other very critical aspect is that we need to address the stigma attached with impairments. We, we stigmatize impairment. Uh, we exclude persons who have impairments. We are unwilling to accommodate them. So how do we do this? There needs to be awareness. There needs to be conversation around the fact that impairment is something that can affect anybody at any age. So first, we, we also need to simultaneously deal with the stigma of ageism. That essentially implies that, oh, you know, now this person, you know, that, that attitude, uh, that, that's exactly the same stigma that is suffered by persons with impairments. That is what the convention wants you, us to deal with. So uh, while the convention doesn't talk specifically about elderly as an intersectionality of marginality, uh, so to speak, uh, it speaks about children with disability. It speaks about women and girls with disability. However, 
the elderly are very much covered and protected under the provisions uh, because essentially it is based on the principle of non-discrimination. It is available to everybody, all human beings without any, uh, any kind of discrimination. And it is based on principles of justice uh, and it addresses barriers that society creates, which need to be removed. Uh, so the dialogue between the two uh, well, we don't have an international convention on rights for the elderly. Hopefully, we will have that in the next decade or so. Uh, but but whatever are the international mechanisms to deal with the challenges of an increasing, you know, increase in the elderly population in the world, uh, it, it, there's a very there's a very clear parallel between the two uh, as far as the rights uh, the, the convention on the rights of disability uh, persons with disability is concerned because we are basically looking at this a very very similar model for addressing elderly issues related to the elderly as well uh, so because of impairments the the discrimination that people face uh, with respect to housing needs, with respect to employment, with respect to health, special facilities that you require for health, all of those have been covered under the convention. Some of the critical and specific articles that relate that could be uh, superimposed on specific needs of the elderly, um, the, the, one, uh, the first one would be Article 9. Uh, that talks about accessibility. Accessibility is very, very important when you have an impairment. Um, and I have to, uh, and the one thing that I, I should have said right in the beginning, which I did not, is that the, 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 the convention, the Disability Rights Convention does not discriminate or differentiate within its definition of disability uh, between mental, physical, or intellectual impairments. It puts all of these at the same level. And this is a very, very important idea to imbibe. Uh, you know, you when you when we are able to physically see a physical ailment, when we see somebody who is physically challenged, uh, there is a certain amount of sympathy and there is a certain amount of, you know, this attitude of accommodation that tends to follow uh, what we see as a visible disability. While persons with mental uh, impairments don't get the same uh, understanding. Uh, so persons with mental disabilities uh, and impairments uh, have get a very, very raw deal. So we need to understand that the convention equally protects persons who have mental a mental disability. And it is, it, is, it is talking about any kind of impairment, whether it is physical or mental as treatable. And therefore it doesn't need besides a specific accommodation by society to include, to ensure that our employment, our education, our physical spaces, our personal spaces, the convention talks about family, inclusivity and being treated as a normal person, just the way a person without an impairment is treated. I mean, you know, we can, you can have an accident and you might, uh, you know, you may not be able to walk and you might need a wheelchair for some time. Now, because that, just because that happens doesn't mean you are stigmatized or you're treated badly. Uh, it, so that's the attitude that needs to now be uh, reinforced when it comes to long-term impairments as well. So these are some of the very, very critical ideas that have been brought in. Uh, the other areas where the elderly uh, can draw from the convention uh, is Article 19 that speaks about living arrangements and independent living. Also, inclusivity in the community. Uh, these are issues that the elderly face irrespective of whether they have, have an impairment or they don't have an impairment. And if you have an impairment, then it becomes an even bigger problem. You, know, you could be living in an absolutely fine housing society, but if your housing society does not provide wheelchair access or uh, you know, it, is not, it, it, it does not constitute residents who are willing to assist you, it's not about helping or you know being overly protective 
but to just be a little understanding, you know, just walking into the lift, uh, you know, your, your wheelchair going into the lift and how considerate are people. So these attitudinal barriers. So the convention talks about the responsibility of the state. So nation states are responsible and they must ensure that attitudinal barriers, environmental barriers are removed so that the impairment is simply seen as an impairment and not a disability. Then there is the uh, there is Article 20 that talks about personal mobility, very much related to the aspect of accessibility. So it's not just mobility uh, in the public spaces that you go to, it's also critical in public spaces or workspaces. So your workspaces must have disability access. Uh, they should accommodate. So perhaps in lifts, I don't see that trend, but we will see the, abroad that there will be lifts which will have Braille, the numbers of the floors presented in Braille. So it really makes uh, the idea of impairment way more livable. So the, 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 what the Disability Rights Convention is trying to do is to ensure that, that intersectionalities that are specially marginalized, for example, elderly, though it doesn't speak about it directly, we can include the, uh, the idea of ageism, aging and ageism, stigma related to ageism here. So the stereotypes related to ageism, the stereotypes related to impairments, the prejudices, the harmful practices related to disabilities. You know, we, we have all these notions about how we can cure somebody. Um, and, and, you know, there is some kind of a curse. There, there's some, I mean, even when we talk about elderly, you know, we, 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 just, we just kind of uh, look at it as a cycle of life where you need to be relegated to a special space. Now, that's not necessary. That's absolutely not necessary. So there is a need. So I'll just conclude by saying that there is a need to look at special needs, special requirements and special accommodation for the elderly in the same way that the Disability Rights Convention is telling us to accommodate impairments that might arise during the normal life cycle of persons. And it, the intersectionalities are very, very critical. And hopefully the UN mechanisms will look at these issues more uh, deeply as you know our elderly population is rising in the world. And there are other mechanisms by which the US, the United Nations, I'm sorry, the United Nations is addressing issues of aging now. <clears throat> So the intersectionalities are very, 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 very easy to find. It's really not very hard. Uh, the special health needs, workplace and employment, accessibility and inclusion is very important. Uh, where you live, social protection by the states. So if there are persons who don't have families who can take care of them, then we need to ensure that in the housing mechanisms and the, in the housing societies that we are creating for the elderly, those also need to ensure uh, disability access. They also need to ensure that you have, will have persons with special needs that you need to accommodate. So that's essentially what this is about, uh, the, the convention. The international mechanisms talk about ensuring that there is no exclusion, that there should be a reconstruction in the way we view disability, that we don't focus on the disability, leave that to the state to deal with, and ensure that everybody is accommodated and included. We need to look at persons with disability as persons who have impairments. That's essentially what the convention is about. And it's a very, very wonderful convention. And it has absolutely changed the way society should be addressing rights of persons with disability, rights of persons living with impairments. So that's, that's all I have to say on the topic. Oh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mathur. So, sir, I will not be here at the end of the session. So may I request that if there are any specific questions, we can address those now. Would that be possible? Let me tell you, I really enjoyed your session. The questions will not come in now. You, have, you may have to bear with us. Okay. Because right. we are already okay. we are running. Within two speakers, you're running short of time. I understand. I so understand. I understand. Thank you so much. It was wonderful being here. Thank you so much. Kindly bear with me. Kindly bear with me. If you're able to come online in between, it will be wonderful. Yes, no, I, will I will definitely try. I will definitely try. I'll definitely try. Thank you so much. Sorry, Thank you for having me.
you explained it so beautifully. Very, very well. Thank you. Uh, thank articulated. You, very, thank you very much. Also. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. With us, uh, now thank we you, are sir. going to invite uh, the third speaker, um, Mrs. Meera Patabiram. Meera Patabiraman is a very strong advocate of dementia care for over 30 years, of, almost about 30 years of time. I'm sure uh, she explains what it is. And uh, she has grown, I think she has done a lot of work in India, Alzheimer's and what is called ARDSI, 25 years. And now she is now a big lady sitting in London as a board member of Alzheimer's Disease International, as well as a chair of Asia Pacific Regional Office. And I'm sure uh, her, her talk will be very interesting for us. And uh, now, um, Anupama, just a matter of question. I thought there was going to be some, you know, questions that you're going to ask. Is it drop the yes, idea? Yes, sir, we did, but uh, we'll ask after the say uh, the next speaker. We we do have calls. We okay. will. We'll come back. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. Now, uh, I think um, uh, I invite uh, Mira to talk about challenges and innovative response for care of care of dementia patients. Thank you, Mira. Welcome. I think you might have to switch on your audio. You're on mute, perhaps. We can't hear you, Mira, ma'am. Ma'am, if you could just remove your headphone, probably it will be better. She may have to connect, disconnect that connection in the computer or whatever she's using, if she's got a wire. Yeah, I think uh, it's her uh, headphone that's interfering with the... Can you hear now? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, Loud yeah. and clear. Loud right. and clear. Right. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gangadhan, for your uh, good introduction. And uh, it's my pleasure to be here. And I'd like to thank uh, HelpAge India for inviting me to this. I'm just setting my timer so that I don't go out of time. All right. Thank you. And um, thanks to HelpAge and uh, Anupama for interacting with me. And you all have chosen a wonderful uh, uh, heading, intersectionality, uh, longevity, and disability. That's a really amazing topic. As we all get older, we have so many uh, disabilities, whether it is you know minor ones like hearing loss, hypertension, respiratory issues. But that's part of normal aging. Some of us are fortunate not to have too many of them. But dementia, I can tell you, is a major disability that is affecting the growing elderly population. But the sad part is it continues to be underrecognized. And as a double whammy, it is also has a lot of stigma and discrimination with uh, Dr. Pinky was talking about. As a former caregiver and someone who has worked for 25 years, I can tell you that caring for a person with dementia is the most challenging task for anybody. And the caregivers themselves need a lot of support and guidance so that the quality of care is not compromised. Next slide, please. So dementia is very different from other diseases because it does not affect only the person with dementia. Most likely the person with dementia does not know that there's any problem with him or her. They always think that they are normal. But the impact is on everybody else. The primary caregiver has a major impact. And also the friends, families, neighbors, they're all affected in some form of the other. And quite often we have seen that the cordial relationship that was existing amongst the family members has been broken because of the lack of knowledge of the disease. That is the primary thing which causes the straining of relationships because people don't know that this, all these are part symptoms of the disease. Next slide, please. Next, yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, in India, right now, we have about 8.9 million persons with dementia, but unfortunately, only less than 10% get a timely diagnosis. So most of the diagnosis happens only in the late stage of the disease, by which time the benefits of medication to delay the progression of the disease are lost. And uh, we were part, RC was part of a research, international research study called STRIDE, Strengthening Responses to Dementia in Developing Countries. There were seven countries around the world. And this revealed that the health-seeking behavior varies with the economic standards and illiteracy. So people don't, uh, because of illiteracy, they don't know the symptoms. They don't want to go to the doctor. And uh, this causes the delay in diagnosis. Also, there is no cure at present. So for over the 100 million person, elderly persons in our country, what is important is now to look at the modifiable risk factors of dementia. And that is what both WHO and ADI, we are now stressing on the importance of risk reduction. Next slide, please. So what are the major challenges that we are facing in providing dementia care? First of all, we have very few diagnostic centers and too few professionally and trained persons to make the diagnosis. The neurologists and psychiatrists are there only in the bigger towns and cities. But what about the rural areas where the bulk of our population live? People don't even, they most often they presume it is normal part of aging. And this lack of awareness is there among all sections whether it is healthcare professionals, general public, or even the family members. As part of the STRIDE study, we also did a module on stigma and awareness, which is very nicely spoken about by uh, the previous speaker. This is a major thing which affects dementia. They are all marginalized. They're, that's mainly because of the behavioral problems associated with dementia. And finally, the unfortunate truth is that the government spending on health care of elderly is far short of what is required. And in that limited job budget, the allocation for dementia is very insignificant. Now, let's look at the consequences. Next slide, please. Yeah. Of a delayed diagnosis. People don't understand strange behavior. They don't know why the person is behaving like this. The safety and security of the person is at risk, and there could be legal and financial complications as well. So all this has again resulted in family and friendly relations becoming strained. That's why it is crucial for us to have an early diagnosis so that the family is prepared on what course of care they can provide and that the whole family contributes so that there is no overburdening on one particular family member. Next slide, please. So this is what happens in the case of there's no diagnosis. Then the person does, the caregiver does not understand why the person is behaving like this. They themselves are often lonely. They feel depressed. They have health issues. So they need more knowledge about what uh, the disease is. They need guidance in the form of training. And all this can happen when there is knowledge and early diagnosis. Next slide, please. World over. The focus is on person-centered care. As no two persons with dementia are the same, though the broad symptoms may be similar, the individuals behave or react differently. So the caring has to be tailor-made to the individual's needs, preferences, and lifestyle. And that is how we can improve the quality of life of the persons and their behavioral symptoms like aggression, agitation, and wandering can be minimized. Next slide, please. So there are three types of care in India, mainly home-based daycare and residential care, of which the most common is 99% of the people with dementia are taken care of in their homes. Even in the West, now they are, after the uh, pandemic, people are trying to advocate for more people being taken care of in their homes. But it's only in the bigger cities that we have residential care facilities or daycare centers run by organizations like RC and other organizations. And here the people get professional care because the personnel are trained. But this is just a small speck compared to the 8 million per persons with dementia. 
And finally, in the advanced stage, the only solace is palliative care. And during this time, the caregivers do require a lot of emotional and social support because 24-hour care is required during the last stages of the disease. Next slide, slide please. Yeah, this is my organization, the Alzheimer's and Related Disorders Society of India, founded in 1992. And then we have chapters in different parts of the country. It was founded by Dr. Jacob Roy in Kerala. And... Um, we are running a lot of activities like training, guidance, memory clinics. And um, most importantly, we are advocating with the government for specific, dementia specific plans and policies. Next slide, please. So these are some of our goals to improve and empower the lives of persons with dementia and their caregivers. And towards this end, we have been doing a lot of awareness raising. I, I'm sure you'll agree that in the last 10 to 15 years, no longer Alzheimer's or dementia are like Greek and Latin. People have heard about it. Even the layman knows what dementia is. As So there is awareness about dementia, but still the health-seeking pattern is still not there. Of late, we're focusing a lot on risk reduction, like the rest of the world, even ADI has brought about risk reduction reports. And we have been advocating with both central and state governments for dementia-specific plans for better diagnosis, treatment, and care. Next slide, please. In the year 2017, WHO announced the Global Action Plan, which mandated that all countries of the world should have national plans for dementia by the year 2025. So taking a cue from this, we had RC, we uh, brought out the Dementia India Strategy Report. In this, we have recommendations in all the seven action areas mandated in the uh, WHO's Global Action Plan. And we handed it over to the Health Minister at that time, Sri Nadda. We also gave it to Dr. Harshwardhan. And now we are on the process continuously advocating for the government to accept dementia as a national health priority and to start at least some spe specific plan, policies and projects for persons with dementia. So th the next slide. Here we will see why it is important and critical for the government to recognize dementia as a public health priority, because the magnitude of the problem is huge and there are very few facilities and support services. And it will be impossible only for the private sector or for the NGOs to meet their demands. It is critical for the government to step in. For instance, dementia should be covered under the health insurance to reduce the financial burden of the families. There should be extensive medical facilities, diagnostic centers. This should come under the primary health care. Only then it can have a far reach and it will become accessible to the majority of the people in the country. Next slide, please. Uh, the only state where we have had success, as long as the government is concerned, is the state of Kerala, where the year 2014, we had the Kerala State Initiative on Dementia. And this is the first public-private partnership, and uh, it has worked exceedingly well. We have one full-time center and one residential care center for the underprivileged persons. We have run massive uh, awareness programs throughout the state so that the healthcare professionals like the Angan body workers, they have been sensitized. And uh, we have had uh, in starting of memory clinics. We have uh, so, uh, uh, protocols for starting memory clinics and running centers. This is an ideal model to be replicated in other states. And I was happy that the Karnataka government announced a similar program for their state on the occasion of Old Alzheimer's Day this year. Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, this I'm, I'm talking about the Dementia Care Skills Training Program, which is what Dr. Sanjay Roy said, the importance of uh, uh, care. Uh, scare skills. So this started in uh, the genesis of this was in Australia, 
and then later they did it in Singapore and then we thought we should have one for our area for the Asia regions to be more culturally appropriate. So there was a meeting in Jakarta. We had two people from Artsy attending that and then they came back and then they trained uh, 10 master trainers from different chapters of uh, Artsy and later we spent a year and a half developing the dementia care skills training program. So this has uh, training programs with Indian case studies, with Indian modules, and they, they, they cover an overview of the different types of dementia, or the strategies for managing the, the challenging behavior arising out of behavioral problems, and how we can provide emotional support for the family. This is very, very crucial because majority of the people are taken care of by in their homes. So we need training on basic uh, caring techniques so that the persons are getting proper care in their homes. And this is an important, and we have also started a national training program in Trivandrum, where we have round the clock training programs. Thank Next slide, please. So these are the initiatives we have taken to uh, overcome uh, the challenges and how to have better care. The best is our, the be biggest success is of course, the Kerala State Initiative on dementia. And then uh, we need, we are setting up uh, gener uh, uh, awareness generating. The health is a state subject. So we're trying to set up memory clinics through the district mental health program of the National Health Mission. We're also trying to bring in dementia schemes under the scope of the national policy for older persons. We'll be very grateful to uh, help it if we can collaborate to impress upon the government for more policies for dementia along with older persons. And uh, as I said, we have set up the national training program, which is running around the clock. Next slide, please. So the need of the R for us is to provide holistic care for persons with dementia. And for this, it calls for a multidisciplinary approach. And it, all of us need to pitch in and join hands to make a difference in the quality of care for the persons with dementia whether it is not only family members, friends, neighbors, the extended family, we should all be sensitized so that the sense of isolation that many families feel. This is what, you know, may all families feel as soon as somebody is diagnosed with dementia, that family immediately gets isolated. This has to be eliminated. I'll tell you a small case of wandering. You know, a lot of people wander away and then, uh, you know, in the cities, some of the families who are fortunate, they're able to trace back the person who was wandered off and then the, it's a good ending for them. But there are certain cases in which the person has never been found. And then the family does not get closure on the subject. But this would not have happened if the police or the, you know, the NGOs, the hospitals, nursing homes, these are sensitized so that the wandering person is not a homeless person. He may be a person with memory loss, so they should do a, go the extra mile to trace out, see who this person could be, and then the family can be reunited. Next slide, please. That's why it's very important for us to create a dementia-friendly society. This is what Pinky Mathur was saying, that it's not the impairment or the disability. It is for the society to see that the person feels inclusive and does not have isolation. See, if the same wandering person, if it had happened in a village, you know what, the fellow villager would have brought him back because in the village, if most of them know one another or know about the families and they may even know that that older person has memory problems. But such a thing does not happen in a city. That is why we need to have a dementia-friendly city. And I think Kerala and Kerala, Cochin is the first dementia friendly city and we all need to work to build an environment where the person with dementia feels safe they feel respected they are and they feel included in the environment there is no sense of isolation i keep harping upon this because this is something i, I think i need to reach out to pinky also to say how we need to have a more inclusive society and for all this the government has a big role to play yeah, next slide, please. So to recap and conclude, 
we continually need to improve awareness. We need to set up more support and care facilities. We need more training for family members, professional caregivers, and also for uh, uh, family caregivers. We need to have state and center plans. And mostly it has to come from the center for the center to recognize dementia as a public health priority. And finally, whatever care we are providing, this has to be person-centered care because only then that person will get the best possible care. And I'd like to help uh, end with your uh, help page logo, which says fighting isolation and neglect. I'm not talking about poverty that will come under state plans where they can have free centers for underprivileged, but we definitely need to fight isolation and neglect in the case of persons with dementia and their family members. Thank you. I hope I have stuck to my time. Don't worry. I think all of you will probably will struggle to keep pace with 12 minutes. 12 Me minutes now. is a real big task. Because all of you need to, I think you are, you know, none of you are able to help it. Don't worry about uh, it. No, I was I'm not sure. told it was 12 minutes. You know, I thought it was You are the only so probably. Uh, uh, don't worry, man. It's okay. I think all of us are listening to you. That's very important. I think Thank you're you. all Thank making you. some reference. I don't think few minutes are going to make a difference. I'm only trying to control it. That's all. I does I doesn't mean that we don't want you to talk. Let me tell you, you made an excellent presentation about mentioning very very important point. Very impressive for me from that whole thing is what you are doing through what is called that program called uh, dementia training. Case. Dementia caskets. Very very yes. nice. I think what we have to do is to reach out to as many people as possible. Yes. I think when you are talking about disability, we are talking about you know Pinky made really lovely you know points. When you look at all this, I think very important for the society to become sensitive. Thank you very much, Mira. I'm sure you're going to stay back to answer queries later, not now. <laughs> I, I'll come back later. Yeah, I'll come back yeah, later. Yeah, right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Now we invite uh, next piece. Next piece here is Mr. Daryal. Mr. Daryal is a former Deputy Chief Commissioner, Disability and Member Secretary, RCI India. Very important organizations. Both are very important. And he's going to talk about how does law hinder or facilitate the society to become age friendly and ensure equality, dignity, and participation. Again, I had a very nice talk with him to understand what he was going to talk. I really enjoyed uh, listening to him. And I look forward to listening to him now when he's talking. I invite Dr. Mr. Daryal to talk. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, Dr. Gandhan. I was uh, so impressed by your. Uh, idea of uh, this particular program, how you want to plan, how in uh, you know keen you were to talk to everybody, uh, all in the uh, panel, and thankful to Help Age India, Anupamaji, and uh, everybody else for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk on this very very important issue, uh, intersectionality. Uh, that's so important, which is generally lost sight of. And uh, in fact, just before uh, uh, Professor Pinky Mathur mentioned about UNCRPD explained so well. Um, so I personally felt uh, that the issue of intersectionality of the older persons uh, with disabilities uh, really uh, got sidelined or probably it went out of the mind of the people while drafting UNCRPD and also rights of persons with disabilities because we're harmonizing our domestic law uh, with the UNCRPD. Uh, and I'm also very happy about the concept note that has been, that was prepared by uh, Help Aids India and circulated to us. And they have mentioned it's a lost opportunity uh, that we did not mention specific, men, specifically mention about older persons with disabilities in the uh, RPWD Act. So having said that, uh, my topic when I asked some of my friends, uh, could they help me to uh, give some points on how law hinder, uh, laws hinder or facilitate the society to become age friendly? This is very difficult. It's very difficult. I don't know. They, uh, for me also, it was very uh, uh, difficult. What to say? Whether it hinders, the laws hinder or facilitate. 
So lastly, I would say laws do facilitate. They have these have facilitated inclusion of all people with disabilities because whether it is UNCRPD or our constitution or the rights of persons with disabilities, these are for all persons, irrespective of the silos that we put them in, women, children, uh, elderly, and so on and so forth. But what happens, you all know about uh, the, 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 the story about MDZs and SDGs. MDGs did not mention about persons with disabilities, and there was so much neglect. And now we have 11 times mentioned, mentioned in the uh, SDGs, and therefore we talk about uh, inclusion, participation, and dignity of people with disabilities. It's the core dignity is the core thing in the UNCRPD and also our Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act, which is uh, been uh, uh, enacted in our country to you know, give effect to UNCRPD. So when, I, uh, when it comes to uh, you know, making the society to take the help, use the law to become age friendly and ensure that the people uh, older people get equally equal equal treatment, they get the dignity and are able to participate in all walks of life. Two things are very important to me. One is the people who are in the rural areas, tribal areas, difficult areas, and in the cities, uh, just now Madam uh, Mira said about the cities. So as far as I see the rural areas, the uh, people, elderly people or people with disabilities probably get better in the sense amalgamated within the society. But uh, when it comes to the question of dignity or equality, it's a big, big question, very difficult. And in the cities, of course, the families, nuclear families, they, these have their own uh, issues. So my uh, one of the recommendations would be that when we talk about elderly with disability or without disability, we must look at those two aspects. We must specifically think of those people who could be more vulnerable than the others and hence subjected to discrimination, greater discrimination. And then the haves and have nots, poorer people belonging to the uh, lower economic strata. So they have very, very difficult task, even for their parents. Say, we have the law for elderly, uh, maintenance of parents and uh, older persons who are uh, senior citizens, uh, Act 2007. Uh, now, how many people know, one, about the law? And how many people with uh, our older people are uh, ready to go to the court or, row, or go to the authorities and complain discrimination, non-discipline, non-maintenance, and so on and so forth. Uh, so the big, the second point that is very important for us is uh, creating awareness about the laws. Laws can facilitate, provided the people for whom, that is the primary stakeholders for whom these laws have been enacted, are aware. The other stakeholders, the people who are uh, responsible for implementing those they are aware about it and also they say they, they, the children the society know about the law what the law is and unless we do that while people may be wanting to do something include them ensure that they participate in all walks of life but may not be knowing how to do it now, in our act, whether it is Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act or the 2007 Act for Older Persons, we this is the lost opportunity in the sense that we haven't mentioned this intersectionality. A major portion, more than 50% of our people, uh, older people may have one disability or the other, but the policy that uh, for older people 
and the persons with disabilities that are going to come, we are going to see on ground, must mention that. So unless you do that, probably again, that they, they, the older people with or without disability may get, uh, you know, uh, uh, may not get the due that they are. So uh, here I would uh, uh, give one or two examples. There are a big number of such examples. As Deputy Chief Commissioner for Persons with Disabilities, I had uh, come across cases, a pensioner, a woman pensioner of the Government of India who has acquired disability, intel, a mental disability, lost memory, is not able to draw her pension because the law that we have, she must have a guardian. The courts take so much of time to appoint a guardian, and therefore, she is not able, she was not able to, uh, you know, withdraw her money, which is getting piled up in her account. They were, she and her husband were on the verge of starvation. The gentleman came to me, husband came to me, what to do? The moment the bank came to know that she is not mentally fit, they stopped, they freezed the account. They did not allow. When I took up with the bank, bank said that this is the law. So what is required, one of the key things, important things in the UNCIPD is to harmonize the domestic laws. It is not only the disability specific or older person specific laws and policies, but also the mainstream laws. So the th third thing would be we need to impress upon the government to harmonize the mainstream laws and also specific laws, whether related to women, related to older persons, related to persons with disabilities, they should be harmonized in a manner that they take care of this important intersectionality of older people with disabilities or whatever, whatever. So older people have to be mentioned, Unless you have a specific mention, they would generally uh, they, they would get lost. We may forget about them, uh, and it will be too late. The rights of persons with disabilities policy, the, sorry, the policy, uh, national policy on persons with disabilities, is being reviewed by Department of Empowerment of Persons with Disabilities. I'm fortunately part of it, and the next meeting is on 11th of this month, next month. Yes, this month, December. And uh, this um, particular webinar uh, really has come uh, uh, handy to me that I'm going to mention about that. The at least policies were in the uh, rights of, uh, in the, uh, the national policy for persons with disabilities, we must mention about the needs of persons with disabilities who are old. And also we should look at the laws or the policies also need to look at the people, older people who have age-related disabilities, like low vision, it could be hearing loss, movement, and so and so forth. Accessibility, of course, that has already been dealt, that has to be provided. So there are some of the uh, uh, other people who may have Benchmark disability is 40 percent. What do you call is 40 percent or more, and there will be people, uh, older people who have, uh, say, high support needs. Those high support need and benchmark disabilities, we would have to have specific policies, specific programs and schemes for them, so that they are able to, they are enabled to participate in the society. They get their dues, they get the dignity, they also get their rights. So they, similarly, the, I'm very sorry to say uh, that uh, Ganga Dharan Sahib is uh, there in the, was there in the committee. The policy, draft policy has been submitted, but it hasn't seen the light of the day. Why has it taken so much time? <clears throat> so I am also concerned about the fact that the issues of the older people 
or uh, persons with disabilities, persons with other disabilities, multiple uh, intersectionally like women with disabilities, older persons, uh, women with disabilities, <coughs> do not get enough attention of the government. They get relegated to the background. I am very happy that this webinar is happening. I am happy that uh, Help Age India has done so much uh, about uh, the, the older people with disabilities. So that I think we should uh, put in efforts. And then the uh, next uh, recommendation would be <coughs> that we uh, must design specific programs and schemes for people who are in the rural area, older people in the uh, rural areas, older people with disabilities, we, we, we must understand, we, uh, we must appreciate that they would need larger funds. A person in the city, a person in the rural area, a person in the tribal area with severe disability. So specific programs, targeted programs must be, uh, I think, uh, developed. That is what I think in a short period of time I would uh, uh, conclude uh, to say that there is so much to uh, do in this sector because we have to accept that these intersectionalities do not get the due attention of uh, the, the, the governments and of the society as well. Because today's times are different. Earlier we did not know, notice them. People uh, accept it as uh, things have come. Today it is so difficult. There is so much uh, problem and with the better health facilities the other side of the story is that the people with disabilities, older people, the more older people with disabilities, they will have serious disabilities, more disease and severe disease. And therefore, that much uh, more effort would need by the civil society, by the organizations like Help is India. And there has to be a, a coordination. There has to be complete coordination between different organizations. Let us not work on silos. If Help is India, disability, women, and say uh, backward communities, difficult terrain communities, the, unless we have that, it will be difficult. We will do, we will help one segment, other segment will be left out. So there will be discrimination among older people with or without disabilities themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Daryal. I think you really brought in your experience of having served an important position in the government and brought in a lot of points. Very important, uh, I would consider at this point of time, one is how do we harmonize the laws? I think very important point that you mentioned in the general law and the very specific law. I, think very, I, I really am impressed with this particular point. Mm -hmm. And without any doubt, the law always makes everything challenging to all of us. I don't think we can do anything about it. But I'm also happy that you are also trying to take this point to your very soon to be held meeting national policy on disability. I think uh, uh, convened very soon. You would, uh, uh, we hope at least your policy gets cleared. Though the national policy of 21 is 2011 of India on world of person is kept pending. But at least we wish that you really, you know, are able to, you are able to bring it out as soon as possible. We'll all be very happy to do that. And finally, I'd like to also mention that very nice that you definitely want this law being split into rural areas and urban areas and remote areas. Probably it will have better impact. Yeah, I think remote areas mean for me, Help Edge India is the only organization in the country are able to reach, you know, MMUs across uh, remote areas. Very interesting experience we have. Now I invite uh, before well, the sir, next speaker, Anupama, Anupama to yeah. take over. Yeah, thank Chair you. Chairperson, sir, thank you. Uh, we'll put a poll question to the audience. Um, they can answer and we'll share the uh, results quickly with you because this is going to be the topic for the next two speakers so we just thought we'll uh, see what the audience think about about lifelong learning and lifelong earning Can anybody answer this question? Everybody should answer. Open? Okay. Yeah, okay. this is open, yes. but except for panelists. Panelists are like because they are experts, so we are keeping them out of it. But um, 
all the attendees can uh, answer the question. Yeah. And we see a very emphatic no here. I think uh, this actually uh, will guide our discussion, I think, because we we know that these opportunities do not exist and how we uh, sort of, you know, create that environment in which we actually start thinking on these terms is very important. So I'll close here, sir, and uh, over to you. So you're on mute. Uh, Chairman, sir, you're on mute. Uh, in fact, in fact um, you know, the lifelong learning is still to reach the typical world people. Uh, so disability is going to be the next phase. I hope we are able to do it together. Thanks once again, Anupama, for the interesting question on that. Now we have uh, the next person on the list is uh, Deepikar Rajkamal, an interesting person that I spoke a few days ago. Very interesting to know what she's really doing as a national resource person on a, a day NRLM, NRLM, correct, as a state uh, lead in Tamil Nadu, along with one of her colleagues. Uh, uh, and she's going to probably talk to us about, uh, not probably, she's going to talk about challenges and responses to continued engagement of poor, older persons with disabilities to uh, disabilities, to livelihood opportunities in rural areas. Very interesting. And uh, this could be, you know, I was just talking to one of the gentlemen this morning who happened to meet him accidentally. So he started a tailoring unit, not for old people, but others who are disabled. So he says, it's a temple. He says, I'm going to, we are going to place all orders on our temple. All arrangements will be made by, you know, this kind of people. And he says, quite a number of them are old people. I think opportunities are plenty. The question is, how do we really use it? Now let's invite to, to talk about an important subject, Deepika, Deepa Rajkamal, a national resource person for SLRM. SLR. And uh, I'm very sure uh, she's going to make it interesting for us. Present to her. Thank you very much. Deep, Deepa, I would, I would, to the extent possible, stick, to the extent possible, stick on to 12 minutes. One or two minutes, it's okay, but I'm just to the extent possible. Thank you. You, you just, you just, uh give a pinch of message that 12 minutes over okay thank you thank you Gangadranji, and i thank anupama and the whole l page india and amal as well uh, do i'm audible hello yes ma'am you are ah okay so and uh, thanks to rajeshwar ji as also for giving this opportunity okay so it is uh, like it is very interesting uh, sessions all gone with veterans uh, with a speciality uh, they have done a lot of things and it is also it is uh, well and good for us also as a panelist to hear all those things uh, thank you uh, once again for helping for an arranging wonderful webinar so the given topic is challenges and response to continued engagement of poor older persons with disabilities to livelihood opportunities in rural areas when we talk about the livelihood opportunities, definitely the topic itself very challenge for me, right? Okay, so I just want to have like a 30 seconds of um, stuff like we are done a lot of things in the community. It is not like a policy or law or something we have documented or done in a certain area. So across India, you all aware that National Rural Livelihood Mission is going on in 25 states and with the support of Help Age India, enormous of self-help groups and elderly self-help groups has formed. So right from the field level, so a lot of challenges are there. But there is an understanding, it is not like a persons with disability SGs and it is not like elderly SGs. So elder and disability, is, we have seen like in a different gamuts. But it is not like that when we go to the field and I have some uh, evidence of uh, data also. So next slide. So first, I just want to explain about the disability. So disability, you all know that there are 21 types of disability after 2016 RPWD Act. And there are 21% of elders 60 plus in total disability population in India. So we have to have some policy, special policy for elders with disability, as happily 
the real sir told that we are uh, welcoming that kind of policy but because 20% of when we talk about rpd act and disability there are 21 types of disability but major types of disabilities we have in elderly also so there are 21% of elders have disability so vice versa we have to have a special policy for them for elders because they have a functional disability wherein and add on to that in you know, a also are persons with disability characteristics so we coined them as most vulnerable person so overall aging population with functional disability is in 44% now we can understand that uh, like a 50% almost a 50% of elders is thriving with any kind of disabilities which is listed out here next slide so now challenges of aging is as i said the functional disability and also with disability like um, uh, among 1 lakh people uh, elderly person there are 5178 or disabled and 44% or the movement and seeing and hearing disability and 50% of disability person are working in below 60 and when you thought about like 60 plus then absolutely there is no livelihood at all and coming to this agsm or physical infrastructure whatever you talk about the elderly all the problems we also having in the disability so it is a evidence that we required a policy also and we also uh, when we have a program for elderly we have to take an account of disability as well otherwise that program may not be completed so uh, before talking about the livelihood the next slide the livelihood is not only income generation activity and it is not about uh, only uh, doing some activity or engaging with a business or entrepreneurial skill and all it is livelihood something it is a very uh, widen spectrum which have all the health aspects and also a social aspects and companionship and also the environment with social security and social safety and all are incorporated in livelihood it is not just like a income generation activity so when we talk about livelihood and it has definitely have challenges but the challenges is also it's multi dimensional and when we talk about elderly and as well as a disability we should look into the vulnerability so how much they are vulnerable so in nrlm so we are using a tool where we work with all the vulnerable people so when we work with vulnerable people and especially with elderly and disability and other types of vulnerable it is in the it, it is based on the contextual based of vulnerable types and all so we have to prioritize the vulnerable people so we use this kind of venn diagram where all the uh, uh, women a uh, widow women is also elderly and also disability so the prioritization is much more important when we design a program or when design a policy this kind of categorization we have to do under the vulnerability so the intensive of the vulnerability is so high so they should have a, a combo of interventions it is not like so you always say in the training programs and also you can't pick up a spoon with single finger right so uh, for, even to make a spoon of food make a, to take a spoon of food into your mouth you need all five fingers to pick the spoon so that is what we should it is a multi dimensional intervention we should have in any of the approach eventually for vulnerability we should have we should have the lens of seeing all the vulnerable conditions it is not like a person we can't coin them as elderly we can coin them as a disability they might have lot of issues on the background that has to be drawn out and listed out and for the each issues and problems they have we have to give the intervention then only it will that like a food into the mouth then only the program it will go into them otherwise it is only a sake of program or a sake of policy what we are writing it or doing it or intervening it so that is why the prioritization has been done so every prioritization they have been coined as a 1 2 3 so every person should have a different program next so coming to the live loads i'm just looking at here some tagging is here okay so live load as i said is a capabilities what i have already done for in case of elderly what i i have done already a lot of things in my adulthood some skill i have important already imparted and uh, in some income generation has been happened live load has been already uh, uh, already it is in their knowledge right so the capabilities is there 
so comparing to the when we work with disability person or in per se adult person when we work with elderly its capabilities there but there is in a generation gap even in the technology tech so as we discuss a lot about that and the materialistic life and the social resources and the activities and the skill based it's required for a means of living right so these are all things it it it, it com comprises to a livelihood so in that in that comes i i specifically say it is not like giving some livelihood activities it is come from social security from oap it begins with from the rights and entitlements of the of the particular persons and it is very pathetic also when see in some states in across india when we say that they uh, one person is getting a oap right and the same person is disabled they will not get the disability pension so if they are also need some uh, widow it's a maintenance there is a widow pension so some way the uh, list of uh, interventions when we give some like oap or maintenance grants it has to be relooked in policy as well where if they have it's a problem which i'm having three then i should have three solutions how could i say that one solution can solve all three problems because each of the problem is dynamically different right so this is a problem we face in most of the state and particularly in nagaland where we see that for instance for instance if there are 10 uh, elderly person or disabled per disabled person has to be given this maintenance grants only 20 has been approved so only 20 will get every year if anyone dies into that 20 only the 21st person will come in so a lot of uh, interventions uh, we have to change it so i could say the challenges is lack of awareness and investments or financial caps and also healthcare system and we need to plan lot of convergences activity with the, for the community convergence activity for the healthcare system and social but as a solution out of the experience i could say lot of awareness went to the community through forming elderly self help groups and as well as a pwd self help groups across india and the community mobilization is a self help groups and we given a lot of capacity building for them the capacity building for the self help groups the directly to the beneficiary so what's about is it's about the self help so it is not about a top to top to bottom approach it is about the bottom to top approach so they comes in a group and they discuss about their issues and they claim that this is my issues and it come to the federation and come from the federation it come to the districts and state and it comes to the national level hit that this is our problem so such kind of institutional arrangement has been done and it was greatly supported by help with india and coming to the next livelihood when we talk about the livelihood so when we talk about even say an income generation activity any business anything what we work also if you are not well today what you will say you will put leave right you will put sick leave or if we have not uh, upset in mind also you'll you'll get some stress out two hours or three years will go out and will come back and sit in the work like that livelihood can be that if you are not talking about the rights and entitlements if you are not giving their access for the enabling environment how could they think about livelihood right so livelihood is a, like a cherry on top of the ice cream now for them so we have to think that livelihood for the elderly or disability or elderly with disability is right away cannot be given as an a direct intervention it it should be in a combo of intervention first we have to make them understand and make them give all the potential for developing their self confidence i'm fair and i i can develop from this point of time and we have to enable all the environment we the approaches to them is a community driven approach so this is not a top to bottom approach so the community will come into an a self help uh, formation and they will give advocacy through federations and lot of knowledge transfer has been done and lot of fund flow is given because even a opening a bank account for an elderly sg or disabled sg or is a biggest problem now because it depends upon the bankers and it is depend upon the district and it is depend upon even on the states so opening in a bank account and having a financial transaction and then uh, having in a livelihood is also getting a loan is also an issue for them so eventually the community investment fund is given as a initial fund for them to try and do the trial and error method of their own livelihood system they're well and good they are doing it only the thing is that 
claiming up into that stage make like one to two years of interventions in record and handholding support is required. Eventually, we need, we request a lot of policy for the elderly along with disability. So they have to seen in the lens of disability as well as the elderly, and they have to be given weightage for the most vulnerable person in the country. So that is how uh, we designed all these uh, programs and we have done a lot of things in the community. But I could say out of my experience, when we go and talk to the elderly persons in the community and all, the expectations of them, right? The, they, they doesn't have a driving force to do some livelihoods. So they have been, we, 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 uh, we try for at least six to eight months to make them, mobilize them and form the groups and also we, we, uh, we give them that driving force. So after that only they'll come to uh, a conclusion that yes, we are we, we are on 65 or 70s, it is not too old. So we, we also can earn money and we can also do some activity. That activity is not only for earning money. It That activity earns money, but by the way, it also earns self-respect in the family. And also, by the way, it earns some health aspects as well. When we work and we have some friends and colleagues and the groups and the meetings and all, they'll give that, they, they feel like they have given with a good, or injected some blood and all. No, they feel so good on the thing. So it is, it, it is a good experience out of it, making an elderly SRG groups. But only uh, uh, thing is, we have to have even more good policy to come up with that. Thank you. Next. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Deepa. Very nice. Uh, you brought in a new you know, uh, concept of livelihoods and uh, how it makes a difference in the communities, particularly in rural areas. And also, you know, quite a number of us are very familiar with uh, the elderly self-help group that's been promoted, particularly in the area that you mentioned to me. I spoke to you in Kadalo, and uh, thanks to Help Age India, that's been very supportive. They have taken a lot of initiatives. I'm happy that you could really explain that. And as you're advocating for the policy, and I hope uh, we are all able to push, at the end of, uh, I think, uh, today's session, I'm sure some documentation will be done by Help Age and see what we can do to push the governments to... Thanks once again for a very illuminative talk that you gave. Thanks a lot. Then we go to the next speaker. Uh, sir, can yeah. we do a poll before that? Please, please. I think you have. You Thank said you. you have. Yeah, go ahead, please. Very true, yes. So I think uh, it's worth discussing this topic further. Um, I'll close it here. Do, do you are, okay. Yeah, but you're going to take this point towards the end. Some of these points can be taken towards the end so that yes, sir, sure. the current speakers, next few speakers are going to address this. It's fine. Yes, sir. Probably, you know, one or two questions, questions can be posed to the participants. Awesome. Thanks, sure. thanks, Anubhav, very much. Nice. The next speaker for us is um, uh, uh, Mr. Nababat, Nababat Sanchanavakul. I explained to him, I said, bear with me if I'm not able to pronounce you very carefully. Very nice of you so, to join us for this program. I did uh, a, a very brief talk to him on what exactly he's going to talk, and I think He's going to definitely talk about uh, particularly Asian countries on what's happening on disability, older persons, information technology, a design and use for innovative, uh, sorry, innovation for dealing with hesitation and resistance in the context of Asian countries. I'm very sure the topic uh, LP has chosen to discuss today, a lot of that would come from, uh, you know, you and step in a large way. Uh, looking forward to listening to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, Dr. Gangadharan, and good afternoon from Bangkok. May I kindly share I mean, the screen for myself? 
I hope it's there. Is it? Is it shown in the screen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much again, and good afternoon from Bangkok. So, esteemed experts and participants, thank you for the kind invitation from Help Edge India as well to especially from Anupama to as Cap to chair some reflections at this, at this webinar today. And my name is Napaphat Satyanavakun. I am Social Affairs Officer at the Social Development Division of SCAP. So let me just introduce briefly about SCAP. SCAP is the regional development arm of the UN Secretaries based in Bangkok, Thailand. It provides the most inclusive in the government platform in the Asia Pacific region. So the commission promotes cooperation among its 53 member states and nine associate members in pursuit of solutions to sustainable development challenges. Uh, we work based on three pillars. First, we work on intergovernmental, which refers to its convening power and norm setting work. We work on analytical things, which refer to its studies, reports, collection of data. And lastly, we work on technical cooperation, which refers to uh, support to member states and CSOs to advance their work in pursuit of sustainable development. Two weeks ago, we just convened this Seven Asian and Pacific Population Conference, APPC, which is held every 10 years. As it is important to note, the first conference was held 60 years ago in India. We, we have reviewed many issues and discussed about some emerging issues such as climate change, the pandemic and digital transformation, which are the topics we discussed today. I would encourage you all to look at the proceeding of the conference as well from this link you have seen. So as noted in a recent study by the UN Economics Network, population aging and technologies are one of the global and regional mega trends that are affecting sustainable development now and also in the future. In terms of population aging, the significant decline in total fertility rate or TFR over recent decades is a major driver of this change. In the mid 1960s, as you can see in this slide, women on average had about six children over their life course. But today, this year, the number has fallen to only 1.9 or below the replacement level of 2.1. But at the same time, life expectancy, the, the orange line at birth, almost doubled from about 43 years in 1950s from the beginning to 75 years in this year. As of this year, one in seven people in Asia and the Pacific are aged 60 years or older. But by 2050, one in four people is projected to belong to this age group. This demographic shift is driven by a rapid decline in infertility, in followed by decreased mortality rates and increased longevity. It is a successful story. You know? But while population is a global phenomenon, it is important to note that Asia Pacific is experiencing the fastest pace of aging worldwide although there's a wide variation across the country as well. At older ages, population are usually highly skewed towards female, as you can see, the number of older women exists. While the increase in life expectancy is a positive development, it is important to note that a significant number of people leave their later years with disabilities. In many cases in Asia and the Pacific, up to one quarter of older age is lost to disability. So about the key fact about the intersectionality between aging and disability in the region, Asia Pacific is home to approximately 700 million persons with disabilities. And over 50% of this number are older persons. The number of older persons with disabilities in the region is expected to increase over the coming decades, although there are some variations as well in terms of disability prevalence by country, and also there are some underreporting issues as well. Turning to the key policy framework, I think all of you have come across with this 
over the last two decades. The only global guiding document on population aging is the Madrid International Plan of Action on Aging. It was adopted by UN member states in 2002 and aims to ensure that older persons age with security, dignity, and their full rights. The plan of action has three parity areas, as you can see, older persons and development, health and well-being, and enabling supportive environment. Last year into 2022, there were member states participate in a group of 100 plus CSOs engaged in a forward review and appraisal of the MEPA. There was an outcome document in Asia and the Pacific that emerged from this intergovernmental meeting, which touches open the issues we discussed today. It is important to note as well that member states made these commitments in the outcome document and that we need to remind them to work towards these generally agreed goals in the coming future. The outcome document recognized what we discussed today, for example, to mainstream a gender and disability perspective into policies, taking into account the different needs and situation of all individuals over the life course. It is important that, I'm sorry, or the person also benefit from technology. Therefore, the gray digital divide had to be overcome but too often, in many cases, I mean, among the region, among countries in the region, all the persons did not have the access or even skills to technology, and it would become worse, of course, for all the persons with disabilities. So, given the compounding vulnerabilities, they could face higher barriers to full and effective participation in society. So, what can we do? What we discussed today, I think from the morning session, I have chance to, to attend. Both low-tech and high-tech solutions are very important in enhancing their daily life. I mean, in maintaining their dignity and especially for those with disabilities. But I think some speakers have already mentioned, I mean, the low-tech solution is already. What I would like to focus is the inclusion and promotion of assistive technologies, which can enable people to have a better independence at home or at least in their community as their age. Coming to good practice, I think Japan has been known for its advanced use of technology in, some, in supporting persons with disabilities. The government and pr private sector entities have introduced various assistive technology, such as robotic device for mobility and communication, and software application for vision, I mean, hearing impairments, but it's a long way to go to, to make it more accessible. So from this figure, I got it from ITU. It is important that Asia and the Pacific is a driving force of ICT development and adoption. We are champions of, of these two areas, but however, the region is also the most digitally divided in the world. And there are dis many disparities across age, across gender, and across disabilities. Where the digital divide exits, please note that it has further exacerbated the vulnerable situation of older persons. So I don't know whether I can answer the, the question the organizer has set for me but how to overcome this divide and also hesitation of using technology and the internet among older persons. At SCAP, we haven't done the study ourselves. However, I found a recent study by the UK Center for Aging Better suggests an interesting insight that is perhaps somehow relevant even beyond boundaries. The study highlight that it is not just about access to technology, but also about confidence and attitudes toward the internet or the technology. Many older persons, I think around the world, including in the region, lack confidence. This is a significant barrier, more so than the affordability of the device or equipment. The key issue is then is about self-efficacy. What can we do then? We must focus on building confidence among all the person, which is not just about teaching technology, but it's about changing the mindset that is never too late to learn and adapt. 
Let's turn our attention to one example from Singapore, which is a very good example of leveraging technology to enhance the lives of those with disabilities. A significant milestone reached last year was the enhancement of the Assistive Technology Fund. This fund now subsidizes up to 90% of the cost of assistive technology device, which is particularly beneficial for older persons with disabilities, addressing their evolving needs. So some items are now more accessible and affordable there. But another innovative program of Singapore, it's about the Senior Gold Digital, as you can see in the picture here, with the help of around a thousand digital ambassadors this initiative provides personal coaching and group training for all the persons. It focuses on essential skills, different tiers, but I think the people are the key for delivering the, the, the skills to all the persons. There are some many other good practices that we have received from member states of skill development, I mean, to enhance the digital literacy for all the persons. But one of the key actions that we need to do, I think, from these examples is to shift our focus. We need to move beyond just teaching basic digital skills, but how can we try to enable older persons to engage in more activities they wish to do? And I think this is a key that we can, we can move forward. SCAP itself, it's now implementing a project to develop tools to enhance digital literacy among older persons. We aim to increase their participation in society and improving the access to essential service. A key component of this initiative is to conduct surveys among older persons in project countries, including in India. So these surveys are very important for understanding their needs and tailing our approach further. We are currently seeking collaboration with OPAs in different countries to facilitate this survey process and the step that follow. If your organization is interested in this opportunity, we encourage you to reach out to us as soon as possible as well. Lastly, what I would like to suggest some key recommendations for enhancing digital inclusion, particularly for all the persons with disabilities. I think first we need to we still need to improve the accessibility of the digital environment as a whole by providing more incentives to private sector entities to invest more in gender sensitive, age friendly and digital, I mean, disability inclusive for digital technologies. It could be some tax exemptions, but I think there could be more other forms of incentives. We should encourage all players in the ecosystem including device manufacturers and content developers to adhere the universal design principle to ensure accessibility for all, including those with disabilities. It is important to involve persons with disabilities in the entire development cycle of policy making, digital products and technological services. I think, I mean, Professor Gordon I mentioned this already about a people-centric approach. As you can see from some good practices I share from Singapore, a sustainable financing framework to support tech solution for all the persons with disabilities need to be established. Likewise, we still need improved data disaggregation and disability among all the persons. We have to accept that we still lack of such information of such data. And lastly, we should enhance regional cooperation to ensure that leads Disability issues are mainstream across different policy areas. We like to see share the sharing of good practice and lesson learn more and more and develop partnerships, especially between with, I mean, CSO, international organizations and private sectors, including the governments. So this is the portal or the dashboard that we developed so far on population data. There we have some demographic data of member states, the national policies and good practice that we receive from member states through surveys mainly. I would encourage you to, to have a look. And lastly, to 
promote some recent publication on aging we have developed so far. Please come visiting the website and hope they are helpful and useful for your work on aging. And lastly, thank you very much again, and please stay in touch and work together to enhance the quality of life of older persons. In the meantime, I may not be able to join until the Q&A, but would like to follow up with the organizer afterwards. Thanks again for having me. Thank you so much uh, for a very, very big, big, I think you gave, gave a very big picture about what is happening in the Asia region and sharing those uh, you know, experiences of uh, countries, particularly Singapore and other countries are very, very useful. We are also happy that you are reaching out to old age home, I'm sorry, Senior Citizen Association to draw data. And I'm sure uh, countries like India and China could be a big contributor to uh, you in terms of numbers. I think both put together has a huge number. And I'm sure uh, LPH should be able to, LPH India should be able to reach out to at least in India and other countries. And I'm sure this data would be very, very useful for all of us to use over a period of time. And thanks, thank you very much for seeking, uh, you know, inter cooperation among the regional you know, organizations. And I'm sure, I think what Helpage has done is brought a lot of us together today for this conference itself is a good support. Uh, you know, we are all extending to each other. Thanks once again for being, in, you know, part of our event. Yeah, we will probably miss you. Uh, the number of speakers are going to be two more in case you are able to be there, it's fine, otherwise, I think I'm sure uh, Anupama from Helpage India should be able to connect with you. Thanks once again for being amongst us. Thank you very much. So we go to the next speaker. Anupama, you have a question? So we have a question after this, but uh, I think you can go with the next speaker. Okay, fair enough. So now we have uh, the next speaker is going to be Professor Manish Kumar Astana, Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Roorkee. And uh, he has come forward to talk on, you know, uh, disability, older persons, information technology, design and use, innovation for dealing with hesitation and resistance. I had a wonderful, uh, you know, talk with him the other day, understood what he is interested in doing and what he has done. Nice to have a lot of people like him getting into this field that makes People like us who have been working for probably two, three, four decades makes it more interesting for us to get onto it because so much is being spoken about aging. And I'm very happy that you know you are going to talk about this very important subject among us. And over to you, Dr. Astara. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gangadhar, for your uh, nice introduction. And uh, uh, I wish uh, th um, I thank you, uh, Help Age India, for giving me this opportunity to share. Today, with you, uh, with all of you, uh, my understanding um, with elderly and disability. I also want to thank all the speakers this morning because I could see that they have uh, tried to address and narrow down all the um, perspectives related to elderly and uh, disability. Um, and uh, this is a very, very crucial topic these days. In my presentation, um, I will just give you a brief overview. I will try to wrap the things uh, in 10 minutes, 10 to 12 minutes, so that the, the other speakers uh, won't have any issue. So aging disability, I will start with then aging in India, uh, information and communication technology, and aging, how it is uh, moving ahead, healthy aging, and then accessible innovations, and elderly, elderly innovative um, assisted innovations, which are there. Uh, but before we uh, move ahead, it is very important for us to understand that this term disability, how people have defined it. So World Health Organization has tried to uh, define this um, and consider this as an umbrella term. Why it is an umbrella term? Because it is talking about the impairment. It is talking about the activity limitations uh, of the individuals and participation restrictions, which means how well they are participating in the society, how well they are participating in the community and how uh, their participation is uh, making their lives and uh, subjective well-being uh, a meaningful uh, uh, contribution. So if you talk about the impairment, it's an impairment um, is a problem in a body function or a structure. Uh, activity limitation, as I mentioned, difficulty in encountering individual and executing tasks or actions. Participation uh, involvement in the life situation. 
So this disability uh, phenomenon, if you see, it's a very complex um, uh, process reflecting uh, how the interaction will be there in person's body, individual's um, uh, approach within the society and how he or she is doing it. So this uh, uh, participation or activity has been defined as activities of daily living, ADL, which is very, very popular. And some of our speakers have tried to address it in dementia or in Parkinson's or Alzheimer. These things people uh, do face problem and common problems are there where individual self-care is a prime concern where elderly are uh, you know requires an assistance and that is how the primary caregiver secondary caregiver uh, comes into role and uh, as earlier speakers have talked about that these are the also avenue where the one has to look into second is the instrumental activities of daily living how an elderly can do such some uh, common activities so that they can engage themselves uh, to the community and engage themselves uh, in preparing a meal or communicating, making a phone call to an individual or managing a household things. Uh, the importance of uh, elderly and uh, disability can be understood with the uh, United Nations uh, um, uh, 17 uh, sustainable goals. And these uh, sustainable goals, if I uh, list down here, three sustainable goals which are important here to this uh, 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 symposium is uh, first the goal number three, which is related to good health and well-being of uh, all the individuals, um, including the elderly and the normal individuals. Uh, secondary, industry innovations and infrastructures related to make the society a more sustainable society so that individuals can um, uh, ha may have an easiness and uh, uh, and uh, the uh, goal number 11 sustainable societies and communities where com community help each other and um, uh, can um, help the individuals in a um, uh, easy way so this brings me uh, to talk uh, to narrow down this topic to India because in, in Indian context it is very important for us to understand the scenario and according to the United Nations Population Fund um, data, you can see that this is the age uh, elderly distribution. And by 2050, it is estimated that approximately 350 uh, million people uh, will be uh, elderly. And this uh, data is very alarming uh, for us because we are in 2023 uh, and in 27 years, uh, this, uh, the huge population uh, will be uh, uh, handling it as an elderly. And if you see an uh, distribution of these elderly individuals, then you will see that in Kerala, the percentage is very, very high. That is 22.8%. And that is why I uh, see that the dementia care system or dementia related studies, uh, the, the government has started to address it so that in the in the next 20 years uh, line, 2025 years of line, they can come up with a robust methodology, robust uh, infrastructure to address such issues. Uh, we should not uh, rule out the fact that the other nation, uh, other uh, states are also very soon going to uh, fall in, into this trap. Now, the problem uh, which it could result into it is that the uh, physical activity problem when the uh, elderly, huge number of in, um, uh, elderly population is there in a country, then physical activity, cognitive activity, uh, nutritional problems, social engagement, mental health, all these things, you know, collectively going to uh, fall short. And they may affect the, uh, not only the uh, uh, aging, but healthy aging. Um, so uh, an elderly who is uh, becoming an elderly, the problem is that all these uh, components, uh, which um, uh, earlier panelists have also addressed upon, that these things they are okay, going to face. And our objective, our task is that how well we understand the problem, how well we are identifying the problem, and what prevention measures we are going to come up with as um, uh, we have to uh, address it. Otherwise, we may have a uh, lot of uh, several issues. So I would like to share a study which we published published last year uh, uh, from our lab that was on information and communication technology adoption among the elderly uh, people, uh, elderly individuals. And this was a qualitative study which we did. 
and uh, uh, we published in Wiley. What what do we know uh, uh, till date uh, is that cognitive impairment is there in the elderly, and this cognitive impairment uh, comprises of visual search ability to uh, search the environment, uh, attentional span. Uh, they lack attentional span. They cannot pay attention to certain tasks. Working memory is uh, being compromised. Information processing slows down. Um, um, how to respond, how to process information, how to select, uh, how to distinguish problem solving, language processing, even in understanding. So such aspects uh, uh, has been, uh, uh, we know that uh, are playing crucial role in uh, with the elderly. Elderly uh, also, elders reflect upon the low self-efficacy also, you know, uh, under confidence because the chances of the, they feel uh, the, the hesitation is at the chance of error. I may do something and I may end up in um, doing something error. So, uh, or uh, handling a novel technology uh, is also uh, the difficulty, the challenges, their understanding, technological literacy, all these things seem to have a play a major role in this in this regard. Then the interfaces also, which we see these days, like it is very easy for us to interact with the technology um, doing a uh, online call. But for elderly, uh, these interfaces are not so user friendly. They may be uh, friendly to young individuals, young adults. However, for the uh, elderly, they are they seem to be have certain challenges. Also, what do we know about is their needs, expectations, uh, physical and cognitive limitations. We are very well uh, aware of, but the uh, technology uh, and the people who are doing the novel innovation, the inventions which are coming into the market, they uh, seem to have been ignorant about uh, the um, physical and cognitive limitations of the elderly. Hence, with this uh, article, we try to highlight such or, um, one of the uh, few of those elements and uh, factors so that people may understand there, ne there is a need to design a user-friendly interface, which uh, may not be uh, uh, helpful for the elderly, but can provide an easiness, can uh, provide an easiness to use the technology. So the elderly class which we selected in this is, uh, for this study was from 60 years to 75 years uh, of age. And here we try to incorporate individuals, uh, elderly individuals from a uh, few states as we have listed down here from West Bengal, Bihar, NCR, Tamil Nadu, Maharaj, Jharkhand, Uttar Pradesh even. Though the sample we limited ourselves to 20, however, we... Uh, these 20 uh, data sample reflected upon many, many uh, factors and very important variables which are playing role in, uh, uh, in the elderly interacting with the information and computation, uh, communication technology. Uh, how these uh, technological limitations are impacting, how these technological uh, communications are affecting their need, satisfying their need, um, uh, was few uh, elements which we have tried to highlight and uh, explored here in this study. There were several sub themes we have identified in this, but we tried to cluster them, uh, all these uh, sub -theme, uh, themes into four major themes, as you can see on your screen. So these four major themes which we, uh, we talked about um, were usability of ICT, anxiety and privacy concern, self-perception of technology use, need for assistance and inclusive design. So if you, if I uh, just uh, share a few of those responses from the participants, uh, when they were being asked how well and accustomed they are with the technology, how frequently they use the technology, uh, do are they feeling comfortable with the technology? What are the challenges they uh, face with the technology? Do they have any sort of anxiety in using the technology? So such the few thing, a few individuals mentioned that they feel uh, they they feel that they are not able to understand what to do next in the technology, how to uh, um, handle a technology like a simple uh, payment app from a UPI. Well, it seems to be a little uh, bit very difficult and tricky for them to understand um, um, uh, have a challenging task for them. So this uh, uh, they mentioned that they need uh, seek help. They need help. Who can guide them step by step? What they have to do next. 
So with this, we easily understand that, okay, the challenges are that there should be some helpful uh, guide or helpful mechanism should be there, chatbot should be there, which can help them in a stepwise manner uh, so that they, can, they feel easiness. A few individuals said that I'm not able to learn anything with this technology, even though I try to, uh, my fingers go here and there, I'm not able to learn how to use these applications. The applications, easy applications like Facebook or WhatsApp to make call to their dear ones, to, uh, to uh, con uh, get connected over phone call, how to uh, use the different uh, software applications, um, how to do a simple chat, uh, using a ch simple chat uh, uh, bot uh, to, to do a chatting. Such um, uh, limitations they, uh, they uh, highlighted in this study. They also, uh, a few individuals said that they feel that uh, during uh, the, the, uh, all these things during our young uh, age or childhood were not there. So uh, we we are not so sure how to use them. If these things would have been uh, present to us in our childhood, then probably it would not have been a problem. Um, so what we now find, they also mentioned what we now find is that there is no problem with social media, but the problem is with us to feel hesitant. How uh, we to use this thing, how to explore these things, how to interact uh, with this thing, even uh, we know that it is giving us a lot of opportunities to interact, to get connected to person sitting in Kanyakumari uh, or uh, sitting in uh, uh, Jammu Kashmir to get connected. But we still, I feel hesitant and doubtful how to use this technology. Somebody might be recording me. Somebody might be uh, using this information uh, and going to use it for an evil uh, purpose. So such hesitation seems to be there in the elderly. They uh, some also said that that I think for uh, for the things I don't understand. But if there will be a training module, then I could expose myself to these technology. If there will be something which can guide everything, like uh, FAQs is there, which can provide us a lot of questions, a lot of queries are being answered in that FAQs. So these questions, uh, uh, these responses from the individuals um, um, were being collected and there were several sub themes were there, but major, we tried to club them into four major themes. So usability of ICT. One thing we, we at least uh, understand is that these individuals feel hesitant, the usability, uh, uh, the, uh, the easiness to use, it seems to be a little challenging for them. The technology, the uh, designers, may not be paying a lot of attention uh, that the users can be an elderly, the elderly who is 60 uh, and above years of age and may not have, may, may be encountering the technology for the first time. Uh, then some uh, also uh, designers have to understand the privacy concern is an important thing. So these days, a lot of technological tools do come up with the privacy uh, feature, uh, but still there should be some mechanism there should be some uh, uh, understanding, some uh, assistance should be provided, which can provide them information that their interaction will be more and more private at such platform and full privacy will be provided to them. Their self-perception over the years have uh, seemed to decrease because of their uh, isolation, ostracism, and uh, their loneliness. They spend a lot of their time in uh, loneliness. They spend a lot of their time in social isolation. So this seems to have um, um, uh, giving them uh, a self-perception about that they may not be using the technology. And if they will use a the technology, then they may end up in doing some error, which may result into disasters. Another important aspect which uh, uh, has been highlighted is all these designs, all these uh, existing designs in the market doesn't seem to be inclusive in nature. And that is why inclusivity seems to be a part to it. And the, uh, the, the social inclusion uh, need to be addressed in a strong and robust way and need to be uh, discussed at uh, uh, every platform. Though uh, we are talking about, uh, though we have started talking about the mental health and um, inclusivity uh, post COVID, but post COVID also uh, suggested us that increase in these uh, challenges by the elderly. 
has uh, tremendously, uh, tremendously and exponentially increased. So elderly are facing a lot of challenges post-COVID scenario. So uh, when we are talking, so these things, uh, we, we uh, address it, we are talking about that there is a need for healthy aging. There is a need to provide a support. There is a need to uh, provide the support to these elderly so that their uh, self-esteem, um, well-being should get enhanced and promoted. So according to WHO, the process of developing and maintaining the functional ability uh, uh, that enables well-being in an older age is the healthy aging. And there are several um, uh, things one, in, one can uh, pursue, such as promoting the physical activity, promoting the cognitive activity, providing good nutrition. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the survey, several uh, survey reports have highlighted that increase in elderly population is mo uh, mostly from the rural area. Increase in elderly population is from the low socioeconomic uh, status is there, which means that providing good nutrition is uh, should be of a prime concern also. And this way we may uh, target the aging as well. Social engagement, how well and socially people can engage and mental health promotion can be done. Um, then, uh, I will just come to the few slides here, uh, like as you can see on the screen, some of the nice in, uh, inventions are like this intuition robot. Intuition robotics uh, is a very nice initiative which provides and gives a reminder to the elderly to get connected to their uh, relatives, dear ones from time to time in a span of time. So they should not feel socially isolated. They do not feel social uh, rejection. They do not feel lonely. Um, in this regard, when they are uh, using a technology going to an ATM machine, then some assistive technology like auditory uh, system or auditory mechanism can be provided along with tactile perception. Using virtual virtual reality can provide and promote the cognitive enhancement. The, the uh, and virtual reality technology is not that expensive in the modern world because it can be in, uh, used with the mobile technology also. Then uh, ageless innovations, such as using puppets, uh, such as uh, toys, which can from time to time can uh, uh, provide a comfort, uh, coziness to the elderly, that there is some uh, somebody near and around them. Robotic arm can provide an assistance to those individuals who are seem to be having some sort of motor problem or a motor disability. Then uh, emergency mobile health system, emergency system, uh, a small gadget which can, they put it as a locket in their, uh, around their neck, they may go around. And in the case of emergency, just uh, pressing a small button can alarm uh, the individuals or uh, their caregivers or somebody sitting uh, far apart from them. Uh, then another technology like TeleHD, which is also come uh, into the market, providing assistive uh, way that an elderly can get connected to the dear one uh, via Skype, Zoom, or uh, Google Meet uh, video calls, so that they may get connected. So they should not feel socially isolated. And another technology is the um, uh, digital uh, medi uh, medicine chambers, which can from time to time remind these individuals about their medication. Because a lot of the, in the case of progressive diseases, in the case of um, uh, elderly diseases, a lot of comorbid diseases are also there in elderly. So they have to rely on their medication. If they do not, then it may result into uh, other um, problems. So these digital uh, tools uh, can also provide an assistance to them. Such uh, technologies are already there in the market. Uh, there is a need for us to get connected. There is a need for us to identify. There is a need to make these devices cost effective and little cheaper and uh, affordable. Because uh, um, uh, if they are affordable, if they are accessible, then large uh, number of uh, audience can uh, use it. And seeing the data set uh, from uh, the United uh, uh, States uh, that by 2050, we will be having 350 million individuals uh, as elderly, such technologies need to be affordable and uh, available to the individuals. With this, I rest my case here. Thank you all for listening to me patiently. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Manish Kumar Astana, for bringing in an innovation across understanding 
among all the people and also talking extensively about healthy aging and also having a sort of a scenario planning of the technology innovation some of which probably are available in india i think when we are talking about a lot of startup i think lot of companies in india are slowly coming up to manufacture some of these items though the, their efficacy will take long time to prove but i think indian, indian innovations are also good and i'm very hopeful that the points that you covered particularly use of ict the, the four aspects that you covered are so relevant and then very important among all that you mentioned i think is where that current products do not meet the needs of the current elderly population with disability and i'm very sure you know an attention could be given to this aspect and um, some of those tools that you used to explain to us a scenario, a scenario planning with your data of a qualitative study that you did and i'm very sure you have enlightened us in the group to understand what really happens and i look forward to the last speaker the two speakers have not been able to come the last speaker comes in and before that person comes in anupama comes in Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. <laughs> Thank you. The final poll for the day, for Doctor, that will be a in like you know a pointer for Doctor Kavita because. Uh, yeah, yeah. Doctor Kavita has come up here. Yeah, so Kavita yes, just uh, yeah. hold on, hold on, hold on. Just yeah. give us one minute for the poll to uh, come on the screen. and please resist the temptation to mark the last option as your option <laughs> this is this is to test how how uh, you know um, focused we are in our thinking and how well we can make our choices it's very easy to say all the above but what do you think is the most important thing in these points that we have listed here Yes, Dr. Kavita must be enjoying those questions and responses. Yes, uh, I'm eagerly waiting to see what is the response. <laughs> quickly note down. Quickly note down, Dr. Kavita. all of them oh <laughs> indeed yeah uh, since anupama and inclusive a, inclusive green and blue space so anupama sir. made a particular request i decided to fill in that <laughs> but anyway um yeah, that's good. That's good. we'll just Thanks. take it off we'll just take it off yeah so you are going to uh, okay now let me tell you very interesting person that i interacted few days ago dr kavita and uh, Very nice that she has done a lot of work on futuristic design of population aging in India, and very interesting. Also, she told me that you know she travels quite a bit in the country. That means she knows what's happening not only in Pune but across the country. And uh, she also told me that she's doing. They are doing a lot of work, and she very proudly talks about more than thousand facilities in this country which are you know smart you know smart city pro you know programs that are very disabled friendly. and i'm very sure i think our input in this particular conference this is the last speaker for the speakers are not able to come i'm sure she is going to close it with the, the data that anupama has now provided her thank you i uh, invite dr kavita to take over thank you so much gangadharan sir for the generous uh, introduction and uh, i must start by thanking helpage india for including me in this uh, uh, you know important deliberation today and uh, i have been able to on and off uh, listen to other speakers as well since morning and i think uh, uh, important dimensions about uh, um, you know uh, designing future or uh, you know uh, understanding the current issues uh, uh, that are grappling uh, you know the daily lives of uh, daily living of uh, senior citizens in our country have been touched upon and um, i look forward to now uh, i mean since 
most of the day was about talking uh, talking about uh, what a what are the current challenges and uh, you know why uh, focusing on aging population is important um i think um, uh, many speakers uh, talked about you know the whole issue of uh, usability of products and services um uh, that is becoming challenging for senior citizens i would like to focus on how to do it i mean the design uh, uh, of uh, assistive technologies assistive devices uh, ict solutions that uh, senior citizens can use uh, is has emerged as a critical aspect from today's deliberation and i would like to focus on you know uh, what needs to be kept in mind while designing uh, such solutions for senior citizens uh, as we move uh, towards uh, the future that uh, uh, we want to uh, create, uh, uh, which which can address their needs. Uh, in fact, our needs, as uh, we are also aging and we are going to be, of course, the beneficiaries of such kind of systems and facilities uh, uh, in the environment around us. So let me share the screen. Um, uh, may I uh, ask the sign language in interpreter if my speed uh, of talking is uh, comfortable for you. Is it comfortable? Yeah, get... Yes. Okay, yes. great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am, it is. Okay, thanks. Yes, yeah, so uh, I too have some context setting slides uh, to start with. Um, I'm not going, most of it has been discussed before, so I'm not going to spend much time on this. So I will quickly go through these just to reinforce and uh, build up the case. So yes, our challenges for the future are, you know, amongst the other important ones. Um, the growing aging population is, of course, one of the uh, challenges uh, in the, uh, for the future. And hence, um, of course, even the sustainable development goals, as uh, Professor Astana mentioned, um, are uh, uh, putting a lot of emphasis on creating uh, sustainable uh, cities and communities, and uh, you know, reducing inequalities, uh, and um, uh, focusing on good health and well-being, uh, uh, well-being which, uh, uh, which of course includes. Uh, the principal beneficiary as uh, senior citizens or, uh, you know, and, and uh, if we look uh, deeper into the sustainable development goals, uh, just to give an example, the UNSDG uh, target 11.2 mentions that by 2030, uh, all these state parties have to provide access to safe and affordable, accessible, sustainable transport systems uh, that, that consider or that address the needs of uh, all kinds of vulnerable groups, including uh, persons with disabilities and senior citizens. Um, statistics also has been discussed since morning, and we are, uh, you know, looking at the uh, number, uh, the numbers or percentage of aging population uh, growing, uh, multiplying in the coming years. So by 2100, we are uh, uh, we are projecting that about 3.1 billion uh, senior citizens will be, uh, you know, uh, on this planet. And then the global life expectancy, which is also increased, which may be a good news that we will be longer, uh, you know, uh, inhabitants of this planet. But what would be the quality of life is definitely questionable. And uh, we are going to go through, uh, you know, um, a lot of uh, functional limitations, disabilities may be a part of our life uh, uh, since, uh, uh, you know, the quality of life that we are going to live is, is questionable considering the kind of uh, uh, climate uh, impact uh, and environmental impact we have created because of the uh, uh, questionable lifestyle that we all are living and the kind of carbon footprint we are creating, the kind of uh, carbon em emissions we are doing and the pollution around us. Um, so it is projected that by 2050, one fifth of the world's population is going to be aging. But interestingly, India, if you look at this uh, particular uh, uh, graph, which talks about the speed of population aging, India seems to be the, having the steepest curve of increasing, uh, you know, aging population. Uh, we have been so far uh, able to survive on a model of, I would say, interdependence, where our senior citizens 
uh, in within our families have got support from the younger members of the family but uh, as we are moving towards more and more nuclear families and uh, you know number of family members per se are in decreasing uh, within a family unit uh, of course i mean uh, you know uh, moving towards and designing a more independent uh, dense based model for daily living would have to be kept in mind uh, as we may not have uh, such kind of young helping hands in the future to come um so and and uh, uh, like again discussed since morning uh, aging uh, mimics disability and it is also uh, uh, you know has been established that one in four uh, senior citizens have a severe disability that means uh, a lot of assistance uh, is going to be required uh talking about uh, you know how the environment impacts senior citizens uh and what are uh, is there any relation uh, uh, uh in terms of the you know the connection between the environment and uh, the mortality rate uh, of senior citizens uh it it is observed that uh, if you look at this graph the falls are the major reasons for uh you know uh, uh deaths uh, of senior uh, citizens early deaths and uh, that's the second leading cause uh, of accidental death worldwide and uh, within the causes of falls uh, environmental defects or you know uh, wrong specifications or wrong design of the environment be it you know uh, maybe slippery tiles or you know and uh, i mean reflective floors or sharp corners uh many such kind of uh, uh, wrongly designed uh, spaces and specifications that are put in by designers and architects are definitely leading to more and more falls and accidents within uh, senior citizens so it really becomes very important uh, when we talk about the physical environment that uh, you know uh, say a senior citizen friendly or age age friendly specifications are incorporated um most of the times i mean uh, the the conventional design uh, is based on the able so called able bodied people but the invisible sections of the society which of course includes the aged as well uh, are are most of the times ignored or you know uh, are are left out uh, and that that really becomes uh, challenging uh, uh, as it creates uh, it limits the equal participation and uh, Uh, uh uh you know equal choices for uh, most of the dis disadvantaged uh, sections of the society and uh, if if uh, we talk about uh, uh, the aging population um, persons with disabilities uh, within the uh, population of persons with disabilities uh, the aging population would be the highest and uh, like i said i mean aging mimics disability Uh, i'm not going to go through you know how it is impacting because it's uh, aging impacts uh, uh, the functional uh, performance of an individual it's been discussed since morning so i will skip these slides but i would like to go directly to uh, something called universal design because uh, what has been discussed is uh, the need of a design uh, that caters to uh, the diversity of uh, the population uh which also includes uh the vulnerable population such as um you know senior citizens at one end and children maybe at the other end and seen and persons with disabilities so we need designs uh in the future uh, that work uh, uh that are usable for all kinds of people whether it they are 4 or 94 years of age and uh the design approach that we really need to focus on uh, is the universal design approach you know what is universal design so universal design is a design approach that caters to the needs of all kinds of people irrespective of their differences be it age be it uh, uh gender be it uh, you know uh, uh the economical background or the cultural background or language or uh, uh any form of uh, disability um and it uh it is it can be achieved by uh, incorporating seven principles so uh, these are popularly called as principles of universal design the whole concept of universal design uh is not very old uh, it it was uh founded by an uh, architect himself who was uh, who was a who was a senior citizen as well as wheelchair user ronald mas 
from the North Carolina State University. And uh, uh, he uh, proposed these uh, seven principles along with a group of experts. Um, and these uh, principles, I would say, are applicable to any uh, niche of design, be it product, be it uh, a, a, a ICT solution, be it a service, be it a built environment. Uh, so either it, uh, even if, uh, I mean, uh, all forms of uh, infrastructure, be it physical or digital, uh, these principles are applicable to uh, all kinds of design development or design initiatives that are taken. And if these are uh, kept in mind while uh, in the, uh, designing right from the concept stage, uh, then certainly the products that we, or the solutions that we will come up to uh, would ensure that they work for all kinds of people, including the senior citizens. So I would be taking uh, all of you through these seven principles one by one with uh, uh, some examples to elaborate on uh, how they work. Uh, the first principle that you can see on the screen is the principle of equitable use. Um, it means that whatever design uh, is, is being created, it has to be uh, equally usable by everyone and usable in the same way, offering the same level of privacy, security, safety, convenience, and dignity, right? Uh, and hence, if you can see, uh, I mean, uh, the uh, example in the form of the picture is showing an arrangement of steps as well as ramps uh, arranged together. Uh, uh, both are uh, different expressions of, uh, you know, inclusion uh, in terms of offering choices for uh, the user uh, as per his uh, or her physical need. Uh, and and uh, they are they are juxtaposed in the same space adjoining each other, so offering the same level of dignity as well and not really compromising with one's, uh, uh, you know, right uh, uh, for equal choice. Uh, these are some other examples like, uh, for instance, this uh, particular uh, uh, reception table or, you know, counter that you can see. Now, you have counters everywhere. Um, so, uh, a, a small uh, design intervention like lowering a part of the uh, counter uh, to a height that caters to maybe children or to senior citizens who may, uh, you know, uh, be having a, 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 a gait uh, which is uh, more of a bending posture or a person, a uh, senior citizen who is using a uh, wheelchair. Uh, it works for all kinds of people, right? Uh, similarly, on the right side are uh, some other kind of interventions within the uh, uh, within the built environment, where uh, on the first uh, on the top you see uh, 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 the Museum of uh, Hong Kong, uh, where uh, escalators as well as uh, a staircase as well as a lift has been provided in the same space to offer choices. So equitable use become becomes a uh, you know, a uh, basic principle, I would say, a founding foundational principle that ensures that uh, all kinds of needs are incorporated. Then the second principle would be flexibility in use. Uh, this principle accommodates a wide range of individual preferences and abilities, again, uh, offering alternative ways of use. Um, uh, it, it acknowledges that the user could be, uh, again, a child or a senior citizen or a, a wheelchair user, um, uh, and uh, uh, accordingly gives, you know, uh, again, a wide range of choices. Uh, uh, some of the uh, examples are here. So just a simple uh, design decision of lowering, uh, you know, um, taps uh, in maybe a public bathroom uh, at two different levels uh, opens up the usability option in an equal way for, uh, you know, uh, different age groups. The third principle, uh, which I would say, uh, you know, is extremely important considering senior citizens is that the product or the design has to be simple and intuitive in use, which means that the design, the use of the design has to be easy to understand, regardless of the user's experience, knowledge, language skills, or current concentration level. So particularly, for example, uh, uh, senior citizens, uh, individuals, uh, uh, having dementia or Alzheimer, who are having memory loss, uh, uh, would would definitely uh, find uh, designs uh, which are intuitive to use uh, very friendly. 
um, there are again some examples which are shown here. Uh, the peeler, for instance, is the first example which helps in uh, reducing the amount of force that is required uh, uh, to, to uh, peel vegetables uh, in a kitchen and can certainly give a better grip as well. Uh, similarly, designs of uh, you know daily living objects like say a mug here uh, is again you know with, with the uh, with a nice uh, 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 handle that understands the ergonomics uh, of uh, uh, of uh, you know a human hand and the fingers uh, helps to again get a better grip and of course I mean for for people who have uh, 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 trembling hands. Uh, particularly uh, in in the uh, fag end of the life, definitely helps uh, in a big way. As well as the uh, here another example of the eyedropper with a simple kind of a uh, uh, assistive feature, uh, which makes uh, you know uh, uh, use of an eyedropper uh, independent uh, for the particular user. The fourth principle is perceptible information. So moving forward, designs should be. Uh, such that they communicate necessary information effectively to the user, regardless of the ambient conditions or the user's sensory abilities. So um, uh, uh, with, with aging, there is going to be vision loss and one might uh, have to depend uh, on uh, tactile perception as well as audio perception uh, 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 in case of diminished eyesight. Uh, for navigating in the built environment or for receiving any form of communication. Uh, you know. So um, good color coding within the built environment, uh, providing directional signs, uh, giving extra information in terms of, you know, the amount of uh, steps to be uh, climbed up or uh, the, uh, the amount of duration of, uh, you know, walking distance that one might have to cover. Uh, puts a lot of power into the user's hand to make a decision in terms of whether one wants to do it or not do it, etc. Similarly, for a person uh, uh, without vision, uh, a tactile guiding path that is laid down in the floor becomes in, uh, a, a, a navigational feature uh, to help independent movement around the building. Uh, the fifth principle is tolerance for error, uh, which means uh, design uh, should be such that it mean, it understands that uh, errors can happen uh, inward inadvertently and uh, it should be such that it minimizes hazards and uh, adverse consequences that sometimes can be fatal um, uh, so it could be you know tripping down uh, the steps uh, or uh, losing uh, you know uh, or, or just kidding on a floor wet floor or something like that so providing textural uh, uh, edges, uh, color co uh, contrast edge strips uh, on, on steps, providing handrails uh, in uh, uh, along sloping, uh, sloping areas uh, or, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, or uh, handrails uh, in long corridors, uh, uh, particularly in environments uh, which may have a larger footfall of senior citizens. Uh, would would definitely uh, be um, uh, you know uh, an example of incorporating this principle of tolerance for error. Uh, the sixth principle is low physical effort. Again, uh, this principle acknowledges that uh, you know not everybody has the same level of energy, and uh, with aging, uh, of course, the physical stamina uh, is is anticipated to go down, and uh, uh, more. Uh, uh, efficiently, uh, I mean, uh, 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 energy saving um, uh, features within the built environment uh, would create a, a more comfortable environment for senior citizens and would also end up in minimum fatigue. And hence, examples of, you know, handrails, which are simple uh, as against, I mean, uh, sorry, handles, which are simple to use, like the one on the right side, Such kind of features or you know broad uh, hand tools uh, or large size hand tools, which uh, again allow better grip, uh, can help in creating more comfort and reduce the anxiety or the stress that builds up with uh, clumsy or difficult to use uh, or sophisticated uh, 
uh, tools to use for senior citizens. Uh, and the seventh and the last principle is size and space for approach and use, which uh, becomes very critical for uh, particularly for uh, uh, senior citizens who are using mobility devices. So um, appropriate size and space for should be uh, provided for approach, reach, manipulation and use um, in all areas. So it could be um, outdoor features or indoor features. It could be uh, you know the corridor widths or the door uh, widths or the windowsill heights or the sizes of the toilets uh, or the mounting heights of drinking water fountains or like in uh, in this picture on the left you can see the uh, you know simple gesture of reducing the telescope height in a tourist spot uh, enables a, a, a tourist uh, using wheelchair to uh, uh, to enjoy the views around uh, using the tool provided. Uh, and few more examples like uh, providing the handrail at two different heights, again, helps uh, numerous uh, types of users and in increases the usability range. So uh, these are the seven principles that uh, have been incorporated in the few examples that you also saw, uh, which, which were shown by the previous speakers. Uh, and uh, uh, keeping these in mind while going ahead, uh, would I would say uh, become the main uh, uh, guidelines for futuristic designs for aging population. Uh, if I have uh, some more time with me, uh, Ganga Dharan sir, I have few slides to talk about particular uh, uh, age-friendly features uh, in a residential environment. Uh, if not, I can conclude. If it's going to be a few minutes, you can go ahead. Though we are almost yes, I'll quickly. Yeah, yeah, I quickly uh, go through uh, these slides, though there are quite a few. So, um, I mean, uh, like I said, uh, these principles need to be incorporated, uh, can be incorporated in physical as well as digital environments. Uh, but uh, these uh, slides, which I'm going to be showing now, uh, are talking about the design of a physical environment, considering uh, senior citizens. So, uh, for instance, uh, uh, in the outdoor environment, we have a lot of walkways, and uh, of course, I mean, slopes are difficult to navigate, to negotiate for senior citizens. So uh, avoiding slopes, avoiding steps would be uh, the best solution uh, going forward. But if at all there are slopes, then they need to be very gradual and they have to have the uh, appropriate slope, which is one in 15 or more. Um, uh, joints should be minimal and, uh, you know, uh, cobbles, uh, I mean, rough flooring like cobbles should be avoided. Um, uh, Needless to say, handrails become really very uh, useful. Um, coming to the entrances, again, a step-free entrance helps everyone, not just senior citizens, and can uh, reduce the uh, whole stress of you know climbing up, climbing down, and uh, the kind of accidental hazards that come uh, along with it. Um, the legibility of the signage uh, is extremely important, considering the diminishing eyesight that comes with aging. So large nameplates with high color contrast, visible from far, uh, can be very useful and can definitely uh, make uh, uh, you know uh, signages readable for senior citizens even from a distance. Of course, I mean good lighting needs to be ensured to make the uh, signage uh, legible. Um, entrances or walkways, long walkways, corridors, uh, where there are long uh, walking distances. Uh, should be interspersed with uh, resting points, seating arrangements uh, for senior citizens and uh, uh, particularly uh, transitional spaces should have these uh, resting points. Uh, avoid physical barriers like curb steps and uh, slippery flooring materials or change in flooring material, which can also create confusion for senior citizens. Um, uh, I've talked about handles, so simple lever handles or C-shaped handles as against lever, uh, you know, uh, uh, round knobs uh, serves uh, really uh, well and can uh, increase the comfort level to a large extent. Um, coming to, uh, you know, the living spaces, so as much as an open plan, spacious and barrier-free barrier rooms with good light and ventilation, uh, would ensure uh, 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 a much uh, more comfortable environment. Uh, the, the spaces in between the furniture should be such that uh, uh, enough maneuvering space is provided, particularly considering a wheelchair. 
um, and clear path of travel uh, to be uh, ensured by keeping the spaces clutter free. Uh, natural light, like I have already emphasized. Um, then coming to counters. So counters should be at a height that is easy to use. So while designing uh, uh, kitchens or while designing uh, uh, toilets, uh, wash basin counters uh, need to be uh, uh, or, or drinking water fount uh, or drinking water fountains in uh, public areas need to be such that they have uh, blunt corners, rounded edges, as well as heights that are uh, easily uh, uh, usable by a range of people. And if possible, provided at different heights would definitely address more uh, large, uh, you know, age group. Um, again, clear floor space, uh, clear, uh, you know, um, uh, segregation between uh, wet areas, dry areas, um, and ensuring that uh, uh, there is uh, there are no level differences uh, within these spaces. Living spaces can again minimize a lot of hazards. Um, cabinets uh, should be such that they are uh, you know uh, they are soft closing. They should have uh, uh, drawer units if they are should have good color contrast between them. Uh, which uh, should have handles which are again easily usable uh, and have provide good grips um, and um, uh, again within uh, uh, bedrooms uh, maneuvering space becomes extremely important because nowadays uh, I mean sensors are used uh, to operate uh, control mechanisms be it switches or um, uh, any other uh, you know, uh, digital solution within a house uh, so uh, building informational uh, modeling BIM that we call as in our industry uh, becomes very important to create uh, uh, age-friendly uh, living conditions. Um, emergency systems uh, also are e extremely important. So uh, positioning uh, emergency alarm switches near maybe beds and toilets or uh, vulnerable areas uh, would definitely be one important thing uh, designers should keep in mind. Um, uh, door should be easy to use and should open inside and outside considering that, uh, you know, uh, uh, one may uh, have a fall and may have to be evacuated um, uh, easily uh, without further, uh, uh, further uh, uh, you know, uh, impact. And hence, uh, uh, providing double uh, uh, Two-way opening doors is something that is recommended. Of course, sliding doors are also another option. Um, mirrors positioned uh, in a in a way that they are tilted so that you know uh, one and and mounted at an appropriate height, and uh, which also allow a better light uh, uh, and uh, you know uh, more more uh, uh, visible environment is uh, something that is recommended. Uh, toilets should be such that uh, wheelchair uh, movement is possible and, and hence an accessible toilet feature, uh, uh, accessible toilet uh, should be kept in mind while designing toilets for senior citizens. Uh, these toilets necessarily should have grab bars like you can see in these images. So there are grab bars around wash basins. These grab bars are also uh, movable or flexible, uh, foldable. Uh, so that it allows, it does not obstruct space, but allows different ways of usage. Um, they could be provided near the uh, wash areas, bathing areas as well for better grip and for avoiding accidents or falls. Um, uh, faucets again should have uh, lever uh, mechanisms uh, as against knob or turning uh, uh, models, uh, which again require a, a high level of skill as well as uh, you know, strength. Uh, tactile wedding paths in corridors and uh, halls for uh, senior citizens with low vision. Uh, color coding in the built environment uh, can definitely help and, of course, signage to support navigation. Um, close, close Excuse me, would you like to close down? It's already five past seven. Sure, sir. Sure. So, uh, yes, I mean, I think I've uh, touched upon most of it. So, I will just, uh, for the benefit of the participants. I'll just quickly take you through my slides and then close.
yes so that's my last slide and thank you so much i hope uh, the participants find uh, my presentation useful thanks a lot uh, extremely good i think uh, i thought the last speaker would take the least time last speaker spoke the ma spoke maximum and let me tell you i went back to my college days where the principal was talking my faculty was talking i was listening to everything until such time there was a message from somebody saying can we close down number 1 2 uh, you know there was also been one of the comments not nothing to do with you but somebody commented we are talking more about urban areas not than the rural areas before the session started before the entire session started so i wanted to keep that in mind also i think with this uh, yes we have taken a little longer than what anupama wanted me to do she wanted me to close it at 5 so anupama to be close it now do you want to have any question answers yeah so if there are any questions people can raise their hands and we'll allow them to ask a question we can go till 515 so quickly if I somebody saw, has okay. a question yeah, yeah. they can just uh, raise their hands you. quickly yeah now let me tell you here only you know mrs Mira Patta, Mira, man, has asked about various things about rural areas versus non-rural yeah. areas, and uh, now uh, from social model to somebody also you have mentioned the right answer. Now, is there anybody? Uh, I thought uh, Mr. Daryal had definitely some points out of uh, uh, Dr. Kavita for for his meeting uh, very soon on disability. A lot of principles, I think the seven principles that she spoke, I think is very relevant to see how much. of those points can be you know incorporated in your policy on disability i think some of those points are extremely yeah. i think this is something dr daryal mr daryal want to take it even if yes, there is no discussion yeah. yeah 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 yes yes i would definitely all these seven principles are uh, universal uh, yeah. the the seven you know uh, principles of universal design are universal i'm telling Uh, yeah. Across the across the section silos and all this, uh, all the people. But I would definitely uh, wish all the uh, people in our country uh, working on uh, accessibility or built or any uh, any other environment uh, to to focus on uh, as you said uh, the population. in the rural areas 70% of the people with disabilities are in the rural area nobody talks about it and uh, uh, fortunately for the first time we had that in uh, the rights of persons with disabilities act and again even i am involved whenever we are involved we have only those uh, urban centric things i am in urban area whenever I, when i visit my uh, village uh, where we have large people i think we can we should have those uh, local solutions uh, whether it is accessibility or uh, uh, you know uh, participation of older people with disabilities or even older people or their dignity uh, that we must focus on 70% we forget 70% we should not forget so, uh, 70% because uh, that is uh, the most important because in urban areas even if the government doesn't do we will take care of ourselves generally we have that where with all so we, i often used to say in the chief commissioner's office we are working for about maybe 1 or 2% of the population because i used to get complaints only from people who are in the urban areas thank you so much thank you thank you so much now i'm i'm very sure that's been a very interesting uh, sessions i think at least i have learned a lot out of this session and addition to what we have learned and uh, anybody else any questions probably so we have one question one ra yeah. one hand raised siddhi mohapatra please ask your siddhi. question please yeah. siddhi you are unmute please unmute yourself and ask the question siddhi mohapatra please unmute and ask the question Sir, okay. She's... As he gets uh, no, as no. the person gets ready, sometimes you know the technology gives him. Anybody, any other question? No, sir. We don't have any other hands raised or Wonderful. any question on the question of the session. Okay, so we'll see if there is a question coming on the you know chat. We we'll take it. Otherwise, we'll leave it at that. And this person is probably last last call to Siddi Magapatra. 
Would you like to ask a question? Okay. It could be Not a mistake. really, sir. I think we should wrap up, I think. Thanks a lot once again. I think I really don't want to sum up everything, uh, Anupama. I definitely take it down a lot of points. So I'll pass it on to you. Good learning. Very nice, uh, you know, points for learning. And uh, I'm sure uh, perhaps not all touched upon the intersectionality that you would have attempted. I think we need to draw out of all these uh, points and see how you can create a document of intersectionality. That's a only probably the director research and policy on advocate in LPA Julia will have to do. But I can tell you this can be a beautiful document. We are able to put this together, particularly focusing on disability among the elderly. I think a very useful uh, uh, discussion that we had. And uh, some of those points I've already mentioned after every speaker spoke some of those points. I do not want to once again repeat. And uh, as the program is already over five minutes ago, I would like to say big thanks to all of you every speaker, every person who's participated. And the two interpreters or three interpreters who made it very interesting for people to listen to. Though we missed two speakers, I thought they were really going to add on to a lot of points. I'm sure Anupama can get some inputs from them because both of them are interesting personalities from one from Bangalore, another one from Pune. They have some good, uh, good points to give it. I'm sure you can pick up some points from them. And uh, what else to say other than Thanks to uh, you know the speakers and to Elpage India and their participants once again. Thanks for inviting me, Anupama, for this program, and a big thanks to all of you. Thanks. Thanks, so We'll uh, I'll request my colleague Pratip Chakravarti to please uh, thank you for such a. You actually took so much interest. We were actually yes. surprised. You're so busy, but you took so much interest in uh, in organizing. You. And uh, thanks for the suggestions. We'll certainly take it forward. I, I get your point that it's uh, intersectionality did not come out as much as we wanted it out to be, but I think this is the first time. So we will keep working with these people who are experts in their fields and we will sort of keep, you know, um, cajoling them and pushing them in the right direction. So thank you very let, much. Um, let me tell you, I also contacted all of them whenever I was going on a walk. <laughs> oh, and, uh, I, picked up, I picked up time from every one of them. And one or two people called me late in the evening. I was willing to take it on those two days. I met everyone. I connected with everyone. Let me Knowing them is also beautiful networking for me. Whether I'm going to call them or they want the to come. Effort, very nice. Thanks. Appreciate the effort. Yeah, now uh, comes over to you, Pratip. Over to you, Pratip. Oh, there's nothing left to say except thank you to the moderators, Dr. Gangadharan, uh, Professor Manish, Dr. Kavita, um, uh, Mrs. Meera Patra, uh, Patabiraman and Professor Pinky Mathur and of course uh, Dharyalji we have met, we have worked together anyway so you you know me and we, I know you uh, and all the other participants who have listened so intently to the kind of diverse discussions that have taken place in the second half of the day especially with regard to accessibility in built environments and uh, the use of innovation. So thank you all for uh, coming, this has been recorded uh, we are open to questions and uh, we will ensure that most of the action points that were discussed, uh, we'll try to include them in our programming and uh, let's hope that we do greater, better quality of programming with respect to aging, longevity and uh, disability because these are the issues that are very close to our hearts, especially in uh, HelpAge India. So thank you all and wish you a great evening for the rest of the day. Great to see you, you, Pratip. Bye-bye. Ah, bye, see you.